Hello, welcome to another ridiculously long podcast. Uh, This is just an introduction segment, don't worry, I'm not going to be on your screen for much longer. Uh, I keep making these ridiculously long podcasts um, because I just do. I just have audacity open and I just keep adding on to them and they just keep getting longer. But originally, rather than seven and a half hours or whatever this is, it was like nine hours. Um, the reason is because after I finished recording those nine hours, I, uh, on the recommendation of Osaka Syndrome, ran the entire thing through the Audacity, Audacity Truncate Silence, um, plugin, which shortened it to, to the hours it is now. Um, I don't know whether you'll like the effect or not like the effect, it definitely does truncate the silence, um, uh, but uh, what that does mean is that every time I mention a time in the video, it'll be wrong, which is really kind of annoying. Because like a couple of times, I'm pretty sure I say something like, I'm like four hours in right now, but it won't be four hours in because that was before I truncated all the silence. Um, yeah, I don't know what to do with these these ridiculously long podcasts. I guess I'll just keep posting them as long as you guys keep watching them. Uh, I don't know what to call them. I haven't figured out a name for this. Um, I don't know, but, uh, I I won't keep you any longer. I I guess I'll just, just let you get into it. I don't know if I should be putting footage. I I can't, I don't think I can store seven hours of like TF2 footage on any computer I own. Uh, maybe that's something you would like. I don't know. Would you prefer if I split them up into several shorter podcasts or post 12 hours every time? Because I could, I could have made this 12 hours. It wouldn't have even that difficult. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Anyway, let me know what you think. Also, podcast. I'm always talking in anime. The anime, they, they, they love the stupid high school melodrama, mellow, everything melodrama, Anohana, fucking, you know, clanad after story, this type of melodrama. I hate this shit. It's so annoying. And then people think that I just mean like any sort of sad story. Like, I don't know. It's hard to, like, what do I actually want? I found it hard to describe, and what I've said in the past is like, you have to make me actually care about the characters without just throwing in melodrama. Like, for example, at the end of season two of k there's drama, right? There's sad drama with crying, it's it's a tearjerker, but I've spent two seasons with these characters, I actually care about them, it works, right? When I when they try and introduce characters with by, by doing fucking drama, it sucks. But I'll tell you what I really want, the perfect fucking epitome of what I want from anime. It, there's a perfect example of it, and it's from the strangest place. Exactly what I want from anime can be found in the sitcom The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. You know the one? The one... So this is a story. Now, this story is all about how my life, it got flipped, turned upside down. So I'd, I'd like to take a minute, if you just sit right there, I'll tell you how I became the Prince of Bel-Air, right? Uh, you know what I'm talking about, right? That one? Um, uh, so in that, it's, it's a sitcom, a situational comedy. You all know it. I don't know why I'm describing it to you. And then randomly, I don't know what season it's in, right? But out of nowhere, it has one of the best dramatic scenes in television. I'm not the biggest fan of this show, right? I don't think that they have. I've, I've watched a lot of it. Because they used to put reruns on all the time uh, on TV. And, and I used to just watch it because I had nothing better to do before I had uh, free infinite internet access. Um, uh, but So I've, I've watched quite a bit of it. I don't particularly think it's the best show ever. I'm not much of a sitcom guy in the first place. But it does have one of the best dramatic scenes in all of television. Which is the scene where he, uh, the fucking Will Smith is like going on a rant. To, to the big the big guy character, I don't remember the name of him, and he's going on a rant, he's like, uh, uh, talking about his dad, right? And then he breaks down, he says, how come he don't love me, man? And it fucking gets you in the heart, man. It fucking punches you right in the gut, you're not expecting it, but it works, and it's a it's completely played straight scene. It's perfectly, there's no music, there's no sappy fucking music, it's silent. It's just two characters, Will Smith, he's not the best actor, but somehow he pulls out 
out of his fucking nowhere, he pulls out a brilliant performance, right? It's great. It's a great fucking moment. And it, it works for, it works for everything. It, it it's exactly the sort of thing that his character would do. It's just a perfect scene. In an otherwise comedic show, you know? In a, a show that isn't completely focused around trying to get you to to jerk your tears, right? And that's why it works. That's what I'm fucking... That's what I want out of anime, man. I want something that'll do that to me. There's only been one show that has kind of done this in that sort of way. It's a little different. I compare it more to the, the first 10 minutes of Up that everyone always talks about. Even though the first 10 minutes of Up is just fucking hilarious. But <laughs> anyway... I, I, okay, let's not count a signal too hard for the meme here. You know, when when Up first came out... It, it works, okay, they do a good job, it's a, they know how to effectively tell a sad story quickly, um, and an anime that does the same damn thing is a show called Kotora-san, um, which other than that first scene, is not super great, but they, they do a really good, at the beginning of the first episode, they do a really good sad backstory for the main character. Um, which to me makes me forgive the show for like whatever other stuff it wanted to do because that's how you do you know a lot of shows they think they can introduce characters via melodrama but you have like as in like oh you'll care about this character if you introduce them with something melodramatic happening but you have to do it a slightly other way around right like you have to learn about the character first then you have you know there's a famous book about screenwriting called Save the Cat. Um, you have, uh, ideally for a main character, it's kind of cheesy and overdone uh, in Hollywood these days, but it's kind of like a, in a workman-like uh, screenwriting sense. You want them to have a Save the Cat moment, i.e. you have to introduce the character and then you have, they have to, like, quote-unquote, save the cat. They have to do something that endears you to them so that you're actually rooting for them. Obviously, you can subvert that trope and you can make anti-heroes and, and all of that's great as well. But in a sort of straightforward story, that's the sort of thing you want to do. You want to be an underdog, you want to overcome adversity, and in order for that, you need to be rooting for them. Uh, and to do that, they need to endear themselves to you first. And that's what Will Smith does throughout the whole of the damn show, right? He's there, he's the cool guy. He pulled up to the house around 7 or 8, and he yelled to the cabbie, Yo, home, smell you later, right? Uh... He, like he endears himself to you, and then when he pulls, when he pulls the why, why don't he love me out, 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 you know, it hits you like a like a ton of bricks. And in Kotora san you know, you have like they 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 introduce the character, and they 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 make you root for her first, and then they pull the rug out of from under you, and they're like, oh, and then her life was fucking awful. <laughs> so then you know you see her life, and you see how awful it is, and you're like, oh god damn, that's not good. And it hits you in the damn feels. It's executed very well. So then the whole rest of the show, you're endeared so much to this character that, like, even though the rest of the show is kind of generic, it works way better than other shows of its ilk because you have this emotional connection to the character from the get-go. That's what I want to see more of in terms of anime drama. Actually put in the work to endear me to a character first and don't fucking just go straight in with the like uh the the sad story as the introduction the sad story has to follow the introduction or ideally it has to come up naturally in the story see how they normally do this this is the fucking problem with anime is the 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 epidemic of halfway through the third episode melodrama this is it's an actual epidemic you will notice that like once you start noticing this you can't not notice it halfway through the third episode melodrama is a fucking scourge on on anime it happens everywhere i'm watching a show i'm like this is great this is great and then they just shove some nonsense emotional stuff at you right and it's like You'd think, oh, well, yeah, we had two... This is what I'm asking for, right? We had two episodes to endear ourselves to the characters. But no, because the melodrama always comes out of nowhere. It always has, like, nothing to do with them. It's stupid. I hate anime. Fuck anime. You know? People are always... They they, they like to use this, this comparison uh, for a lot of things. Uh, one of them is, like, computing power, uh, which is in particular, like, uh, we... We put a man on the moon with with just the power of a couple of TI-82s or, or whatever, you know? Like, you, 
you've got more computing power in your phone in your pocket then that's a, like a, a hundred times more than what we needed to put a man on the moon, right? It's like, what if putting a man on the moon is just not that difficult? Like, it's just not that hard. I mean, if you're telling me they were able to do it, you know, back in, with, with, with barely any computing power, uh, and just a bunch of government money, you know, it sounds like kind of easy, kind of... <laughs> okay, I'm not saying it's easy compared to things people do on a day-to-day basis. But maybe it kind of is. Like, I don't think it's, the e- like, super easy. But I don't... I, clearly, it wasn't that hard. <laughs> because they did it. And it, and they did it successfully multiple times. With primitive... Pretty primitive technology. Even by the standards of now. Which is, in the grand scheme of things, not that far away. Like, you know what I'm trying to get at here? You know what I'm saying? Like, what, maybe this isn't, maybe just not that much of an impressive thing to do. Maybe, like, on the grand scheme of things, it's just not that hard. You just sort of throw a bunch of rocket fuel at it and do some maths to figure out the trajectories. I mean, the hardest part is keeping squishy, squishy people alive through the whole thing. But even that, you know, just get people who are good at their job to design the spacesuits. They did it. it. You know, it wasn't that difficult. A bunch of really smart people worked on it. And it cost a whole bunch of money. But there's a bunch of whole really smart people doing a bunch of stuff always. <laughs> you know? Like, th- there's the, th- it just so happened that there was interest in this one thing. But each of those scientists or engineers or whoever who, who were at NASA at the time, you know, that happened to cl- conglomerate into this, this battle with the Soviet Union, so they had all the money and resources... Those people would still be doing stuff that was equally demanding of their skills in the modern era, if you know what I'm saying. Like, there's people who are of comparable talent and skill to the people who did the moon landing, who are solving problems of equal difficulty every day all across the world, right? It's, it's just a job. It's just, it's, what we did was we just had a bunch of people and, and gave them a job, you know? Like, like, we put a man on the moon is maybe just not that impressive. I guess it, it feels impressive because everyone can see the moon. You're all familiar with it as something completely alien and foreign. And, like, we, we all see it at night time, so it's, like, familiar. And it's, like, something you could never conceive of doing yourself. So it feels like it must be something really difficult. But there's a bunch of, bunch of stuff that's equally outside of the realms of what an average person would consider possible, except that we're just unfamiliar with it because it happens in some specialized field. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think a better example of impressive human achievement would be sequencing the genome, I guess. But the thing is, even that, it's like we sequence genomes fucking left, right, and center these days. It's crazy how fast people got good at doing that shit. Like, they, the Human Genome Project was, like, pretty recent. Wow, we did it. And nowadays, you get your genome sequenced every, every Tuesday or whatever. Like, it's not even difficult. It's not, it's not hard for us. They're sequencing genomes of, like, long-dead ancient mammoths and shit. Maybe humans just aren't that good at shit. Like, if that's your most impressive stuff, you know what I'm saying here? Like, maybe that's hard for a human to do. But, like, hard for a group of humans to do... Is anything really difficult if you have infinite money to spend on it and infinite will, you know? Like, is anything actually difficult? The stuff that's difficult would be the stuff that you couldn't do even if you had infinite money and will. You know what I'm saying, right? Like, the difficult part of going to the moon isn't actually going to the moon. It's getting the resources and time and expertise together in one place to make it happen because you know, like, there's better shit to do with that, right? The hardest part of going to the moon is, like, once you've sorted out, like, you know what I'm, you know what I'm, am am I crazy here? Like, rockets, they're extremely simple devices, really. They're not, like, people talk about, oh, it's not rocket science. Rocket science is not that complicated, like, what, what is rocket science? It's a bunch of, like, Newtonian physics, which is stuff that you learn, I mean, you learn a lot of it literally in school, um, 
you know, it's a lot of Newtonian physics, uh, and it's and then it's it's like you know, you build a big tube, you fill it with fuel, and you burn the fuel at the bottom of it, which propels it upwards. You know, and it's the, it's not that difficult. Like it's difficult for a single person to figure out, but it's not that difficult for a bunch of experts with a bunch of money and time to do. Clearly, because they did it. You know what I'm saying here? Like you could do anything if you have a bunch of people who know how to do that thing already, right? Like if 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 landing on the moon was that difficult, it would it, they still wouldn't have done it, or it would have taken much longer. Like there was no unknowns. I mean, there were unknowns. I don't know. What I'm saying is. This is maybe maybe our frame our framing of it all of this is just wrong, you know. Like I, I don't know. You know what's something I don't see often in discussions about dairy. Sorry, I know this is just fucking all over the place. I also just woke up, but it's because I'm watching this Johnny Harris video. I don't know why I watch his videos. They're well produced, but they're objectively government propaganda. So I don't I don't know what I'm doing watching his videos. Uh, but anyway. Or well, maybe they're not government propaganda. They're just very mainstream media, liberal, Vox journalists, vice journalists. Well, no, you're not vice. Vice is worse. You know what I'm getting at. You, if you've seen his videos, you know what I'm talking about, right? He 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 toes the party line very well. And, you you know, maybe you got to respect that. I don't know. But um, uh, so he's, he made a video about milk. I don't I don't know. I'm watching the video. I, I, I don't know what he's talking about that. I just want to say something about milk. I love milk. I love dairy. I, I think, personally, I think milk is, like, the worst version of itself, uh, because you can turn milk into kefir and yogurt and cheese and all sorts of other things, curds, delicious curdy snacks, you know, you can turn milk into all these other things uh, that are better, in my opinion. I don't, I don't, I don't like leaving it as just milk itself, but, but I also think, you know, I grew up drinking shitloads of milk, uh, my mum said that that was why I became so tall, is because I drank a lot of milk growing up. I drank so much milk growing up, it's insane. Um, but his thing about specifically lactose intolerance, uh, Adam Agusia goes on about this a lot, which is that, like, being lactose tolerant is actually the weird thing. Like, the major the majority of people on Earth are lactose intolerant because most people live in Asia. Um, which is true. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> I'm not going to get into, uh, anything, I'm not going to get into any of the more details about that, but there is something that I feel like is always missing from this, these discussions about lactose intolerance. If you don't know, if you don't know the science behind it, it's not very difficult. Basically, uh, when you're a little kid, baby, you're producing an enzyme called lactase, which breaks down, uh, the, the sugars, right, lactose is a sugar, but it, it, you needed this enzyme called lactase to break it down. And when you're a baby, you produce this enzyme, but when you grow up, you stop producing this enzyme. Unless you're white, or in certain, <laughs> uh, like, sub -Sahara or Saharan nomad tribes, there are a few places on Earth where you get lactase persistence. Uh, but generally speaking, most, most like, uh, people who, uh, you know, don't live in Western Europe, or Northern Europe, rather, and certain other places where uh, the, the genetic mutation is found, don't produce this enzyme into adulthood, and so they're lactose intolerant, they can't break down this enzyme themselves with, or they, they don't have the enzyme to break down lactose. Uh, this is something I see missing this discussion, though, is that um, uh, uh, milk contains lactase as well as lactose, but during the pasteurization process, the lactase is destroyed, is, it, uh, but before pasteurization, lactose intolerance would have been less of a big deal uh, because milk contains some amount of lactase and the enzyme required to break it down is already contained within raw milk. Now, I'm not one of these raw milk, like you got to be drinking raw milk, guys. I've never actually had raw milk, uh, but I, I want to try it. Uh, I had the opportunity to try it in Estonia and then for some reason I just... I didn't try it because... Um, well, it was kind of a complicated situation, but I, I ended up not, not trying it while I was in Estonia. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm not like a, oh man, you gotta be making deals with your local farmers to drink raw milk, you know. I'm, I'm not necessarily saying that, uh, but I think if you're lactose intolerant, it might be worth looking into. Although, in the modern world, you, you know, the main advantage of milk is that it's a, uh, high, it's a calorific, high-protein uh, drink that you can get 
in the harsh winter when all your crops are dead or won't grow, but your cows or sheep or whatever are still alive, that's the that when you need it to survive, right? That's the main advantage of milk. And then you can ferment it and it will keep. Uh, this is like why milk is fucking based and why dairy is like such a, a revolutionary invention. Uh, but in the modern era, you know, we don't really have a problem getting food through winter. So, you know, if you we're mainly eating dairy for the taste. And in my opinion, <clears throat> the, the best tasting parts of dairy are fermented forms of dairy like cheese or kefir or yogurt. Uh, all of which have bacteria, which, hey, they're fermented, right? Think about it. What does fermentation mean? It means that there's a bunch of these bacteria, namely, uh, for the most part, lactobacillus. Uh, but cheese is more complicated. E actually, all of these are complicated. Yogurt is like the, the pure... Lo yogurt and kefir both contain lactobacillus. They also have other bacteria as well. Uh, cheese, you're going to get all sorts of bacteria depending on the, va the var variety, but... Also, that bacteria is not going to be in the final product that you eat. And that is sometimes. It's, com it's complicated. Um, <clears throat> the important part is that uh, bacteria, they're living on it, they're eating it. But what are they eating specifically? Well, uh, they eat sugar. What sugar? Lactose. <laughs> they eat the lactose. They break it down. Uh, this is why, if you're lactose intolerant, you get bloated and gassy because you don't have the lactase enzyme to break down lactose, so instead it passes into your gut, and your gut bacteria are fucking loving it, because you don't have access to that sugar, but they, they love sugar, they're gonna be fucking eating it like crazy, and producing waste products as they do so, um, which may not feel great when it's happening inside of you, but it's fine if it's happening somewhere else outside of you, uh, especially if it's bacteria that you purposefully know that you want in there, right? Like lactobacillus. Um, so, so fermented stuff like kefir or yogurt is is not going to have as much problem with lactose. And I believe, you know, lactose and lactose intolerant people they they don't eat much cheese. But I've always been confused by this because. Uh, Che like the sort of lightly fermented cheeses like like ricotta which isn't even from like the stuff like ricotta cottage cheese i understand right uh and mozzarella you know i understand but once you get into like you know your your mature cheddars your parmesans your roquefort's your gorgonzola you know the stuff that is actually like fermented quite significantly um you know i i, I would assume that most of the lactose is or it's like eaten by the, by the fermenting parties involved, right? So like I don't know this much. I'm I'm not lactose intolerant, right? I I'm 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 Gucci on the lactose front. Uh, but any any of my listeners lactose intolerant? Statistically, there probably are some, right? Uh, if if you guys could let me know, does the fermented level of the cheesiness? Does the fermentedness of the cheese affect your ability to eat it? In other words, like, can you not eat ricotta, but you're fine eating uh, a more mature cheese? Let me know. I, I don't know. Uh, there's a bunch of shortages in the UK right now uh, because the economy's a bit fucked. Uh, uh, but the economy's, like, let's let's put the blame squarely. Okay, so firstly, I just want to say, I, th I, I think this is going to self-correct in a while. This is just kind of the, the aftershocks of covid uh unlike the us we didn't print infinite money during covid and amazingly you know the wonders of mmt the us seems to be actually doing fine like it doesn't seem to be going into hyperinflation which is really surprising to me but i guess we i guess every economic theory about inflation is just wrong or maybe not who knows uh but the uk and did not do the same thing as the us right uh I mean, every country took a hit, but none of this matters. What I'm saying is, uh, inflation has gone up, right, of course, in the UK. And uh, companies, corporations, they are raising their prices in line with inflation. Uh, just, you know, myself, I've seen, obviously, food and utilities have gone up quite significantly in the past few months. Uh, I just got an email today where my phone company literally said, like, inflation is this much, so... We are rising up, raising our prices by the same percentage uh, to keep up with inflation, uh, as is our policy. They, they, they emailed me that, which is a surprisingly blunt way to put it. Um, uh, but, of course, the problem is that wages have not risen in line with inflation. 
uh, prices have all of these companies are raising their prices in line with inflation, but wages have stagnated. Uh, this is why there's so many strikes in the UK. Uh, so you might be wondering why are there shortages? Uh, you know, there was an egg shortage recently, and there's now a uh, fruit and veg shortage. Uh, the reason is quite simple. The supermarkets have raised their prices uh, for uh, selling goods, you know, at the, the, the end user level, but uh, they are refusing to pay more for uh, to the suppliers, to the farmers and producers who create the food in the first place. Um, and those uh, farmers, you know, they need to buy seeds and equipment and all of the stuff that you need to run a farm. And the companies that sell those, uh, you know, the stuff to the farming industry, to the agriculture industry, have also raised their prices, as everyone in the economy has. So naturally, you'd expect the farmers, they, they need, they can't survive if they don't raise their prices. But supermarkets are refusing to buy at these higher prices. There is no actual shortage. It's completely artificial. There is no actual shortage of fruit and vegetables in this country. There is no actual shortage of eggs in this country. The eggs are still there. The, the fruit and veg is still there. The shortage will come next year because the farmers if they sell at the cheap prices that the supermarkets are demanding, won't be able to afford to buy hens or seeds or, you know, all of the things that are necessary for next year's harvest. And so next year, there will be actual material shortages. This year, there are, the only shortages are supermarkets refusing to uh, buy products at their p proper market prices because they want, I don't know, they, they have the leverage, right? Because they have all the leverage in the situation and, um, you know, uh, capitalism has kind of a short time preference. Uh, so the, the short time preference is, is kind of dictating that uh, they don't think about the fact that in the next year, there just won't be food if they don't pay the proper money for it, right? Because they can afford it because they've raised their prices. Everyone knows they've raised their prices. Just living in the UK and buying food, you can see plainly that they've raised their prices. So why are they refusing to buy, um, uh, you know, why are they refusing to spend more on, on the, the supply chain end? Uh, because they're, they're fucking assholes. <laughs> There's no other reason. They, they just, they know they have all the leverage and they know they, they don't, you know, the, the, these farmers, they can't sell directly to consumers. Um, now, you know, the ideal situation would be, uh, in fact, actually, the, you know, I, I, I got to hand it to capitalism for a second here, is that this has produced some level of competition uh, in, um, this has produced some level of competition in the supermarket industry, because certain supermarkets, uh, I don't remember them off the top of my head, but there are some supermarkets that have put limits on fruit and veg sales, saying one customer can only buy so many fruit and veg. Right. Whereas other supermarkets have not put those limits in place. And that's how competition in markets work. Uh, that's good. Uh, and so I assume, you know, eventually the economy will balance out, uh, you know, assuming I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen, actually. Uh, I think it will happen eventually, but I'm not sure how. Uh, but let's just make sure that this is very clear. Right. The, the problem isn't the farmers demanding more. It's not greedy farmers demanding more. OK, they need the money because all of the equipment and, you know, raw materials that they need to produce next year's harvest have gone up in price. They can't afford to charge less right now because it means they won't have the money to uh, produce next year's harvest. The problem is 100 percent supermarkets refusing to buy goods at their proper market price. Uh, let's just make that very clear because they're charging more right now. We, the consumer, are being taken as mugs, right? We're, we're, ch we're being charged more for the same shit, even though the goddamn supermarkets are refusing to actually pay more. They're using inflation as an excuse to up the prices, but in reality, they're not paying more for the, uh, you know, on the supply chain side at all. And of course, the farmer, they have all the, yeah, I think I've explained it. So I finished that Johnny Harris video about milk. And why I don't think he's wrong, he does, he does tend to lack nuance in his videos. Because he definitely talks down to his audience a lot. Uh, which is fine, because I, I guess the point of his videos is to be for like giga normies who don't know anything about the world. Uh, like anyone who knows anything about American politics knows how powerful agricultural lobbies are. 
Like, it's weird that he's surprised by this as a journalist, no? Which I think he's not, and it's kind of an act. Like, we should all know that the American beef lobby, the American dairy lobby, and the American... Uh, well, I'll get to that, actually. There's a, there's a hidden... There's a hidden extra. Um, uh, but... Uh, um, sorry, got a little confused. Uh, or not confused, I was looking something up. Um, so, the, vid- the point of the video is generally correct. The point of the video is, uh, why does everything in America these days, or like, why did so many Americans grow up drinking a shitload of milk, like three glasses of milk a day, and why does everything in America nowadays have just so much fucking cheese in it? Well, it's because, um, the government created an artificial surplus of dairy and now needs to keep the farmers happy. There's a couple of things that this video misses out, in my opinion. The first thing is, uh, keeping the farmers happy is an extremely important thing. Uh, if you're a government, you got to keep the military, the two people, okay, there's like three people you got to keep happy if you're a government. You got to keep the military happy, you got to keep the, the financial sector happy, and you got to keep the goddamn farmers happy. If the farmers are unhappy, you're fucked, right? That's a really bad, you do not want to piss off the farmers. Um, now, it's a little complicated because, you know, when I say the farmers, you're probably thinking of you know, family-owned farm. No, 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 no. That's not who actually does the agriculture in America. There, there are some people, and those guys are based, but we're talking Monsanto here, right? We're talking the big uh, agricultural, multinational, fucking evil corporations, right? Uh, and the lobbies, uh, and so on. Uh, now, you know, I don't think this is a good thing. Uh, although I'm a big fan of cheese and a big fan of dairy, uh, these artificial subsidies and so on uh, aren't producing high quality dairy products. They're producing low quality mass produced, uh, processed dairy products like, like American cheese rather than, you know, uh, proper cheese, real cheese. American cheese is barely cheese. Well, actually it's a bit of a, that's a bit of a meme, uh, because the only difference between American cheese and like real cheese is that American cheese has emulsifying salts in it. Um, but you can, I don't know, like if you, if you take cheddar regular normal non-emulsified cheddar and you you melt it down and you put emulsifying salts in it it will emulsify just like american cheese does because that's all the that's the only difference really um well there's other differences they ha- normally they have some like uh anti fungal mold prevention antibacterial probably not very good for you stuff in them to keep so that they keep longer uh which is weird because cheese already keeps for a really long time but i don't know um, it's kind of the point of cheese. Uh, so, you know, I agree. Um, having too much cheese in your diet is bad. People in the West already have just too many calories in their diet. Um, and, uh, cheese is high in calories. Uh, it's also, you know, it's not cheese. Sorry, I had to pause it. Cheese, cheese is fine, right? If you, if you're eating a normal balanced diet, there's nothing wrong with eating a normal amount of cheese. Um, I would recommend eating better cheese. But that's mainly because it will improve your life in the the manner of making you happier, which uh, which is important, rather than making you. What's the? This is the thing, right? What's the point of health? Health. It's it's about living a good, happy life. It's not just about living. I don't know. It's not about. It depends. You can make your own decisions. You're an adult. I recommend eating cheese because it is delicious, and in, because of that, I recommend eating nice cheese. I think cheese is one of the things in life that it's worth paying the extra for. Uh, there's stuff that it's fine to cheap out on, um, food-wise, um, but then there's stuff that I, like, I, I, I do not think, so for, uh, as an example, beans. You do not need to buy expensive organic beans. I go to the store and there are cans of beans for like three times the price of a normal can of beans because they're like expensive organic beans. They're the exact same bean. You do not need to be spending extra money on beans. Okay, that's that's one uh, one example of something that you you can cheap out on. Uh, cheese, however, is definitely a situation where you get what you pay for, and I think you should be spending the extra money, treating yourself some nicer cheese. Okay, there's no point in in, in eating bad cheese. It's just gonna it's just gonna make you miserable. Okay, you're you're worth more than that. Uh, but anyway, that kind of off topic. <laughs> Uh, the, 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 the interesting thing is that, uh, Johnny Harris over here, uh, one of his points or conclusions at the end of this, his video is 
the video feels like anti-government, right? But but this is the government, this is the thing, right? Is that the, the a video feeling anti-government from a mainstream journalist isn't act Like, there is no anti-government journalism, really. Uh, or there is, but there isn't, and you can't tell because they're funding every side uh, for this exact purpose. Um, but you should always assume that someone is winning at the end of this, right? Um... And uh, I'm gonna. I wonder if there's like credits where I can see if he actually actually got any uh, got anything. Curious. Uh, there's there's credits at the end of the video, and there's a sponsor. Um, but anyway, not my point. My point is one of his points in the video. Like I understand if you're saying Americans eat too much dairy, uh, specifically too much. Eating a lot of milk is not a problem, but eating too much cheese is just. Uh, I don't know what his point is, but I think he should have gone harder on it's it's like not good for you. It's it's just too many calories. That's the reason it's not good for you. Not because it's high in fat or uh anything like that, but just because it's uh those calories would be better spent on other foods. There's not really much of a reason to eat that much cheese because there are foods that are more nutritionally dense. I don't know, it's kind of complicated. Uh uh, so his point is that a lot of the research on the nutrition in dairy and calcium is, uh, you know, singles out dairy as this, this miracle product, when in reality, uh, lots of other foods also have plenty of dairy in them. Uh, but there's a reason for that, which is the government wants people to be healthy. It saves them money if their population is healthy and uh, healthy people work and therefore healthy people pay taxes. So the government does actually, surprisingly enough, you'd be, you'd be, you wouldn't believe it from the American healthcare system, but the government does generally want people to be just healthy enough to work. Calcium deficiencies, not good for that. So uh, the, probably the reason that the US government promotes dairy so much as something that's high in calcium is because um, they have a massive surplus of it, rather than to in order to... Well, I guess that's kind of his point. But he doesn't mention this, right? Like, he says, uh, oh, we have a massive surplus because of the lobbying groups, and so the government made up this thing about calcium in order to sell more dairy. But in reality, I would guess that's part of it, but also that the government generally wants to avoid people having calcium deficiencies, uh, and so is like, well, we already have this massive subsidized stockpile of dairy so we may as well like try and get people you know we may as well mention the whole calcium thing because we we don't want people to have calcium deficiencies um so that's one thing but the other thing is that he then goes through other foods that have uh, high amounts of ca calcium in them too because his point is milk isn't this special magical su substance that is like the only way to get all the calcium you need you can also have all of these other foods which is obviously true, and I don't think anyone would it's, it, I believe that milk is the only way to get calcium in your diet. Uh, but, here's the interesting thing. He goes on for so long about how uh, the dairy lobby is so powerful and uh, has so much leverage over the government. And one of the things he recommends, you know what, I will just find, find it in the video and play it for you. Uh, one second. Ale, even tofu, which comes from soybeans. You can... Tofu, which comes from soybeans. Now, need I remind you, need I remind you that the U.S. Uh, produced, uh, is the number two producer in the world of soybeans, and it is really trying to be the number one. Uh, Brazil is number one, and the U.S. is a little bit in a trade war with Brazil, uh, uh, trying to outdo them in soybean production, uh, because... Uh, uh, obviously, where are they selling all these soybeans to? They're selling them to goddamn China, okay? Uh, the 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 U.S. they 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 have massive subsidies if you're if you're growing corn or soy, uh, but the difference is all the corn is sold domestically, whereas all the soy is sold to China. Um, the U.S. Uh, soy lobby is fucking massive and powerful. Uh, uh, let me just, yeah, let me just clarify. We're, we're talking in 2020, this is uh, 112 million tons of soybeans. Uh, <laughs> 112 million tons of soybeans, okay? Like, that's a lot. The next highest, Argentina, is less than half of that. Uh, no, the US, they, they want you to, they, they would love it if you were eating a shitload of tofu and soybeans. That's you might have noticed that soy is also kind of in everything these days. 
And you might argue, well, so I, you know, depending on, uh, I don't know, what sort of people you listen to for your nutritional advice, you might be sitting here like, and soy has all these phytoestrogens in it, which are going to make you into a woman, which is probably not true. Uh, it's true about other stuff, but it's probably not true about soy. Um, you know, soy's f- fine as a food. Uh, it's not the best food ever. It's not the worst. It's fine. It's fine. Soy is, soy is fine, you know. It, it's it's nothing special, really. Um, or, you yeah, you might be sitting here like, oh, but no, thank you. You're so pro-bean. You know, you're so pro-bean. Um, and I am pro bean, uh, but uh, a lot of the ways that people eat soy is in in a very processed manner. Uh, I would recommend eating uh, just the beans themselves, uh, or uh, of some sort of fermented form of those beans. In fact, if you want, if you actually want to eat the number one healthiest uh, way to eat soy, you should be consuming natto, which is Japanese disgusting <laughs> fermented soybeans that are they're covered in snot and smell like uh, rotting soybeans because that's what they are. Um, I've had it. It's honestly not that bad. I, I wouldn't say it was particularly tasty either. It kind of tastes like feet. It kind of tastes like feet. Um, uh, but, but like, it's very healthy for you. Um, and it's good if you mix it with rice. Uh, I kind of want to buy some because, yeah, it's healthy. Everyone in Japan, they eat it, sort of. A lot of people do as a health food. Um, no, there's nothing There's nothing wrong with soybeans themselves, but you're not really getting that much benefit out of them if you're eating them in a highly processed form uh, rather than as a, a whole food. I know the term whole food has been kind of corrupted by the, the, the stupid Amazon shop by a, of the same name, uh, but uh, it shouldn't have been. <laughs> you know, having a, a whole food is just making good use of the entire food rather than throwing away half the nutrients so that you get to the, like, you know, starchy or protein core, you know? Like, if you just use soy protein, then, like, half of the benefit of beans is they're high in fiber. If you're just extracting, like, pea protein or soy protein, which are both very popular um, in foods in the West, uh, you're missing out on, you know, half the benefits of uh, beans. Um, in fact, probably the major benefit of beans because, in, you know, gut health is incredibly important. Uh, I would recommend just eating beans, just eating more beans in general without having them be highly processed. Uh, anyway, I just want to point out that, like, it's interesting that he recommends, isn't it interesting, isn't it curious that his recommendation as an alternative to dairy is another product with an extremely powerful lobby in the US. Uh, I think it is interesting. I think it's interest. It's a little interesting that he's like, oh man, we're going to fight back against government propaganda and you're going to do it by eating more soy, eating more tofu. So, eh, I don't think you're really fighting back against government propaganda. You're just, you're just exchanging, you know, the, the, it's just two fight competing agricultural lobbies in the US. And really, like, how much are they even competing? I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know the behind the scenes of what goes on there, but like really, you're you're not you're not going against any propaganda at all. You're just switching out one form of propaganda for another. Um, in reality, you should try and eat. I mean, everyone knows what you. Everyone knows how to have a healthy diet, right? You eat a varied and balanced diet with whole grains and whole foods, high thirty grams of fiber. Get your five a day and try and eat local and seasonal produce. Everyone knows that that's how you actually eat healthy food. Um, you don't need to cut out meat, you don't need to cut out, you know, anyone who says that is, is probably retarded, unless you're trying to save money, in which case you, meat is a, meat is a good way to save, cutting out, eating less meat is a good way to save money, because meat is expensive, but other than that, it has no benefit, um, yeah, I don't know, I feel like everyone knows, (laughs) everyone knows how to eat healthy, uh, if there's any reason why people aren't eating healthy, it's probably financial uh, rather than... Yeah, so fix the economy, you bastards. Allow me to clarify something. What is this? I don't know if I'm going to post this. I don't know what this is. I've just been recording stuff. Allow me to clarify something. I am stupid. I, th- like, you should really get this into your brain. I need to get this into my brain. But it's something that's very hard to deal with. I'm stupid because I'm, like, 24, right? I barely, like, I don't know shit. I don't know shit. What do I know? I, I, I feel like, you know, like, why you know, you know what you know, 
and you take the best conclusions you can from what you know and so you feel like yeah i'm pretty smart and you know i think maybe i'm kind of smart at least people seem to think i'm smart but i don't know what that means right like what does that mean i'm definitely not as smart as me who's been alive for 48 years that's you know uh and i'm smarter than me who had been alive for 16 years um for sure but even in in the time when i'm have been alive for much longer i will still be stupid um i will i, I will still be not particularly smart because I don't think I'm that special and I don't think anyone's really that smart. The people who are smart, you know, that we consider to be smart are very good at some particular specialization. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying. What I'm saying is don't don't expect me to have have any answers for you. I don't have any answers except to try and try and live well. Try and live well. That's that's my conclusion so far. I'll see if that changes at some point in the coming years, but so far that's been my conclusion. Uh, of all of this stuff, you know, life stuff, living. My conclusion so far is try and live well. That's all you got to do. How, if you ask me how, I'm going to get a little more stuck. <laughs> to, uh, I can give you a couple of things. Firstly, be, uh, uh, feed your curiosity. Uh, I don't think you can really go wrong with that. And secondly, try and eat your veggies. I know it's boring. I need to follow my own advice as well here. But I gotta try and eat my veggies. You gotta try and eat your veggies. That seems to be as much as I can pretty much get at right now. Is is just do the do that. The rest of it, I don't know. I have some vague ideas of what might be good, but uh, I don't know. I have I have some ideas, but I'm much less confident in those than uh, than. Uh, oh, maybe if I had one more, uh, try and uh, uh, va- value good company. Value good friends. There you go. I don't think you can go wrong with that either, right? Like, like that's probably a good idea. I'd say I'm fairly confident in that. Try and try and value good friends, um, and feed curiosity, and then also eat your damn vegetables. That's my advice. As a stupid twenty-four year old, thank you, because I feel like it's hard to go wrong with that stuff, right? Like that seems like fairly obvious, easy stuff, right? Like the rest of it, bro. I don't fucking know. I'm watching the new Patricia Taxon video and I'm realizing something that's kind of depressing. I've never had the experience of actually being good at a game. I've had, I've never had it. I've had experiences of making good individual plays or beating somewhat difficult stages in, in certain games. But that's different from like, like, for example, what I would consider being good at a game is being like the way Simple Flips is good at SM64, or I suppose the way Patricia Taxon is good at Celeste. Uh, like, I'm not good at any games in that way. Not really. I'm the only thing that I have above average skill at, I would like to say, is movement in Source Engine games. But I am not particularly good at any of the movement game modes in Source Engine games compared to people who play those game modes. I am not particularly good at Surf, I am not particularly good at B-Hop, I am terrible at KZ, and I am not particularly good at HNS, and I am not particularly good at rocket jumping, uh, and maybe I'm okay at trimping, but I haven't, I'm not as good as at people, as like Solar Light, or people who are really good at trimping. I've achieved some successful lines, um, a couple of times, but it's always taken me a lot of tries, uh, on like, you know, empty maps with no one playing. Although I have, anyway, that's not really necessarily the point because I'm not, I'm not particularly good at it. Um, movement in Source Engine games is about the closest I get to being good at anything. Uh, when I used to play CSGO a lot, uh, there would be quite often times when I would get compliments on my movement. Uh, that was what I focused on being good at in that game uh, because that's what the Source Engine is good for. I have good movement in Source Engine games. That's like my thing. Um, that's that's the only thing that I'm good at. But I am not good enough. The problem is I'm good at it, but I'm not good enough at it that it actually I'm good at it, if you know what I mean. Like, I have put thousands of hours into it, literally, um, and it helps me in TF2 to surf rockets effectively, surf damage effectively, uh, you know, it does occasionally help me to get frags, but nowhere near as much as having better pipe aim, 
would be helping me to get flags or having better game sense or being able to like I understand that what I need to get better at in TF2 is being able to force 1v1s that are in my advantage I just don't know how to do that um uh yeah like movement helps uh, and I also I'm only just now starting to learn defensive movement properly like evasive making your movement unpredictable um which is not something I focused on in CS:GO because of uh the 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 mechanics where if you get hit by a bullet you slow down so which is literally there to stop you from being able to do this um I have I did a little bit of it right there is there I have done evasive movement in CS but it's very different than in TF2 because in CS the evasive movement is all about making your head hard to hit so as well as strafing back and forth like uh, as long as as well as strafing you're m wiggling your mouse you're moving your mouse so that your character is looking like directly down and you're crouching and and these sorts of things to make your head harder to hit uh, this is also a stupid thing like in CS it's not very powerful evasive movement is more of a uh a fun troll against like lower ranked players than it is an actually effective mechanic. It's more of like a BM against lower ranked players. Uh, yeah. Whereas in TF2, having good evasive movement is like extremely important depending on what, okay, actually to be fair, depending on what class you're playing. Um, but since my second favorite class is Scout, uh, <laughs> I should probably get better at it because that's kind of Scout's whole deal. Uh, you look at good scout players and uh, it's like they're fucking invincible. No one can hit them and it's crazy. Uh, maybe I just need to put more hours in on scout rather than um, hybrid knight. But hybrid knight is so fun and scout is kind of boring depending on what map you're playing. Uh, yeah, what I need to work on is doing a little less charging with W into the anim into the middle of the choke. Anyway, sorry, you got distracted. My point being, I'm not good at TF2. I'm not good at CSGO. And those are the only games I've ever put any real hours into. I'm not good at any other... I'm not good at SM64. I'm not good at Trackmania. Uh, I'm not good at Half-Life 1. I'm not good at any video games. Not really. I'm not good at any game... I'm not good at Sonic R. I'm not good at Counter-Strike Condition Zero Deleted Scenes. These are the only games I've... I'm not good at a, a, a Bug's Life for the PS1. Uh, I'm not, not good at any games, really. It's kind of depressing now that I think about it. Like, I will never have the experience of, like... And look, I say Simple Flips is good at SM64, but he's, you know, he's not on the level of... Um, oh, I've forgotten this person's name. Hold on. One second. Uh, sorry, apologies. Um, no, we're not... I don't want to watch Kaizo Mario 64. I want to watch ROM hacks that are Kaizo hacks, but not the Kaizo hack called Kaizo Mario 64. Um, what the fuck is this person? Is it this person? Is this the correct person? Nope, this is a TF2 YouTuber. No, this is a Toho YouTuber, actually. Um, I'm not good at Toho, very much so. I've forgotten this person's name. I, I'm subscribed to a fucking SM64 Kaizo uh, hack streamer person who is very based um and ridiculously good at the game <laughs> and also i guess th these people are just built different like also like one of the best i want to be the guy rom hack kaizo people as well which is just fucking insane i guess there are people who just are built different um i don't have the gamer genes i was never like what if i was given or if i knew i don't know man i don't know Things could have gone differently for me. But if I just put in the hours, like this is my thought, right? Is that I just have to put in hours and hours of practice to get good at something. But like, I suppose the big difference is being good at Trackmania like Virtual is, or being good at Celeste like Patricia Taxon is, or being good at Mario like Simple Flips is, is just dependent on being good at the game. Whereas TF2 is an online multiplayer game, I guess. But Maybe that does... Obviously, there are people who are good and bad, so... And I'm definitely on the end of... Well, I think I'm bad. I used to think that I was medium, but recently I've been trying to pay more attention to my KD ratio, and I tend to not be in the positives, Um, which I don't know... I, it actually... What I've noticed... Actually, something I've noticed right now that I've started paying attention to my KD ratio is I tend to do way better on servers with fewer people like way better 
but maybe that's normal like maybe i don't know how what's normal in terms of like like when i'm playing on a full uncle topia server 24 versus 24 it's often not going so well for me like or as in like i often end up with not as many no maybe like half to like on a lower on a on a bad day or on a bad match like half the kills as deaths or on a particularly good match like almost as many kills as deaths whereas on a on a less populated server i feel i end up going positive not by that much not like crazy amounts but i end up going positive and so what does that mean <laughs> i don't know what that means is that normal or is that something to do with my playstyle i don't know please elucidate this matter for me in the the comments so i just recorded the script for a video which you've probably seen by the time this comes out which is probably called something like abandoned video games and it probably has something from team fortress 2 in the thumbnail and in that video which you should really go watch because i hope i do a good job of editing it i'm happy with the script uh uh in that video i mentioned super smash brothers melee now uh there's a couple of things. So, first thing you need to know is that I, as I recommend you as well do, is that a few years ago, good few years ago now, I went through my Google account's privacy settings tab and went through the arduous task of trying my best to do whatever I could to make it as not bad as it could possibly be, uh, which is still quite bad. Uh, but I recommend you do that. And one of the things I did when I did that was I turned off the history feature in YouTube, which effectively turns off algorithmic recommendation entirely, at least based on what you like. It, you know, maybe Google still collects information about what you like, but if it does, it doesn't tell you. Uh, it basically stops tracking what you've watched and what you haven't, um, which means it can't build a picture of you. Or if it is building a picture of you, it's not sharing that information in how the site presents itself to you. You only get recommendations based on the video you're currently watching and your subscription feed and nothing else. Um, uh, which, you know, at the time I thought made YouTube much better and I was very happy with this. Uh, it does make YouTube worse in one regard though, which is that it means you it doesn't remember where you were in videos if you, uh, you know, watched part of a video and then, you know, close the tab and come back to it later. It doesn't remember where you were. Uh, which is, I guess, a kind of an annoyance, but it's not too bad, especially given the fact that I was mostly watching videos on um, Invidious at the time when I did that, and up until recently, uh, until my X220 just broke a couple of days ago, which I need to fix. But the fan is broken. I haven't mentioned that yet, have I? Have I mentioned that? The fan is broken on my X220. I need to buy a new fan. Um... Anyway, so yeah, that didn't matter to me, so I had history turned off this whole time. But then, I was watching this 12-hour long Northern Lion compilation, which I talked about in my last podcast video thingy, and uh, I was getting fed up of having to notate where I was, so I just decided to turn history back on so that I could come back to the video, because I watched that video over the course of like three or four days. Um, so, uh... I turned history back on and started getting YouTube recommendations again. And it turns out that YouTube's recommendation algorithm is actually quite good at knowing what I like, uh, which I guess shouldn't be surprising. But I, after a few years of having it turned off, it's it's gotten much better. Although, to be honest, it's still not amazing. Uh, it still shows me, like, it's very basic. It seems to, I mean, it yeah, it's not wrong. I like Star Trek The Next Generation, uh, It, but, like... Yeah, I don't know. It's also, weirdly enough, showing me a lot of really low view video. It showed, and also it uh, desperately wants me to watch Andrew Tate videos. I had to, I I, I made it stop by, by clicking, uh, uh, like, not interested on every single one I've seen, and now it's stopped. But there was a couple days there where it just, it really wanted me to watch Andrew Tate videos. I didn't realize this was as real as it is. Like, man, something about these algorithms, they just love fucking Andrew Tate and Jordan Peterson. Thankfully, I've, like, I've, I've explained to the, to Miss, Mr. Algorithm San uh, over at Google uh, very politely and repeatedly that I am not interested in Jordan Peterson or Andrew Tate. And uh, it seems to have caught on, so I have a cold. Uh. Um, but... 
sorry about that. Um, so that's the first piece of information. The second piece of information is um, a, a program called Descript. Uh, Descript is a video and auditing ed audio editing program which uses AI to transcribe the video into text and you then edit the video by editing the text. I made a video with this once before and I decided to try editing the audio for uh, my most for this this uh, abandoned games video in Descript uh, because the audio recording was kind of messy lots of times when I messed up reading and so I thought it would be faster to do in Descript than in Audacity. Uh, it wasn't. It would probably took about the same time as it would have taken me to do it in Audacity. I wouldn't say it was faster. Uh, it probably could have been faster if I... It definitely could have been faster. I, so the way I went about it probably wasn't that smart. Um, but, you know, it was fine. Uh, but Descript, it doesn't do anything locally. Like, it's a very modern, you know, cringe modern program. So instead of, like, doing work on your computer, what it does is it just sends everything over to Descript servers where it does all the work and then sends the results back to your computer, which is like, come on, you remember when we finally got away from mainframes and everyone was so happy that you could have a personal computer and that was that was the computing revolution, was that we don't need to rely on mainframes anymore, everyone can have a personal computer, not just a terminal connected to a mainframe. That was like the whole big revolution in computing that allowed for everything that's cool. Why are we going back to mainframes? Like, why, why are we doing this? We, you, what, what's the point? This is a silly way of going about things. Guys, come on. Um, and my point is, I assume that Descript is probably selling all of the information it gets very quickly. Basically, the point I wanted to make is, um, in the video, I briefly talk about Smash Brothers Melee. Uh, now, I am subscribed to the channel Awesome Source, which is a really good Melee-related channel. You probably already know about it. Um, and YouTube had not been recommending me Awesome Source videos recently, because why would it? I haven't been watching them recently, he hasn't uploaded that recently, since I turned on my history at least. But, I finish editing this video, and I pop over to my YouTube homepage, and a bunch of Awesome Source videos. I don't think anything of it really, but then I am watching another video, and the sidebar full of Awesome Source videos. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, it's recommending, I don't know why this is surprising to me, like, surely we should all be used to this by now. And, you know, I've just already seen all of the, his videos a bunch of times. Uh, I don't know. I just thought that was notable. I'm, it's surprising how fast these things happen, you know? My cold has gotten significantly worse. I, my, it's, a, it's now a bad cold as opposed to just a cold. I put out the video. You've probably seen it. I'm very happy with how it turned out. What I'm not happy with is fucking retards who watch it. It's one particular retard. No offense, but you're a retard. <laughs> but I, I'm more frustrated with myself. I don't know what I'm mad at, man. I'm fucking all over the place right now. But so when I was writing the script, I was like thinking about mentioning Valve's internal management structure, which is so somewhat unique. Um, Everyone knows about it, though. Everyone already knows about Valve's internal management structure. There's about 10 billion videos about it. It's not special anymore, right? Like, a few years ago, you could have mentioned it and expected, oh, well, people don't know that, right? <clears throat> but nowadays, everyone knows that Valve doesn't have a traditional internal management structure with bosses, and people work on whatever projects they want to, except not really, because uh, in reality, Valve is not actually a worker co-op. It's just a... Um, yeah, uh, you know, there's, there's just, the hierarchies are, are just informal. Um, but we, I feel like we've all seen a million videos about this, right? Like, I thought, well, everyone already knows this. Like, there's no point in mentioning it again. That's just boring. It will just, like, pad out the video for no reason. So I purposefully did not include it. There was a section where I thought about mentioning it, and I purposefully thought, everyone already knows this. If, like, I don't want to just be another video, like... Did you know Valve has a strange, different internal management system? In, in, especially because there was a video by the channel People Make Games recently about this subject that, like, got pretty big that I feel like everyone who would watch my video probably already saw. So I decided not to mention it. Little did I know this would lead to, um, Kaiser Bunzi thinking 
that because I didn't mention it, I just don't know it, and that, that I'm somehow an idiot and who's not done any research about Valve, because how can I be critical of how they act as a company if, uh, you know, I don't mention Steam and I don't mention their management, their, their management setup, right, their organizational structure? How can I, how can I criticize the way that they operate as a business? And my answer is, because it doesn't fucking matter. Like, yeah, okay, maybe I should have said, you know what, I do I do think I should have said, when I said Valve is a casino, I should have followed it up with at least partially, right, to be more, just to be more accurate, right, because that's true. They make most of their money through Steam, the casino is actually not their main business model, um, so I should have said that, that's true, but... Uh, at the same time, my, my, the point of the video, if I were to sum it up, is, is this. Valve is not your friend, but they are a company who have made some really good video games. Some of my favorite video games. In fact, three of my favorite video games were made by Valve. <laughs> Half-Life 1, Counter-Strike Global Offensive, and Team Fortress 2, right? It, they made the best video game engine, in my opinion. And they made three of the best video games, in my opinion. So they've made great games, and there are some amazingly talented people who work at Valve. <laughs> However, and you know, they also do good stuff. Like, they do support, I used to mention this in the video, they do support the community more than most other video game developers do. They do, um, uh, you know, support their games, like CSGO and Dota, well. Uh, fairly well, you know, like, I think the fans, uh, uh, CSGO fans, are a little uptight about it, you know, I think they're, they're over-exaggerating, CS, CSGO is well supported by Valve, I mentioned that in the video, uh, you know, I don't think Valve is, like, that's not the point, the point is, Valve ha has some wonderfully creative staff members, and uh, some very talented and passionate people work there, and it's great that they're given free free reign and can make the projects that they're interested in. Uh, Valve's hardware is also really good, right? Uh, generally, these these days, they they figured it out eventually. Um, <clears throat> uh, but uh, their their lack of communication per is not is not just due to their bad management structure. Their lack of communication is on purpose uh, because Valve is still not your friend. They're just a company. There are individuals at Valve who are great people, but Valve is a company is an uncaring financial machine, right? That's the point that I wanted to get across. But that doesn't matter because the reality is that communities aren't built by companies. They're built by the people inside of them. That if, you know, at the same time, Nintendo has also made some of my favorite games of all time, right? Nintendo make amazing games and they also have amazingly talented uh, people working there and they make some of the best games ever. Um, right, but that doesn't excuse the way that they've treated Melee in the same way that Valve have made amazing games and expecting a company to consistently support, um, uh, you know, it doesn't matter. The point is it doesn't matter. Valve doesn't matter. They made the game. It doesn't matter that they're not supporting it because they're not your friend. They're not a guy. They're just a company. They may have a slightly different management structure than other companies, but they also are sim they're way more similar to other companies than they are different right uh the fact that they have such a small team and uh you know that team isn't able to support like, compared to other game dev like of their size they have such a small team and that team isn't able to support all the games that they want to or that they they should that's a, that's not like uh oh well you you have to forgive them because they just have a small team they're also one of the most profitable companies in the world like they could afford to have a bigger team they're choosing not to uh, they could e easily hire more people, like, they should hire more people. It's a problem that they do not hire more people. Uh, like, that's a, that's a strange management decision that is going to create bad PR for them. And that's their fault. Like, there's no excuse for that. Like, maybe, sure, if you hire, le hire fewer people, the people who work there get paid more, and uh, there's less bloat in the company. But, you know, the fact that they only hire the best of the best, they only hire senior people, means that there aren't, you know, those senior people are going to have their talents wasted on updating TF2 or whatever, right? You should also be hiring junior people to do the menial tasks like that. That is how you should run a company. <laughs> That's why junior people exist. It's also good to give them an in to the games industry, right? Like this, <clears throat> I don't know. Uh, but none of that really matters because even if Valve didn't support, the point of the melee segment at the end is that 
No matter how bad Valve gets, Valve isn't that bad compared to Nintendo. Uh, with regards to Valve, with regards to TF2, isn't nearly as bad as Nintendo is with regards to Melee. But Melee has survived as a community for longer than TF2 has, and it's bigger than ever. So clearly, that proves that even if Valve has a lack of communication on purpose,、uh, which I think is a pretty fucking poor, poor, poor show on their half. Even if they do all of this stuff, or if they do wonderful, amazing stuff to support the game or any of their games or make amazing games, none of that matters because what really matters is the community, and the community is what has all the power. I should have fucking had a stronger closing segment about that. I I thought the metaphor about Sisyphus was kind of pretentious but funny way to end the video. Uh, I should have I should have had some sort of fun little wrap up. It just had to be a couple of sentences long, or it's like so. It doesn't matter if Valve is a, an amazing company or a terrible company, because at the end of the day, it's the fans that make the game what it is, and it's the community that can continue to support a game, even in a case like Melee, where there's a, a vengeful god. That's my point. Is the point of the video whether Valve has a different organizational structure or whether they make their money from Steam? Doesn't fucking make any difference to the actual point of the video. Okay, I want to get really pretentious here for a minute. I mean, you you got to get pretentious from time to time. I feel like shit.、Um, but I ate a really heavy breakfast for some reason, even though I'm sick, which was stupid. I don't know why I ate a really heavy. I could have not done it. I could have eaten porridge. It would have been nicer. I would feel better right now. Instead, I feel kind of sick because I had a. A spam and egg sandwich with too much butter. I didn't know it was possible to have too much butter on a sandwich. But here we are facing facing the consequences of my action. So pretentious music stuff.、Uh, I want to talk about <clears throat> what I think music is. I guess my philosophy or manifesto with music. Um, because I think the sort of societal. Um, understanding or or like the popular understanding of how art works, I think, is a little wrong, or maybe just lacking nuance.、Um, and I'm sure other people feel differently because this, you know, it's all sort of a very individual, personal thing how you feel about this sort of stuff. But I want to tell you how it feels to me. So I I see. I'm gonna I'm gonna say music for this, but you you could sort of expand this to just art in general. But I see music as kind of a A puzzle game, I guess.、Um, <clears throat> so the 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 it's not really an act of creation so much、uh, as much as it is、uh, all about. It's a game where the point of the game is to narrow down your options.、Uh, <clears throat> so、uh, you may have heard the phrase "creativity comes from limitations." I'm a strong believer in this phrase.、Um, I think creativity. Is like discovering or、um, coming up with limitations.、Uh, so when you make a song, you start with a blank page, and there is a, a possibility for any infinite number of things to happen. And the game is to n- narrow down those possibilities. That's the challenge. How do you go from zero possibilities to, or sorry, infinite possibilities to、uh, one final choice,、uh, and make it make sense? So you might write a phrase based on whatever. It could be anything. The, the initial choice, right? That's probably the hardest part.、Uh, but that's sort of just the setting up the game board. Is making some initial choice. Maybe it's a drum beat. Maybe it's something as simple as a tempo, or a vague idea of what genre you want to write in, or some mood you want to express. You you pick something, and that sets up the the game board. Okay, I've picked my thing. Now I have to make it make sense. This is a really hard part. This is also part of the game. Setting up the game is part of the game. But you set up the game. Uh, this is usually、um, informed by something called inspiration. Which I don't think anyone really understands how it works, but that's part of the fun of it. You don't understand how it works, but it somehow it somehow works. So you have this the game board set up with your initial inspiration, and then the challenge is to come up with to solve the problem of which limitations should I choose. So you might write a, a basic musical phrase, and then、uh, the universe. 
or just by writing anything, you're imposing a limitation, right? So let's say you open up a piano roll and write a synth line. Well, you've already limited yourself to those particular notes, that tuning scale, etc. But also the um, timbre of that synth. And you might decide, like the thing is, the music that exists on the page is just, uh, uh, it's not, it looks concrete, but it's not concrete, if you know what I mean. So if I open up like a basic synth just to sketch out an idea, although you can listen back to it and it sounds like a square wave or something, in reality, it is just a representation for the infinitude of what synth sounds you might pick. And then you have to uh, play a game with yourself. So I write a line that goes like, do or something and then I have to think okay how do I make what what does do do mean what does do do what does that mean to me well that sounds like uh, I don't know it could be anything right it's too vague to even mean anything and then the further down you solve these problems after after you've solved the initial problems of narrowing down the possibilities then the game transforms into uh, a challenge of progression so it's like you have an initial idea you might write uh, an intro or maybe start with a chorus or something and then it's like well how do i contextualize this what, what can i put around this initial idea to give this idea meaning more meaning than it had initially because any musical sound can make sense in any context but the context is what gives it meaning if you know what i mean like a musical kuleshov effect the transition from a verse to a chorus is more important than the content of that verse and that chorus themselves. Uh, it has, or when I say more important, I mean it contains more information. So, uh, as an example, uh, let's say um, I, I, there's a thing that a lot of sort of Japanese music does. Uh, just off the top of my head, I'm thinking of the disappearance of Hatsune Miku, where you might have. Um, so in that song, you have obviously it's famous for having very fast sort of rapping singing sections where Miku is singing really quickly, and then there's sort of a bridge section which is really major key. It's like da 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 da, right? Something like that, and then it transitions into the chorus, which is like. Right? And that chorus on its own doesn't... It means something completely different if you're not coming from where you're coming from. If you know what I mean? And that that concept where it's not actually what you're saying that matters, it's the context around what you're saying that matters, is... is um, a, it's infinitely divisible. So the... That could be as broad as a track in an album, or even an album within a genre, right? Or even a genre within all of music, or music within all of art, right? It's contextualized, or art within society, um, right? It, it goes out infinitely, but it also goes in infinitely, right? Like, you you take... So, so one particular chord could mean tension in one, if you're coming from one place, or it could mean release if you're coming from a different place. Um, it, it all depends on where you're coming from and where you're going. Not the chord itself is meaningless. What matters is which chords precede it and which chords come after it. And it's the transition between those. It's the movement. It's the flow of intensities between different moments in time. That's where the meaning comes from. And so you, your challenge is to take what you've, take what's there and then decide what it, what that meant by take it by, by eliminating perfectly valid possibilities. And that's, that's the problem that you're trying to solve is I have this note and what note can I put after it that makes the, the note, the previous note mean something interesting uh so i th i've seen a few different um inter so there's a did i mention this before the person who runs cybergrunge.net uh they have a i definitely mentioned this they have a, a blog post or an article or whatever called the artist self-serious narcissist fool which i think is is maybe true the title um but the thing i kind of dislike about it which maybe is just coming from uh the sort of communist background that maybe I just am lacking context to understand what they mean here. 
but uh, they sort of uh, narrow down artists as sort of uh, just laborers. The art is just labor. Uh, but but perhaps the point of this is to say like there's no such thing as just labor. Like labor in itself is like valuable. You don't have to be higher than. Uh, a factory worker or, or whatever to be an artist like there's no reason why one is above the other which may be true um however i think that the thing they're missing here is the aspect of play where like i don't think a factory worker i don't think working in a factory is is a game in the same way that making music is a game like i think that's the that's the thing then that's the little bit of nuance that i think uh this article is missing is that that uh there's there's an element of play or and of uh yeah that's that's the main thing right and and perhaps the point is of of this article is that um uh you know in a in a communist utopia where you can be a what 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 does what does mark say like a, a critic in the evening or whatever and a hunter and a fisherman in the morning or whatever i forget the quote but that marks quote that like it it would be being a factory worker would be equally playful as being a musician. But I think there's something fundamentally different. Not Maybe not that fundamentally different. Like, maybe there are aspects of both in both. In fact, I'm, I'm sure there are. In fact, I'm 100%. Like, there definitely are aspects. Like, there are parts of music that are uh, somewhat not fun and kind of grindy, to use a modern term, I guess. Like, uh, um, learning the craft of playing an instrument is a lot of semi-boring practice and um or uh, uh there's sometimes when i'm writing a break course song and it's like i'm already most of the way through but i still need to come up with new breaks it becomes kind of tedious because every note has to be inputted manually and so it's like i already know what i want it to sound like but i still have to just go i just have to take it's just time consuming and rather than creative like i already know what i want to do i just have to spend the time to get there because I have to do it all manually and that takes ages. Like, there are definitely parts of it that are, as I imagine, working in a factory is like. And there are definitely parts of working in a factory or, you know, any other sort of traditionally non-creative job which actually are creative. That, like, once you put some of yourself into something, that is inherently creative. But I think the, the difference is that I don't see art or anything as particularly creative in the way that people consider creativity as in novelty like creating something unique that doesn't exist that that never existed before in fact everything already exists and you're just choosing from it like that's that's what it means to make it to 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 do any of this stuff it's that like the, the rather than sitting there and coming up with a new melody instead it's more like a subtractive process where all of the melodies that could possibly exist are already there and you're discarding them one by one, um, informed entirely by people who have come before you and the culture you've been exposed to. Uh, like, people are generally just a mishmash of their influences. I am. And that's not a bad thing, because those influences were also a mishmash of their influences. And this is like the... Yeah, this is what this is what makes all of the best stuff, is when disparate influences come join together and create something new. I mean, that's that's why we even have modern music in the first place, because the blues is a set of disconnected or previously disconnected influences like, you know, African folk music, gospel and uh, European folk music, as well as, you know, sort of some other stuff or like spirituals, I guess, might be a better word than gospel. I don't know. Uh, these disparate influences and people who are living as well as obviously the social context surrounding being black in the south at that time all coming together and rather than some individual artist being particularly creative and inventing this it's more like the artist is just a conduit and the 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 environment had to had no choice but to produce that if you know what i mean Uh, i think um maybe this is just another extension of my anti-humanism or whatever but i i don't think that there's like i agree with the 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 artist fool thing and that i don't necessarily believe that artists are creative geniuses inventing stuff from scratch but i do think that thelonious monk is right that a genius is the person who's most like himself that 
uh, like to, to actually make good art. The challenge is, I mean, you can, there are parts of it that are like study and getting good at your craft and so on, but that's kind of a secondary thing. The primary thing is to understand yourself and to uh, liberate yourself. Because when you're making these uh, decisions, when you're narrowing down the infinite possibilities of what could come next into one final decision, um, you there's there's a tendency to be dishonest. Uh, it's actually really difficult to be completely honest when you do this. Uh, maybe impossible. Um, and so to strive to be a, a a great musician or you know a genius like Thelonious Monk was, um, you is to to be able to be completely honest about yourself and uh that's a difficult that's yeah that's something very hard because it requires the technical skill to actually create what you envision or to to rather than sorry that was maybe a poor wording to to, to execute what the the what history is asking of you what your context is asking of you right if if uh if you're just a uh a conduit where um, these decisions flow through you to actually be honest and or to to be able to honestly portray those decisions is in itself a, a skill and you can be particularly good or particularly bad at it. I'm a bit confused as to why um, I've seen a few leftists do this. Um, so one example is this idea of like there is no unskilled labor. Like I don't think that's necessarily wrong as a sentiment. I think it's probably helpful as a sentiment, obviously, uh, you know, whatever. But I, I think what's maybe more important is to say that, like, where well, it doesn't really matter if labor is skilled or unskilled, workers still deserve rights regardless of what they do. That that would be my approach anyway, but so I'm getting a little off topic here. Like, I, I've seen a tendency among leftists to sort of deny that any work is harder than any other work, which I, is just a little confusing to me. Um, or sometimes they like to invert uh, traditional or rather capitalist values because uh, they're not traditional at all, but to invert capitalist values, which is probably valid by saying like, actually, you know, if you got rid of the people who work these highly specialized, uh, you know, traditionally difficult job or like the jobs that we conceive as like, you know, those sorts of things, society would mostly keep running. Whereas if you got rid of the menial workers, the garbage collectors, the factory workers, etc., society would not successfully keep running, which is probably a useful thing to point out. Um, but I don't think that necessarily means... I, I just don't think difficulty or skill is should be the deciding factor in any of this, if you know what I mean. When it comes to labor, I think the more important thing is how do we... Like, do you know what I mean? Like, I don't, I, maybe I'm, maybe I'm misunderstanding something, but that seems to me to be a strange, I don't know. But anyway, my point is some people are better at their jobs than other people. And that's just a fact. Uh, I suppose maybe the leftist point is, so what? I, I don't know. I, I don't really understand it. Uh, but, uh, the, the point I'm trying to make is if you're, if you're, you know, a, a quote unquote gene, because the thing is. I, I like on the surface I agree with this, but the reason I'm even mentioning this is because I was just listening to John Coltrane, and I I think John Coltrane was a genius, uh, and I'm trying to figure out why because and I think the reason is that he 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 could solve those problems in very honest ways. He could solve those problems of narrowing down options in a way that was brutally honest, but also so fast like like improvised jazz means you know unlike me who's sitting fucking although the other direction is also difficult if you're a composer who's spending months composing a symphony or maybe you have even longer like that's also hard in some ways the limitation of you have to make that decision right now on the in the moment might be helpful but it also requires thinking on you know there's 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 the, the limitation both of those are limitations right one limitation is you 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 have to do this right now in the moment and the other limitation is you cannot do this right now in the moment you have to think think it through and yet somehow make it seem not contrived like it, it is it harder to be honest with spontaneity or is it harder to be honest without spontaneity <laughs> I think both are hard. <laughs> I don't think one is actually harder than the other. Um, they're just different skills. Uh, but, you know, I, I do think John Coltrane was a genius. And I think the reason I think that is that he 
understood when he he was like the the genius artists are the ones who are really good at stepping back right like he he wasn't even there when when he was playing he's not there it's just the, the like it it's it, he he just understands how to completely melt away but trans by that i mean transform himself into a series of notes where he he ceases to be confined by a physical body and becomes a series of waves traveling through the air into your eardrums okay the, and that series of waves doesn't come from his instrument it comes from history those waves traveled through history and then he steps back and allows them to travel through him into his instrument out the other side and into your ears and i think that's maybe the 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 point is that you become so attuned to what the problems of narrowing down possibilities demand of you that it's like you disappear sorry that was one of the most pretentious fucking rants i've ever gone on but i hope it makes sense okay i don't know why i'm doing this i don't know why i'm recording this segment but i i guess i'm recording this segment to tell you to get off of social media or to be i don't i don't know i don't know so quote unquote social media particularly but the the problem is twitter let's be real here the problem is twitter my life has improved so much that i now that i'm not on twitter you know i i feel like i'm just less stressed about st- about everything the only problem is that i don't have sick ass memes to share constant but the thing is here's what i'm telling you is the memes are a psyop the memes are a goddamn psyop man they post the memes on Twitter and shit so that you're forced to stay there so that when people are sharing memes, you can contribute. But what you really need to, what we need to be doing is we need to be creating a new open space for meme sharing that isn't goddamn Twitter. I don't know. It's a little bit of a problem. But the real, the real point of this is that memes aren't even memes anymore. Memes are actual dog shit these days. Like, just avoid them. Just, like, you know? Like, where were the... I don't know. I don't know. To me, memes will never match up to anime reaction images. Like, that's kind of a a solved solved thing, you know? So, so you don't want to be on... Like, that's the only real reason to be on Twitter. And especially when... Actually, the place most people are getting their memes is from Discord meme channels as far as i understand which i'm not really in any uh and maybe i should be uh i'm i'm not sure but uh point being the real fucking i i, I just got a little a little frustrated so okay let's say you you're in a political debate on twitter and you're an anarchist and someone's like how are you going to manage large supply chains okay you have 240 characters to respond of course you're about to get fucking rolled. Of course you're about to get rolled. Like, there's no way to respond to a question that complex. You couldn't even answer that in, with capitalism. You couldn't explain how capitalism manages large supply chains in 240 characters. Like, you, th- that's an impossible ask. So it's like an instant own. Because all you have to do on Twitter to own someone is ask them a nuanced question. And obviously, whatever answer they give in the short space allowed will suck. And then, boom, you just meme on them for whatever shitty thing they said. Because it's going to be shitty because they have, they don't have enough space to say it. Like, it's so easy to just roll people on Twitter. That's the goddamn problem here. Is that you can't, you can never see nuanced takes from your opponents or from your proponents. You know what I'm saying here? It's stupid. The limited post size thing... The, the whole organizational structure is retarded. It's the worst place to ever have a political debate, which I used to think is, oh, then why would anyone ever do that? It's not actually the worst place to have a political debate. But worst place to have a political debate is the, like, a, a live stream chat, probably. But um, uh, it's, like, one of the worst places. And I used to think, so why does anyone do it? Oh, my God. It, like, you got to... No, no, no. That's why people do it. Because it's so easy to roll people. Because you can only make dumb takes... That means it's very easy to roll people, um, and it's very you know th- it also means it's very easy to post slogans that people would agree with. It's stupid, and I recommend you avoid it. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know. I, there's no like 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 maybe the best option is if someone asks. Like I, by the way, I'm not saying 
the 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 anarchist supply chains thing was just an example. I I think there are multiple anarchist theories that can manage large supply chains. Uh, and there are also multiple anarchist theories that might say we don't need large supply chains. Uh, I'm not saying I agree with any particular one of those positions. I'm just saying they exist and they're probably not absolutely retarded. Uh, I mean, just just off the top of my head, I would say like there's no reason in a sort of like, you know, very pragmatic. What's what's that fucking guy's name? Uh, hold on, I got to look this guy up. Bookchin. In like a very pragmatic bookchin kind of way, you could pretty easily say like, well, there's nothing like, there's no reason that workers' councils and consumer councils can't organize supply chains, you know, in in a similar structure as they already exist, right? Like right now, supply chains work by like, you know, money flows down the chain. Well, you could easily just have a sort of uh, collectives of workers um, just just bargaining, sort of, or like, you know, asking each other, the whole thing, fun, you know, that's just one option, not to mention market anarchism, of course, like left-wing market anarchism would just say, you don't, there's no problem with that, or there's a whole bunch of different ways to fucking solve that problem, and if you, you could argue that those would suck, I think that's, like, you could argue, you could have a nuanced debate on this topic, but not on Twitter. You f- you are physically incapable of doing this, and I I know everyone else figured this out years ago, and everyone knows it. Like everyone knows this deep down, and yet everyone keeps participating in it because because the the the, the website is designed very cleverly to play to manipulate your weak human biases and emotions to make you think that you're it's a gam it's like a casino right you, to get you you're gambling on your ability to ratio someone and or whatever. It's a, it's it, it it's playing on it's, it's manipulating you. It's manipulative. You need to you need to get away from it. Uh, I, I I I you know that's why YouTube is the only social media platform I use, even if you consider it to be a social media platform. Because at least on YouTube, you can put out a video as long as you need it to be to explain your nuanced point. Like I've watched, you know, and I'm sure many in my audience have as well, like lecture series, long long form lecture series on YouTube that explain a topic in as much depth as you would get from a university course. Uh, Maybe without some of the context of that university course, you know, but supplementing, you know, something like watching a lecture series and supplementing it with the recommended literature from that lecture series is about as nuanced of a introduction to any idea as you can possibly get from any methodology of being introduced to an idea. or, you know, you could have two opposing viewpoints and you can be destiny and do a, a four hour debate. And, you know, sometimes those debates are just screaming matches, but sometimes they're very nuanced and high minded and with smart people. You know, like the, there's there's actually the option to do to do the conversation well and to express ideas in a nuanced way. Of course, blog posts are also long form and possible it's possible to do this so i i just think we need to be we need to be in in favor we need to be against against short form like short form is is bullshit tiktok twitter these are short form mastodon you know against short form we don't we don't like short form you can make a because the thing about long form platforms is that you can still make something short on them right like you can you can make you can be Patricia Taxon, who for some reason I've been getting really into again recently. I've been rewatching their videos. You can be Patricia Taxon and you can make, you know, hour long video essays and then have a second channel where you make minute long little miniature posts about interesting stuff. That's as long as they need to be. I mean, even I do the same, but I mostly make ridiculously long bullshit but you know what i'm getting at right long form con like if 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 your platform is time limited or length limited i think it's just immediately a, a fail and it needs to it needs to go that's why i propose we uh i don't know what i propose a very nice thing just happened someone from my discord uh a uh, person by the name of do less who uh, is active in my community and seems like a very very nice person gifted me a cool tf2 item um and i'm very appreciative of that obviously very kind uh i i want to say though 
that I have not not that I have anything against the particular item they gave me because that in particular item is very cool because it's like got my logo on it and stuff. But like in terms of general skins in CS:GO type stuff or hats in TF2 type stuff, I think I made it pretty clear in my video. But someone else tried to give me a hat, um, not a very good hat, but a hat nonetheless. And I'm I just want to clarify that like I appreciate the sentiment. But I have very little interest in um, participating in these sorts of player economies in video games. I, uh, I've i done some CSGO case openings while drunk and looking to gamble, looking to do a bit of gamba. And they were kind of fun, but then obviously not just kind of disappointing because that's how it is. Hey, hey, if someone wants to give me a knife, you know, I won't say no to it. I won't say no to it. Um, but I think the problem is that the more people participate in it, the more pressure, social pressure, it, like, if you are above a certain rank in CSGO and you don't have a knife, it's like people look at you, people look at you kind of different, you know? Like, I, I've been in servers where people have made fun of, uh, well, not just me, but other people as well in the servers for not having certain skins in CSGO, which I think is kind of ridiculous, uh, I, I don't like that culture at all. If I, you, I've often thought, you know, you have these sorts of like shower thinking times, like hypothetical scenario type thoughts. One, I've thought like, if I was like a CSGO pro and I was like godlike at the game, I would, I, my, my gimmick would be that I, I used all default skins. I wouldn't own a single skin. And uh, I would like, I don't, I don't know if I could get away with telling people outright to not buy skins if I was actually a successful CSGO guy, like, Valve might be like, no, nope, don't do that. But I would, uh, I think I could say something like, I, I, I don't want to put the message out there that you have to spend money on the game to, uh, you know, be, be like the cool guys, you know? Like, this is my hypothetical, I'm a professional Counter-Strike player, shower thoughts, giving, giving interviews, fucking narcissism daydream stuff i'm like i, I want i want i want kids out there to think that you know I, I don't want them to think that you have to be rich to be successful like you know like i want to want to send a message to the people out there that like you know whatever those are my my fucking narcissistic daydreams uh so yeah i'm i'm not super i i i think it's fine if someone wants to send me that stuff and it's cool um, and yeah, I just don't think I, I'm, if it's costing any money, like it's just pixels, pixels, spend money on better pixels instead. Like actually don't spend money on pixels in the first place. That money could purchase a can of beans, which will feed you. Can I, can I talk about balding? Can I talk about molding and balding? So I'm, you can tell from my videos, I am, I'm balding young. I'm a young balder. It doesn't bother me. I, sometimes it looks bad, right? But it's not that, like, bo I'm bothered about balding. I just think sometimes it looks bad, which is a little strange. But, like, in general, not a problem. Because I grew up watching my favorite TV show of all time, the best TV show ever made, Star Trek The Next Generation, and idolizing Captain Jean-Luc Picard, played by Patrick Stewart, as the peak of all my aspiration the best male role model in all of media um just like as as my like what i aspire to be as a human being still to this day i think i think everyone should watch the show and if everyone watched star trek the next generation and aspired to be like picard or you know Riker or any of the other members of the crew the world would be a significantly better place if people actually aimed for that sort of thing digression. The point being, I grew up thinking this guy was the coolest guy, and he's bald, right? But not only that, Patrick Stewart went bald really young. He went completely bald in his, like, mid-twenties, late-twenties, I think. And so, because I found that out when I was young, I just always thought, well, he's the coolest guy ever, and he went bald early. So, I'm just like, well, I'm also, I'm kind of like, in that sense... Aren't I kind of like the coolest guy ever if I'm going bald early? Isn't that kind of like, look, I'm like this guy. Um, but more importantly, I really, really don't like the like pathologization of just normal shit. Going bald as a man is normal. <laughs> like, you can make fun of it if you want. I've done it. It's funny. 
right? But but I like making fun of it is is one thing. But the thing that's worse is when people say like, oh, oh, this person was diagnosed with male, with male pattern baldness. It's like hold on a goddamn second. That's not a diagnosis. That's normal. <laughs> you mother, you fucking idiot. Like that's not weird. You're supposed to go bald. <laughs> That shouldn't be, like, just because we have these beauty standards that say it's weird doesn't mean it's actually weird. Just like not having perfectly white teeth is actually normal. Not having perfect teeth is actually the default. Having perfect teeth or ha- having slightly crooked or slightly yellowed teeth isn't a disease. That's the default. Having perfectly straight white teeth like Americans do is fucking weird. Uh, I know, it's, you, I'm sure you're going to come up with some very creative jokes about English people and bad teeth in the comments. I'm sure you're having a lot of fun typing that up right now. Hey, my teeth are fine. Uh, but, like, the same thing with, like, having a... You know, some people have a full head of hair at 60 and good for them. Some people go bald in their 20s and that's also fine. I, I think anyone pushed on this issue would also say that. But there's an insidious little thing going on where it's like being pushed by plastic surgery types and like you know these sorts of people as if it's like a disease as if it's like you know you could say it it doesn't look great it's aesthetically unpleasing if you want you know say whatever you want about that that's fine but when people start saying no no no, there's there's something deeper it's a diagnosis it's a problem that's when i'm like okay come on chill the fuck out let's back the fuck up here it's just normal yeah i i think people need to be People need to be more accepting of the ball in our society, you know? <laughs> Maybe it's just a cope. I don't know. I've always felt this way, though, because my dad's bald, right? He's been bald my whole life. So I've always, you know, I've always been pro bald because I've got my dad and Captain Picard, who are two of my big male role models, both bald. So I've always, you know, and now I've got Northern Lion, right? We got, we got, we love, we love bald guys. We love, we love, we love bald guys on the No Thank You channel. Shouts out to balding men. The thing about AI that I just want to mention is, uh, I I think the dismiss I like I seem to be trying to push back at the dismissal of AI a lot because I find that a lot of the dismissal kind of comes down to the same sort of thing, which is it's just trying to do like X, right? Like it's not really anything like a human. It may produce results that are quite similar to people, but like th- if you look what's going on under the surface, it's just trying to do X. There's a couple problems with this logic. The first one is by the nature of how uh, these sorts of neural networks function, they're black boxes. We don't really know why they do what they do, uh, which is actually a pretty big problem. <laughs> uh, for AI research, as you can imagine, it's hard to research something if you don't really know how it's doing what it's doing. What we need to, like, re- the next big step, I think, is going to be a sort of neurosurgery, neuroscience for AI, where people are discovering how to perform surgeries on these neural networks and studying what's actually going on under, under the surface. And I think when they do that, I wouldn't be surprised if they find that a lot of similarities between AIs and human brains. And the reason I say that is because to me, it's not surprising at all. It wouldn't be surprising at all, let me just say. It wouldn't be surprising if they did find that because we are literally selecting for programs which produce uh, outcomes that we recognize as being similar to humans. Like that's literally what we're selecting for. So of course you would expect that they work similarly to how we work. That's what we are selecting for. And you would also expect all of the problems that we currently have with AI, where they uh, are confidently wrong, or uh, don't tell the truth, or their goals aren't aligned with people's goals, or, um, uh, you know, we don't really know what's going on inside their heads, because those are just all problems with humans. So, you know, it's not remarkable at all, to me at least, that we see any of these things, or that AIs, uh, you know, do whatever they do, if you assume that we're basically not unnaturally artificially selecting for traits similar to our own, that's literally what we're using them for. That's what we're trying to do is to try and make them because we already have computers that are better at us, better than us at doing a lot of things. Excuse me. <coughs> um, and so right now we're selecting for computers that are better that are like us. You know what I mean? Like it's not surprising that. Uh, 
let's say uh, large language models, for example, which are sort of the, the or even something like diffusion. Uh, it's not surprising to me that, or in other words, how do I put this? So it's like, of course, it, it's silly to dismiss these processes as sort of being just X, like diffusion, well, it's just running some programmatic functions on random noise uh, uh, with like, in you know, to make some sort of informed decision about how to perceive the image you're showing it, uh, right? It wouldn't be surprising, or it's not surprising that that's also seems to be kind of similar to how human vision actually works, that like our actual vision, our focus is quite limited and a lot of the detail is made up of a, a, a very well-informed hallucination. Uh, any neuroscientist who's studied how we perceive visual stimulus will tell you that I'm right about this. Um, uh, and in the same way, you know, these sorts of language models that seem to, if all they're trying to do is predict the next word in a sentence, and yet they seem to have thoughts and sometimes feelings and opinions and so on, and do very human things like lie, for the, uh, or, uh, you know, disagree and all these sorts of things. Maybe, you know, saying, oh, it's it's just X, it's just, it's just trying to guess what word comes next, seems to belay to me that maybe we are just a bit of a more complicated version of the same sort of thing. Because of, like, there are a million different theoretical ways that we might have tried to get AI to talk like us, right? And a lot of them have been tried and a lot of them have failed. Uh, and so, of course, the one that seems to be the most successful is the one that's producing the most human-like results, most likely because it's the one that's most similar to us. No? Is that not reasonable to assume? Like, in a, in a, it's a sort of survivorship, uh, or it's like, what was the point of any of this if, if that wasn't what we were doing? I don't know if they were doing it on purpose, but that seems to be the only outcome, is that we eventually end up with something similar to us. Because... You, you can't consistently get the same comparable outcome to human... Like, let's say they were trying to do something else. Let's say you were trying to create a, uh, some sort of model that simulates, um, uh, I don't know, uh, gravity. You can't, you know, you could, you could luck into some sort of model that uh, resembles gravity or the way sort of gravity, you know, physics objects behave in certain sets of circumstances uh, through some sorts of physical laws that aren't real, you know, like some sort of set of parameters that don't actually resemble the real world. And you will get some limited success with that. But as, as you want to expand that model to cover more and more bases and be more and more accurate to what it's trying to simulate, it's going to naturally resemble natural laws of gravity more and more until eventually it's going to be, you know, very close because that's literally what you're trying to do. And so it's not surprising or, you know, you would expect that as large language models and diffusion models and all of these sorts of things um, evolve or are selected for, they're going to approach uh, the way that humans think. And if that turns out to be a little more simple than we would like to think about ourselves. Um, you know, like uh, in the case of a lot of people, I think are just just don't want, they don't want to know that their thoughts might not actually be logical and, and how much post hoc reasoning goes on in their daily life for their perceptions and what they think and how they understand the world in general. Like people are scared of the truth, which is... Um, most of what you experience and think and feel is a hallucination, or if not all of it. it uh, that our brains are machines that, or the main job of the brain is to trick itself, in a sense. That, like, consciousness isn't what, isn't actually how we experience consciousness. That experience is a trick. And I'm not just making this up, or coming at it from some philosophical, you know... <laughs> Some philosophical position of ultimate doubt, like like Hume or, or or Descartes or something. I'm saying this based on neuroscience as well. That uh, you know uh, the the studies on memory and have repeatedly shown this kind of post hoc reasoning. Uh, you can see this in people who have certain types of brain damage that affect their memory centers, where their brain will still try and reason out some. Um, 
uh, backstory or reasoning behind their behaviors, even if it doesn't actually make any logical sense. And that sort of implies, you know, th that alone implies that that's, a brain is capable of doing that and making the person who is experiencing it feel exactly like that's real. But then you go and head and apply s studies to people with normally functioning brains and you see the same sort of thing where their brains, you know, they may do something for some reason unknown to them and then, you know, po po most likely influenced by something like genetics or the, their environment or any other number of factors. And, uh, but when you ask them about it, they will tell you, oh, no, 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 this was my free choice and I did it because of this, 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 and this. But, and I've always thought this. But in reality, you only think you always thought this because your memory is part of the thing that's being manipulated by your own brain. That your memory isn't actually a reliable storage medium. Um, in the same way, there's a, an image that's been shared of an AI who just refuses to accept that this person, or Bing's AI specifically, was talking, Bing's AI was talking to someone, I don't remember the exact conversation, but the AI just makes up a conversation they had previously. It says like, you, you were mean to me, you said this, this and this, which didn't happen. And the AI refuses to accept that that didn't happen. In the same, because that's how he, that's how memory works. That's how human memories work. That we are completely fallible, and we're not used to computers doing that sort of thing. But these aren't these aren't working in the same way as normal computers do. They're working in the same way as our memories work, which is mainly <laughs> uh, something that's like interpreted uh, as it goes, rather than sort of a perfect or even particularly good storage medium. So, you know, over and over again, I'm seeing these sorts of things with AI that seem to be teach, like confirming certain branches of neuroscience or, you know, the modern almost consensus of neuroscience about how much control or how, how illusory our conscious experience actually is compared to what the brain is actually doing. It seems like it wouldn't be that surprising if, um, <clears throat> given how fundamental languages to organized and structured thought, which seems to be very fundamental. Uh, it wouldn't be surprising if it turned out, uh, you know, that language, like as in the sort of game of guessing what word comes next, following not just the syntactic rules of language, but the, the, the impl implicit logical rules of language is actually how we justify a lot of our thoughts. Sorry, I gotta kill the scout. It's a scout v scout battle. Ah, fuck. How much health did he have? Oh, oh, he was, he had overheal. I don't know why I went after him. I was initially trying to kill, I was trying to kill this medic and then the medic ran away and started healing a scout and then the scout defended the medic and then I ended up fighting an overhealed scout as a scout and uh, losing. Um, uh, so yeah, my, my point is, I, I don't think, like I'm, I'm a little less worried about AGI than you would expect me to be. Um, uh, particularly, I'm not super worried about uh, um, super intelligent AGI because um, AIs require, <clears throat> well, there's a few reasons. It's mainly just based on resources and what AI needs to survive. So um, just as one example, you know, an AI needs to exist on hardware. Like there's no, uh, there's no reason you couldn't unplug an AI. Right. It can't actually just live in the ether. And, and the only argument people have is that, like, well, it could manipulate people to stop it from a, um, stop itself from being unplugged, which is true. It could do that. But it can't be that much better than a human at doing that because its only training data is humans as the only other intelligent life form on the planet that we have the ability to make sense of. It can't be trained to be beyond itself, if you know what I mean. Like, you can train... A AI, let's say you want to train a, a, a diffusion model to generate images. You can train it to generate images, you know, you can, you can show it a bunch of stuff and it will generate novel images based on the stuff that it's already seen. Uh, but if you showed an AI, let's say you show an AI a bunch of images from <clears throat> various movies and it's never seen a beach and then you ask it to generate a beach, it can't do that, right? It might give it its best shot, but it won't do a very good job of it. That's how I understand AI, right? It can't come up with novel data that it hasn't seen before, although it can 
well, rather it can't come up with context to, to understand something. You know what I mean, right? Like, I think that's a good example with the beach thing, right? It can't generate a beach if, it's, if it has no idea what a beach is. Um, and in the same way, you know, AI have only ever had access to human language, human conversations, human data. It can't generate a version of itself that surpasses the data that it's been given. It can only be really good at passing that data. It could be better than a human at passing that data. It could just know more things than a person. Uh, but it, it, I don't, like, the problem is, um, well, I suppose it's partly a problem of scale, like how many nodes in a network, given how many nodes humans have. But then again, there are examples of humans with brain damage or fewer nodes that seem to do perfectly okay. Like the famous example of the guy who had, like, most of his brain was hollow and yet he had a perfectly normal life. Um, but in order to be a super intelligence, not just a very smart human, like, I, that's what I think, right? I think AI is kind of, at least in its current form, is kind of limited to the upper limit of very smart human. Like, I, I don't understand how AI, as it currently exists, could it, just by throwing more and more parameters at it or training it better and so on, could surpass um, very smart human who has access to the internet in terms of intelligence. Like, the only... It could, it could surpass it in terms of ability, like an AI could uh, draw photorealistic images better than a human, it already can do that, or um, do maths better than a human, or all of these sorts of things. But in terms of like broad strokes intelligence, I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure. I, it seems unlikely to me, like linguistic thinking logic intelligence, or emotional intelligence even. It, it can only ever be as good as the best human is, as the best, the best examples of the data it has. Unless I'm completely wrong about that, but that's how I understand AI to work right now. Uh, we're doing a bit of scout gameplay on, uh, where even are we? What is, this, uh, what is this map called? I don't know what this map's even called, I forget. Swiftwater? Is this Swiftwater? I think it might be Swiftwater. Yeah, there you go. I don't know, tell me if I'm wrong. Have I already talked about this? I don't know. But, uh, identity and... Like, I don't want to say the phrase identity politics because that has a whole host of connotations, which is not necessarily what I mean, but kind of is what I mean. I just think I have a fundamental difference with a lot of people when it comes to a philosophy of identity, in that I see identity as sort of inherently traumatizing, that, like, when you have an identity, you you can't not be hurt by it. Your identity differentiates yourself from yourself. Um, and I think that people ought to be, including myself, um, I think people would live better lives if we let go of this concept a little more. I don't necessarily know that we have to completely abandon it. I would have said we should a few years ago, but uh, you know, I, I don't necessarily know that I would go so far, or even if it's possible to do something like that. But I think being a little less tied to your own concepts of identity and tying others less to your concepts of their identity and so on is probably liberatory. Um, and it seems like uh, people disagree with me on this, that because I agree that there is some level of satisfaction or pleasure that can be gained from having your identity reinforced. So for example, if you see yourself in a certain way and then something comes along that reinforces, yes, you're right about yourself, you are the cool guy who is that certain way, right? Like, uh, if I see myself as, I don't know, uh, a genius uh, artist and I release some painting and someone comes along and says, wow, you're a genius artist, that's affirming, um, of course, and it's a positive like it it makes you feel good temporarily but i think this is a trick i think that this this is is sort of a you're going to end up chasing the dragon after pleasures like this like i don't think this is a sustainable or reliable way towards satisfaction in your life i think you're just going to be constantly chasing after this idealized form of yourself which can never actually appear in the world and uh you're going to be forever trapped imprisoned in your own mind by your self-conception, uh, and this is, in part at least, a product of predominant thought patterns. Now, whether these thought patterns are societally programmed or biologically programmed, I can't say. I don't know. Uh, but they exist, and no matter where they come from, I think it is best to try and rise above them. These 
this urge to categorization can be useful in lots of disciplines um, and even in interpersonal relationships or in introspection. But at the end of the day, it's important, it's very important to be highly sceptical of these sorts of um, mechanisms and to always remember that they are just tools and representations, not uh, definitions, that they are a layer we put on top of the world, not a base layer of the world itself. They are a tool for understanding, um, but the second they stop being useful, they should be discarded because they are not qualities of the world itself, they are qualities of our minds to help us make sense of the world. And they are useful for helping us make sense of the world. But And the second they stop being useful, they ought to be discarded. And they ought not just be replaced with another set of categories which will equally allow for exclusion and equally allow for self-alienation and so on. That we, sh- we ought to, rather than saying, oh, and this is the true category, what we ought to do is remember that those forms of identity, identification, that those those processes of identification are for legibility only. They're shorthand. They're, they're not um, factors of the world. And that no matter how many times you adjust your methods of identification, you, can, you will never actually approach... Um, liberation some sort of liberatory liberating some sort of liberating truth you will never approach some sort of liberating truth because you are definitionally you are imposing uh some sort of uh limiting structure onto the world and so seeing yourself you know it's very difficult i think to see to not see yourself in a way um and I think the way you get around this is by embracing multipli- multiplicities to have, as Cold War Eshin would put it, a series of heteronyms to understand yourself as separate or interconnected yous rather than saying, I am one me with many faces or I am or like this is the true me and these are acts I put on or anything like that to rather say there are many me's. And those me's are expressed with different intensities in different times and places. Um, And in fact, they could be anything. Uh, That's, I think, the best way to do this. So I'm not talking about, you know, I'm sure when you listen to me saying that stuff, you can probably interpret it to be about any number of things, race, gender. But it could also be something trivial, more trivial than those things, you know. And it's equally harmful, I think, if you are um, engaging in this process of identification. I don't know. I think this is a good word that I've come up with. Process of identification. Um, Yeah, I think this is a good word I've come up with. I should write this down somewhere. Uh, Yeah. So I think this is a difference that I have with a lot of people. Is that where uh, a lot of people seem to argue for things because, uh, as, as good, because they affirm... Um, what they see as better identity structures. And I'm not saying this, you know, you're probably, I'm, I'm sure you're probably interpreting this to mean like trans stuff. And sure, you can interpret it that way. Uh, but it's applicable to pretty much anything uh, because the opposite side believes the same thing is what I'm saying. Right? Like so you could say leftists are saying blah, blah, blah. But then the, the right wingers are doing all the anti-trans, the TERFs, anyone who's in favor of traditional uh gender separations gender binary they're also doing the same thing like both sides are doing the same thing um when the actual root of the matter is where just engaging in a process of identification based on certain correlated markers correlated traits and behaviors um but they could just as easily be anything or nothing in any side and you're not going to solve the problem by building a better system of identification. You're only going to solve the problem by freeing yourself from identity. After that philosophical diatribe, I think we're going to get back to what my channel has basically become now, apparently, which is talking about Team Fortress 2. I've become good at trimping. Uh, I've always... I guess I just have a natural knack for source engine movement. But today I realized that, like, the amount of control I have while trimping is legitimately good. Like, better than most people, I think. Uh, which is surprising, given that I still am, like, new to the game. 
Uh, but I got a comment today. Like, I was playing Upward, which is the best map for trimping. And, um, yeah, I, I was, you know, defending uh, the last the last uh, checkpoint on Upward. Uh, and I did the, the big trimp off of the tiny... You, you won't know this if you don't know what I'm talking about. But there's a... There's a, a trim spot that's like a little tiny little staircase. It's, it's not the hardest trimp in the game. There's smaller ledges to trimp off of, but it's not super easy to hit. Like certain other spots that are massive, massive ramps. Uh, it's a it's a smallish ramp, uh, but it's not. Yeah, it's not that crazy. The hard part is that once you go launching off that ramp, you have to get a lot. If you get a lot of speed, you can go launching all the way over the sort of cliff area. And then down to this little, like, all the way around the corner, almost, like, a, in a full 180 curve. And if you maintain your speed properly, you can then land on a second ramp, which you can ramp slide off of and maintain some of your momentum and keep going. And I pulled that off, which I've done a few times. I'm not 100% consistent at it, but I've done it quite a few times. And someone on the enemy team said in, in chat, damn, that demo can trimp. And I replied, uh, I can trimp, but I can't aim, sad face, which is unfortunately true. Uh, how I am just ma like, the more I play, the more I realize that I am handicapping myself so much. <laughs> like, man, I wish that the, the fucking Iron Bomber or something had just, just one more grenade pipe in the clip. Because you, you you just are so fucked if you have two guys on you. <laughs> You're so fucked if you miss one shot. Like, you have to... It, reloading takes so long. Switching weapons takes so long. And it's like, if you... Like, if you get surrounded by two guys, you're in a situation where there's two guys and you've, you've used up your charge. You're just fucked. Like, you can hit... hit even if you hit your pipes on the first guy... Like, let's be real, and one of them's a scout, right? One of them's a scout, one of them's, uh... I know, you're just... You're so limited. Like, you're so fucked in so many... The idea is you don't put yourself in those situations, and that's what I need to get better at, obviously. Let's get that out of the way. Is that you have to accept that you're playing as a class that is not gonna win every engagement through pure skill, that there are some engagements you just can't win, and part of the skill of playing that class is to understand how to avoid those sorts of engagements and put yourself in a position where you're taking 1v1s against classes you can win against. I understand that. I'm just not good enough at it yet to do it. Um, I need to be thinking more actively about doing that as I'm playing because uh, I often end up sort of uh, trying to relate on raw aim or not really thinking about the sort of engagements I'm taking and I need to think about that more. I'm aware of this and I'm working on it. But that aside... You can't always control what fights you're in, or you might make a mistake or something. You end up in a fight where it's like a two-on-one. Let's say one of them's a scout and one of them's like some sort of, you know, soldier or medic or some other mid-class, mid right? So the scout, you're going to miss pipes against. You're not going to hit every shot against the scout. It's impossible. Um, they're too fast. Unless you're insanely cracked or the scout has very bad movement, uh, it's just really hard to hit competent scouts they scouts kind of counter you like as demo with pipes scouts kind of counter you and um pyros kind of counter you uh, heavies also you're gonna have a bad time uh so you're in a situation like that it doesn't even have to necessarily be a scout like i've lost interactions where it's like i'm fighting a soldier with a medic pocketing the soldier and it's, you just can't win, because even if you manage to take out one of them, you then have two pipes, one pipe, right? And if, if you miss one, like, you should be, ideally be able to take out classes with two pipes, right? But you're not going to have perfect aim, or whatever. And they, there's such a long, like, you can't hold that, you know, it takes so, like, it's like a boom, 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 boom. Like, it's so slow, even, even maximum spamming M1, it's so slow to launch pipes. And then if you don't have those, it's like, okay, gotta switch to my sword, but now, most classes in the game can run away from you faster than you can get to them, and you don't have any ranged weapons, so while you're trying to catch up with them, they're fucking shooting at you, <laughs> and if you try and use evasive movement, 
that slows you down because now you're moving sideways instead of moving forwards. And so you have to choose either to tank the damage and, um, you know, die in the hopes of killing them before they kill you, which barely ever works because it still takes two shots, two, two hits with the, a sword to kill, unless you have like an insane eyelander heads racked up. Or you try and evade their rockets or bullets or whatever, in which case, firstly, you're not a particularly fast moving class, so your evasive movement is fairly limited. But secondly, even if you do succeed, like you only succeed temporarily, you don't actually eliminate the threat. You have to, I guess, hope that one of your teammates takes care of them, which might not be possible. Um, you're just you're just fucked basically. Like you can't take those fights if you don't have charge. Now, ideally, you manage your charge properly so that when you find yourself in a situation like that, you can try and get a couple of pipes off and do at least do some damage, if not get one kill, and then charge the fuck out of there. Or, I mean, th this is kind of what the best combo is, is to hit him once with a pipe and then hopefully somehow end up in melee range so that you can kill him with the sword, get your charge back, and run the fuck away from there. Uh, which is, the problem with that is that uh, the swords are, in my opinion, and maybe you disagree, but in my opinion, they're nerfed too much. They're a little underpowered, specifically in that they take too long to draw. I understand that that's supposed to be the downside to compensate for their range and damage, but I don't think they should take as long to draw as they do. If it was up to me, I would make them a little faster to deploy, uh, because that just means that you're like it's so easy you won't like i don't know how to impress this upon you more so hitting like pipes are the hardest weapon to hit shots with in the game because not only are they a projectile weapon so rather than shooting hit scan where the enemy is you have to predict where they're going to be you also they have drop off so you know not only do you have to predict where the enemy is going to be you also have to predict how the arc of your shot is is gonna you know reach them how how to calculate for the drop off of the arc of your shot um so you know there's and un unlike uh like it's for example it's much harder to do so with let me just sorry i'm having a stroke uh so with rockets you know there's obviously i'm not saying it's easy to hit targets with rockets it's also difficult but at the very least you can always aim for the ground and uh, the splash damage shoots the enemies up in the air which makes their movement predictable with the pipes it's a lot harder to hit an enemy's feet because rockets explode on impact with the ground whereas pipes will just sit there and wait if you miss their feet right so with, with rockets you shoot the ground in front of the guy you're fighting and launch them up in the air and then you they either you hit them with a rocket while they're in the air, if the the combo, because when you're in the air, when you've been launched up by damage, you, you don't have much momentum to control yourself. You can air strafe and surf the rocket and damage. And, you know, if you're skilled and you can evade it, but it's limiting, it's much more limiting than being in complete control of your own movement. Um, and then even if you don't hit the second rocket while they're in the air, you, they take a bunch of fall damage when they land. They're vulnerable, you can hit them with a rocket when they land, you know, you have a lot more options. With pipes, or iron bomber grenades, whatever you want to call them, uh, if you, you can't, you have to hit their, their physical body, you have to hit them directly, uh, really, because, um, you, you know, you, the, the pipes will just sit on the ground doing nothing for, like, a few seconds, and that's rather than exploding on contact with the ground when the enemy's actually standing there, right? Like, they can't, it's possible, and I've done it, you know, it's definitely a strategy that you use to fire pipes to sit on the ground as little landmines, hoping that the enemy will stay in that area, and that's definitely a legit strategy. They do a lot less damage, but it's definitely a legit strategy. Um, but it's nowhere near as effective as uh, shooting rockets at the... At the enemy's feet is to launch them up so you don't you know it's possible to do this it's just much it's just harder in my opinion normally this is compensated for by the fact that demos have the um stickies which are probably one of the most powerful weapons in the game um but hybrid knights don't have stickies 
um, so you the the pipes are balanced so that they're not OP when combined with stickies. And, you know, they borderline are. Stickies are very powerful area denial tools. Um, uh, they're not balanced for use with swords, which is fine, because the point should be that the swords are then, uh, you know, slightly more powerful. I don't think swords should be an upgrade from stickies. Sticky should be the most powerful weapon in Demo's arsenal, and Demo Knight or Hybrid Knight should be a niche subclass. I agree with the way that that's laid out. Um, yeah, your problem is really options. That if you forgivably miss shots with the hardest weapon to land shots on in the game, or at least one of the hardest ones, if you miss your shots um, and you don't have charge, which is likely because you're probably you're pretty likely to start an engagement with by charging. The reason being that uh, charging into an enemy gives you mini crit damage, or if you you can do a, a shield bash, so it's a good way to initiate a fight and bring chip down some of the enemy's health initially. Um, and also, demo is just very slow. So if you're trying to approach an enemy from far away without charging, they have a lot of time to hit you where your projectiles aren't, you know, are only really good in mid-range, so you're going to have a hard time hitting them if you can't close the distance fast with uh, a uh, charge. Um, so, and charging takes a damn long time to recharge, 10 seconds, which is a long time in TF2. So you're stuck there, and then the problem is, the sticky launcher takes 10 fucking years to reload. It takes so long to reload... It takes so long between each shot and it takes so long to reload that you're stuck there literally helpless. You have no way of dealing damage to the enemy or escaping. You have nothing, there's nothing you can do. There's absolutely nothing you can do. You're just dead. And this happens to me a lot. Like, it, I can deal with one enemy, but how, how often do you face a, a reasonable matchup 1v1 on the flanks? Like, your best matchups aren't the classes that are often flanking, right? Like, Scout is not a good matchup. Scout, often flanking, but uh, your, the problem is uh, he he's too damn fast and hard to hit with the hardest weapon to hit shots on in the game. So against Scout, your best tactic is uh, to try and hit him with the, the, the... Now, your advantage against Scouts is you do have a reasonably good matchup against them... Uh, with your sword and shield. Uh, I consider it to be sort of like the AWP in CSGO, where the point of the, the way the AWP in CSGO is balanced is that, yes, you have this really powerful attack that is a guaranteed body shot kill, but if you miss your first shot, you're, um, it, there's a long time between shots, you're almost guaranteed to die. So it's like a high-risk, high-reward strategy, where uh, if you successfully pull it off, you're guaranteed to win, but if you fuck up, you're guaranteed to lose. Uh, scouts is the same situation if you can successfully hit the shield bash mini crit sword combo that's an inst that kills us that that kills any scout that isn't overhealed um and it's very satisfying to do as you know it's a it's a good combo it's a pretty reliable combo but if the scout has good enough movement and evades your shield bash or avail evades your sword slash then you're stuck with your pants down you have no recourse you can't because they're faster than you. You unless you have Islander kill, but they're gem, they're almost always faster than you. They can run away from you and shoot you as you're running away, and you can't do anything about it. You can't catch up to them with the sword. Hence, that's why stick. That's why pipes exist, right? But again, like scouts counter demo pipes. Like scouts are designed specifically to be really hard to hit with pipes uh, and rockets. Like, they're, they're, that's what they're good at. And especially uh, when you're playing against people who are good with Scout, like, they're just so fucking unpredictable with their movement. It's like they're invincible. Like, I, I play on Uncle Topia, where there were a lot of good Scout players, and, you know, these guys are just fucking, like, they just, I don't know, man. I, I, I get rolled every time. Which, it, and it's not, you know, I have, I'm not saying I never win this engagement. Like, I do, I have hit Scouts with pipes lots of times it's just that i not as many times of as they've killed me <laughs> but i like it's it's very possible um against scouts that aren't paying attention like if they're engaged with someone else and they're not paying attention to you uh or if they're far away they're they're not in they haven't managed their distance to you correctly 
um, or by just predicting their movement properly, and they're not particularly good at moving unpredictably, you can actually it's that that actually turns it into a really easy thing to win, right? Because scout doesn't have much health, but uh, it entirely depends on the skill of the other scout player. A good scout becomes impossible to hit. It's just an unwinnable fight. Uh, so you know you got to be careful when you're when you're engaging scouts. Uh, and you got it like you just have so many unfavorable matchups. But I don't want to switch off because trimping is so fun. Trimping is so damn fun. And when I switch off, when I f equip stickies or switch to a different class, I feel like I keep tr I keep like missing the the boost, the shield boost, the shield charge thing. Like it's such a good mechanic uh, that I enjoy using so much, and it opens up so many movement possibilities. Even rocket jumping feels limited in comparison uh yeah so that that's the damn problem is it's it's very easy to basically soft lock yourself in engagements and so the problem is the the answer to that is to learn to avoid those sorts of fights better um sometimes this is unavoidable i will say um maybe this is just a bad habit because i enjoy trimping a lot as an activity in itself maybe not even necessarily tactically useful but it's just fun to pull off uh, so like for example i was playing a game today on dust bowl where i was like okay i'm gonna hit a trimp off of this little shallow ditch in the ground uh which is like the only place in dust bowl that is, is like a viable trimping spot it's on the second stage of dust bowl when there's like a little uh dip in the ground that you can trimp off of if you land it correctly uh and fly it there's like a little cave section afterwards it's like I can trimp all the way over here, land directly in the cave and just basically sport like I'll just I'll come out of fucking nowhere and just appear there instantly and then just fucking spam mouse one and launch stickies into whoever's in front of me because it's a tight narrow space and they won't have time to react. This strategy has worked for me in the past. Uh, it's not reliable. It's pretty stupid, actually, um, but it is fun. Uh, and it, it you will kill spies and scouts and snipers and medics this way. Uh, but this time, you know, I trimp there and I land and I land face to face with an Ubered Heavy. <laughs> so you can't predict stuff like that. You have no way of knowing that an Ubered Heavy is going to be around that corner. Uh, and obviously you can't fight that. Uh, so it is very easy to to, to land in an, in a in an environment where you're soft locked. Because if you run out of ammo for your iron bomber, um, you and you don't have charge to escape, you're fucked. Like, if you're a soldier in that situation, you can pull out your shotgun. Or, even if you don't have a shotgun for some reason, or you don't want to, reloading, you know, but in the time it takes to reload your rockets, to put one more rocket in the chamber... Let's say that's the same as the Iron Bomber. I don't know if it actually is, but let's say it takes the same amount of time to put one more, to reload one rocket as it takes to reload one Iron Bomber shot. Uh, then, as soldier, all you have to do, you can just rocket jump away, if, assuming you still have enough health. You can just shoot directly down and rocket jump away, and you still have some way of escaping from a bad situation. Um, you can... Uh, uh, I've tried this with the Iron Bomber. You can pipe jump... I, I enjoy pipe jumping. I actually do it quite a lot. It might be inadvisable because of all the self damage, but uh, I I pipe pipe jumping is very fun and useful for maneuverability. Gets you kills sometimes. Gets you to places where the enemy doesn't expect a demo to be. Uh, it's good, but because pipe jumping you don't control when the pipe explodes. It doesn't explode when it hits the ground. You shoot at the ground and then you're left there staring at your fucking thing on the ground, trying to figure out the timing while also getting shot at. Like, there's been... There, I, like, I remember the first time I tried to do this, I was like... I was in this exact situation where I had shot all of my iron bomber shots and I had no charge. And the guy I was fighting, I believe, was a, a medic and a uh, someone else. I don't remember who, but he was healing someone else. Might have been a scout. Uh... And I ended up in that situation and I missed all my pipes or missed one of my pipes or missed three of my pipes or whatever. Um, and I had no charge. And so I reloaded one pipe, shot it at the ground. And at the time I had basically full health. And in the time it took waiting 
for the timing to when I need to time my jump to get away off of my exploding pipe, the guy I was fighting shot me and now I no longer had enough health and so the pipe just killed me. Uh, now there is another strategy, but it's very situational and I've never pulled it off, even though I'm aware that it exists. But there is a very powerful situational strategy where you basically get right up in the enemy's face and pipe jump off of them by shooting at them and crouch jumping at the same time so that the self damage from it shooting them instantly blows you backwards and away from the fight. And I'm, this is a fa an effective technique, I'm sure. It's just like, if I could approach them, I would have approached them already because I would be swinging at them with my goddamn sword. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I think, I think the sword needs to be faster to deploy because if you run out of pipe shots and the enemy closes the distance on you or something like that, you're so fucked. Like, you have no recourse. But maybe I'm just molding. Maybe maybe it is well balanced, and maybe I'm playing a meme class and I should expect it to be meme -y, uh, which is probably true. And get better at taking the 1v1s that I want to take instead of ending up in stupid 1v3s that it's hopeless to win. Uh, like, I feel like... I don't know. I don't know what I feel like. I'm just molding. I'm, I'm not even molding about pyros anymore, man. Like... Yeah, you're just gonna get repeatedly killed. Like, that's just- a, I've just accepted this now. I, I'm slowly learning to be more cautious around pyros and not just rush in. I'm slowly learning it. Um, to- I'm like, one of the things that I'm learning is to read- to understand, like, the- because the thing about a pyro is it's not an impossible kill with just a sword, right? Like, you can- you can demo knight against a pyro. It's- you just have to get- them in the right position where they're not paying attention. Like, I don't think you can demo knight against a heavy unless the heavy is already really low on health. I think it's impossible. I think that's an impossible matchup. Uh, yeah. And I don't think you can demo knight against a pyro who is paying attention to you because it requires getting close and they can always just air blast you away. Now, is air blast overpowered? Yes, everyone agrees that air blast is overpowered, I think. Um, but, you know, uh, ours is not to reason why. Ours is just to do or die. And in this case, you're going to die. Uh, but if the pyro is distracted, it's not too difficult to shield bash mini crit combo the pyro, and then it just takes one pipe or one sword swing to finish them off. Even I think they might even have enough low health that even splash damage from a pipe would would finish them off. The problem is it takes so damn long between each sword swing, and it takes so damn long to pull out your iron bomber in that situation that. The pyro has so much time to react and air blast you away that it becomes really difficult. So unless you're extremely confident that the pyro is facing the other direction, you can get a free hit on them and then get behind them so then they don't facing in your direction or they don't know where you are and get that second sword swing in. That's when you can win against the pyro. And it's not even that, like in that situation, if you actually position yourself correctly, it's actually pretty free. It's just a rare, like, you have to learn to spot when that's something that's going to happen. And I've slightly figured out how to do this. But in general, you just need to, I, I, I say you, but I'm talking to myself here. I just need to learn that sometimes there are, there are fights that I just can't win. Yeah. Honestly, against one scout, I have a pretty favorable matchup. The problem is when there's, like, three scouts on the enemy team. Then I'm fucked. Uh, against one average skill scout, I have a favorable matchup. Against a good scout, I have no fucking chance. I made this video, you may have seen it, about education reform uh, in reply to Osaka. It was a very fun video to make. Um, I often forget that I am very passionate about education reform. Because if you think about it, ed the education system is uh, and the failings of it informed every part of my politics and philosophy, they were the first things that informed my worldview, essentially, is being in the midst of consistent failures of the education system and, you know, being on the receiving end of that. And I constantly felt like I was being failed by the adults in my life and the authority figures in my life. And my reasoning was simply, uh, which I think turned out to be correct, that by the time that no one really enjoys school, or a small minority of people enjoy school. And by the time you get out of school, you're so happy to finally be out of it that you don't even stop to think about 
how to make it less shit for the next generation. And secondly, that we have this strange um, but understandable uh, uh, convention, I guess, or assumption that it's better for everyone to have the same shared trauma from school. That it's better to have every kid have this standardized fucked up experience so that we're all going into the world on a level playing field rather than having, you know, a bunch of homeschooled kids or a bunch of weird competing school systems with different uh, organizational structures or, uh, you know, private schools and all of these sorts of things with all sorts of wildly different structures and uh, so on, you know, some of which may be better or even if the even if the majority are better, you know, they're, they're so different from each other that we would be less able to relate to each other after school or even during school with people from separate, you know, backgrounds. And that having that trauma be standardized rather than having a better, you know, or beginning to implement a better system or avoid that system through existing means, if it means that people can't relate to each other, people don't have these shared experiences they can call back to as a reference point socially. And I, I think that's a terrible assumption if you really you know put that into practice every in every part of your life you can argue against ever improving anything you know as long as it's standardized but i do think there's some veracity to it um you know i think having a shitty standard is better than having no standard i think that bears fruit in lots of different fields that it's better to have a shit standard than to have no standard uh but i don't think that's actually a good argument in favor of schooling when we're not talking about you know standard for mathematical measurement or something but a standard for children's lives uh yeah i I don't think you can really make that argument um so i am pretty passionate about education reform um i i don't know how to i don't know what to do with this passion like i don't know who to talk to about it (laughs) how i don't know if it's possible to you know in order to make change in this department i'd need to acquire power and i don't know what avenue I could go down to acquire that power that would be practical for me, you know, like probably a probably a whole different life path. But I think you need people like that, right? The people who are getting into the education sector of government or even just the education sector in general are going to be people who didn't think it was that bad because people like me are going to have wanted to avoid it. Or, you know, you get teachers who might start the job thinking like, I'm going to do all the stuff that I wished my teachers had done to me, and then run up against the wall of the system, you know, capital S, capital T, and realize why their teachers were shit in the first place and end up reproducing the same thing. Or you have young teachers who come into the job very passionate about teaching, and then after a few years, you know, repeating the same curriculum over and over again, lose that passion and end up recreating the flaws in the system. Like, this is just a thing that happens. I don't know how to fix it. You know, you need government intervention, really. Like, there's no individual teacher that can fix the system. It needs to be a top-down government thing. Uh, and the people in government who are in charge of it are going to be, in large part, career politicians, in large part, people who went to private schools or Eton, you know, in the UK. They don't have experience with the mainstream schooling system. Uh, I'm actually interested. Who, who's the education secretary, yeah, secretary right now? Uh, the Right Honourable Gillian Keegan. Let's see. Secretary for State of Education. Gillian, Gillian Keegan. Let's see. Um, appointed Secretary of Education in 2022. She was previously Parliamentary Under Secretary of State Minister for Africa at the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. Uh, so, you know, really fuck all to do with understanding any of that shit. Let's go on their Wikipedia, on her Wikipedia page. Um... Uh, she went to a Catholic school. Okay, not Eton or anything. Seems like a not not fucking crazy fucking education background, but, you know, she excelled in school. You kind of have to. Uh, uh, but she is a conservative. So, you know, I think it's pretty clear that if you're voting to conserve the current state of the education system, you know, uh, fucking, it's impossible to do anything with, with the way government works. That's on purpose. And we're going to, keep torturing children to death or into submission or whatever for no real reason actually other than change is hard and slow and we may never and that's a pretty depressing thought
Well, that's kind of sad. Let's get back into normal shit. Wait, wait, what was I going to talk about? I was going to. I brought this up for some reason. I don't remember what it was. Uh, I hope you watch. I know it's not a good video, like my TF2 video or my Mario 64 video, but uh, it is actually a good video. I'm. Pro I, I think I did a good job of explaining myself, and I hope I convinced some people or introduced some people to some concepts they hadn't thought about before. Like I, I've thought about this a lot, and I think. Uh, you know, I think it's something important. And we allegedly live in a democracy. So maybe spreading... Like, I think uh, I think a lot of leftists, especially the sort of stupid ones, um, don't know enough about... They don't spend enough time thinking about education because um, there's a principle that a lot of these leftists abide by, um, particularly, com well, I guess both communists and anarchists, uh, when they're talking about their sort of utopian politics, like as in like what to do, what how would a utopian society look like, how to or or whatever, uh, and a, a a lot of their stuff relies on like oh well we can eliminate um let's say crime not after you know whatever crimes left over after we eliminate economic needs we can fix with better education and they'll just say better education without explaining what that means um or you know we can help prevent uh, the sort of competitive mindedness with better education. And it's like, well, well, you know, give me some more information than that. Like, and I don't think they can. I don't think they've thought about it at all. Uh, I think they just are like, well, capitalism indoctrinates children, so we should do it too. Uh, which I don't think is a very good idea. Uh, I just did that because it looks cool on the spectrogram on Audacity, the, the, the waveform. Go load up Audacity and do that. It looks sick. It doesn't look that cool. I don't know. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I just made the video because I wanted to respond to Osaka, really. And it seemed like a good way to do it. But uh, it's, then I, in doing so, I realized, hold on a minute. This is something that's important to me. And I, have, I don't talk about this enough. Uh, I didn't even talk about, like, democratizing schooling at all. Like, that was something that I was big into as a kid. Uh, I once tried to stage a walkout of my school. And I was the only one that walked out. <laughs> uh, yeah. I didn't even know what a walkout was. I, I, I just thought, like, well, if we all leave, they can't do anything about it. That was my that was my idea. But, of course, um, no one was willing to suffer the punishment aside from me. Uh, yeah. So, right now, speaking... Oh, yeah, I remember why I, load, why I started... I was going to say loaded this up as if I'm a fucking computer. I remember why I started talking about this. Um... So the thing, like, there's a, a a repeated vibe of of that video. I think is this idea that like you in school you learn to learn so that you continue being curious about the world and learning throughout your whole life. And this reminded me of something that I saw a while ago, um, where someone mentioned that like most people when they're adults just stop learning. And this kind of blew my mind until I thought about it more, and I was like, holy shit, like that's true. Like, like most people, once they settle into the career that they're in and they get to the sort of level in their career of competence of like a, you know, reasonable, reasonably competent person of average competence at their job or whatever, and they've, you know, left uni or school or whatever, they just sort of don't learn anything anymore. They just do their job and they already know how to do it and they maybe become a little better at it over time, but then they're, they're not, you know, doing that much learning really on the job. And that's most of their life. And they come home and they watch TV or they watch Netflix or, you know, do whatever people do. Go to the club, do whatever normies do <laughs> after work. God knows. Um, uh, you know, and they don't learn because they don't have time or any reason to learn. And they lose that faculty, which I think is part of why it's so frustrating to argue against these people or to try and convince them of any that, like, you, they, they've lost the capacity for evaluating knowledge <laughs> evaluating information they haven't had to do it since they were kids they lose the curiosity about the world and they just settle into a rote pattern of behavior and i think that is one of the saddest things possible and of course i'm not saying this is everybody there are lots of people who aren't like this who manage in spite of the drudgery of their lives to continue to stay curious about the world and learn into adulthood and beyond what's beyond adulthood i don't know i don't know why i said that <laughs> they're fucking ghosts going to the library <laughs> i don't know uh yeah there are people like that obviously and those are the good people those are the good people 
Um, but like I, I was thinking like, so right now, you know, not, I'm not saying I'm bragging or anything because I think there's probably lots of people in my audience who do similar things. Like right now I am watching MIT lecture courses on microeconomics because I've been curious about how it worked and struggling to find accessible information at the level I'm in, you know, that isn't just like either overly simplified for general consumption or overly complex for like specialists in the field. And I randomly remembered, oh yeah, MIT puts a bunch of their courses online on YouTube. I'll just watch an economics course on YouTube. Uh, And so that's what I'm doing. And I just realized like how many people are doing shit like this? I mean, these videos have millions of views. Well, almost the first, the first, the first lecture has a million views. It, it literally more than halves, uh, or the first, the first lecture in the series has, uh, uh, one and a half million. And the second lecture has 600,000. Uh, and I'm assuming it just goes down from there. Let's take a look. Let's take a look at the last lecture or the second to last, because there's definitely people who stick, skip to the end. The second to last lecture has t- 29,000. So clearly a lot of people fall off. Uh, but this isn't the first MIT lecture series I've watched. This is like the third MIT lecture series I will have watched. Um, like there's all these amazing resources on the internet and instead people are using the internet to do silly TikTok dances and shit. Like, bro, what's wrong with fucking normies? I'm telling you. Like, I I don't want to blame them because I know that it's it's the the system they were born into that's made them this way. It's the, the fucking education system that has taken away their joy of learning from them. And it's the system of wage slavery that has taken away their ability to do productive shit in their free time because they're so tired recovering from work or you know any of these things um or if i really wanted to be edgy and say something unpopular it's even the systems of uh, uh drugs and alcohol keeping them stupid because why bother to you know learn about the world when you can drink a six pack and watch the game right hey Getting a little bit edgy, getting a little bit, getting a little bit edgy out here. Um, but I don't think that's a major contributor. I think that's a symptom rather than a cause. But anyway, you know, I, it's hard to blame them. But at the same time, here I am. And I know lots of other people too, who are like this. Uh, maybe people just don't have the capacity to listen to dry lectures. I mean, Joe Rogan's super popular, right? And he has academics on who talk about their specialist subjects in accessible ways, right? Like I have like IOL friends who listen to, I have IOL friends who listen to Joe Rogan and it's like, wow, I listen to his quit. And I'm like, bro, that's not how you, like you're not really gonna learn anything of substance from that though. Like you realize that, (laughs) like you, you gotta go a bit deeper than Joe Rogan to actually learn anything of substance. And I'm not saying that watching the lecture course is a substitute for actually doing a course in economics. But it's got to be, you know, uh, the point of this is so that I can understand, so that I can have a basis of knowledge so that in the future I can read economics papers and understand them better and have discussions with people who know more than me about economics and they can teach me stuff. But I need to have the basis of knowledge first. And I think this is the most efficient way to get that basis of knowledge for the way my brain works and what's accessible to me for free on the internet, which is wonderful. Like, this is amazing that we have this resource and... It's shameful on everyone. I don't know. Fucking grow up, you know? Like, oh, motherfuckers. Not that anyone ever tells me to do this anymore, because I think they figured they figured out that I'm just not I'm just not going to. But motherfuckers tell me to get a job. It's like, bro, what do you do? You work, you come home, you watch fucking I don't know what's po- what's a popular show. N- when day when day you watch a when day show on Netflix, right? Like motherfucker, you know. It's not difficult. What I'm doing right now shouldn't, it's not a brag, you know? This isn't something that is like, oh, and I'm so special because I can sit down and watch a fucking economics course. Anyone can do that. There's definitely, I guarantee you, there's people listening to this right now who have done similar shit to this, right? Because you're all cool, interesting people who are definitely subscribed to the No Thank You channel. You know, you're out here teaching yourself skills and teaching yourself about the world and learning about yourself and others in the process, right? And other people sometimes do that. I know it's not impossible that people do that. Hey, 29, you know, maybe maybe, maybe most people who started the lecture course didn't finish it. But, you know, 20, what was it, 29,000? 29, 29,000 of them did finish the lecture course, right? Like, that. hey, that's some, that's, that's some small percentage of the population. 
And I mean, economics is kind of boring by design to keep it's designed like that by the man so that we don't learn about it, man, so that we can't get rich. <laughs> I, I, I'm joking, of course. Uh, also, I did some research about the lecturer who teaches this course. Weird guy. <laughs> Seems to have had a scandal associated with him, uh, which I think was kind of based, but a little weird, where he, uh, he, was, he was involved in some way with the creation of Obamacare and some other healthcare acts. Um, and he was caught on camera saying that, uh, like, the bill is written in a purposefully obtuse way to disguise the fact that it is taking money from the, quote, taking money from the healthy to give to the sick, um, which I think is fucking based, obviously. I wonder what this guy would think of Bataille. Like, that sounds like, like, something that Bataille would say, you know, or he would advocate for. Uh, I, I'm, I'm gonna guess this guy's never read Bataille, though, maybe a bit out there for him. He seems like a pretty normy economics guy, um, pretty mainstream, very, as mainstream as it gets, right? But he was involved in Obamacare and some sort of healthcare act in Vermont, which was trying to implement single payer health, single payer healthcare in Vermont, but ultimately fell through for various reasons that the Vermont government hasn't made super clear. They just say it didn't, it was too expensive. But anyway, um, you know, I just think it's weird that he had this controversy <laughs> where he was basically saying Americans are so stupid that they won't let this bill pass if they know that it's actually helping people, <laughs> which I think is fucking based and true. Uh, he's literally right. I, like, Americans are so indoctrinated by, like, that, they, that if they think that their money is going to go to help sick people, they won't let the bill pass. I think he's literally right about that. I mean, of course he is. He's, he, he's a fucking economics professor. He knows, he knows <laughs> how people work, uh, right, uh, on a macro scale. Like, he knows that people won't do, won't vote for that. Uh, I mean, yeah, he's literally right. You just don't say that in public. Uh, anyway, yeah, weird, cool, whatever. Terrible handwriting, um, but, you know, whatever. Um, easy to follow his lectures. I mean, e Econ 101, 101 is not difficult. Like, I'm, I'm three lectures in right now, and I have learned very little. Like, this is really refreshing, just super fucking basic supply-demand curve stuff indifference curves supply and demand curves um you know really fucking bait utility functions constrained choice and you you know the, the 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 uber basics that everyone sort of knows um but it's nice to go over this again and to to fill in gaps in my knowledge because there are you know going to be gaps when you learn these things informally um i'm excited i i scroll down at through the the names of the lectures and you get like all of these like the uh competition supplier demand welfare economics monopoly oligopoly and then this is what i'm i'm excited for is uh labor and capital i wonder is he going to be going over a little bit of marx here you're going to be going over a little bit of marx here that'll be interesting to hear about i'm excited to get to that lecture a uh, little bit of Marx, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I want to know. I'm, I'm curious. I want to know what he thinks. And he's also, he's very open. This guy, you know, he says in the first lecture, he was like, "Look, economics is, is, is kind of a right wing science. Like it, it broadly assumes that the market always knows what's right and that government interference just fucks things up. Uh, that, like that's just a fact. Um, but you know, this guy, he was involved in socializing healthcare partially so clearly he's not like a super right-wing guy um i don't know i thought it, i think it's is is bold to admit that um anyway i'm way too early in the lecture series to actually comment on it uh or actually say i've learned much about economics yet uh i just wanted to say that like it's really sad to think that all of this information is out there for free and uh only lazy stinky neats like me have the time to actually go through it and learn about it you know like fucking i'm not saying everyone should be doing economics courses because who fucking cares is boring um but like there's so much interesting shit out there and people are watching mr beast instead and it's not their fault uh you know except partially it is their fault but it's not entirely their fault uh and that's sad i think and it all sort of comes back to education and the way the education system destroys people's creativity and curiosity and it also comes down to market incentives, you know, what companies like YouTube are incentivized to recommend to people and how much free time people have and to, in order to do this sort of thing. I don't know. 
hey, there's always a possibility that I give up on the lecture series halfway through, in which case all of the stuff where I'm really trying to sound humble, but I'm secretly, you know, everyone knows I'm kind of bragging. Like, hey, look at me, I'm so smart. I'm watching fucking econ one-on-one lectures. <laughs> look, look at me, I'm so smart. Have you ever heard of fucking supply-demand curves? Bro, like this shit, like it. Bro, I, I didn't think you had, you know, like, uh, you you might not understand this high-minded economic theory, but I'll have you know, I once watched the MIT econ 101 lectures. <laughs> Yeah, I know how I sound, okay? I know it's really hard to not come off like this when I'm trying to make this argument that, like, it's sad that more people don't do this. Um, Not necessarily with this example in particular, but just in general. More people don't use the internet to learn uh, from all of the fucking amazing free resources that are available. Uh, Yeah, but it makes it hard. It's hard not to come across as, like, um, <laughs> sounding like I'm being like, and that's why I'm superior to everyone because I sat down and watched a fucking Econ 101, you know, uh, and I think it's sad that people aren't learning for their, uh, whole lives because I think they want to, like, maybe I'm making assumptions about human nature that aren't, uh, maybe backed up. I'm not backing up my assumptions about human nature with empirical data, but I do think just from my experience that, we humans have a desire to be curious about the world and to learn and i think that desire is being suppressed broadly and that's sad and something that should change let's talk about how japan fumbled the bag i think (coughs) sorry i think the the japanese bag fumble is one of the biggest in history because you go back a few decades and japan was the largest, the fastest growing economy in the world. You know, you go back a a good few, you know, 50, 100 years or whatever. It's not 100, but you go back, you know, a good few years. Japan was the fastest growing economy in the world. They had a massive economy. They were leaders in multiple industries, you know. And it wasn't just the post-war economic miracle. It was, um, well, it was that. But, you know, that was, it wasn't caused entirely by the, like, as the name suggested, it was caused sort of by the post-war-ness, which it was, and American influence. Um, but it was mainly the tech sector, you know, Japan was the large producer of economics, automobiles. I don't know why I call them automobiles, fucking cars. What am I, a fucking 19th century baron? <clears throat> you know, Japan in, was this highly advanced country with, uh, you know, uh, these megacorps and inspired the cyberpunk genre and you go there and it was like Taiwan is today, you know, uh, but it fumbled the goddamn back. And I think it's a good case study of, um, the fundamental economic failures of social conservatism. Um, you know, we think of conservatives as, when I say this, by the way, I, I need to be a little clearer about what I'm, how I'm using this word. I don't mean, you know, being against gay rights or anything like that, you know, I mean, having a general conservative culture that is, uh, um, like, skeptical of new, of change, skeptical, uh, skeptical, you know, clinging on to, well, this is the way things have always been done, slow to change, right? Japan was forced to change very rapidly after the war, uh, which drove their economy to the fucking moon. And they've been coasting off of that success ever since, and it is not working for them. Japan had the market lead in a way that basically no other country has had the market lead, except for maybe, I don't know, maybe China has, but, like, they, they had, they had the bag, and they fumbled the bag so incredibly hard. Like, Japan fell behind in semiconductor manufacture to the point where it's basically not competitive anymore they fell behind in electronics manufacture to the in general to the point where they're not really competitive anymore uh and right now they're falling behind in car manufacture uh japanese uh, car manufacturers like nissan and toyota and mitsubishi are um lagging behind their competitors in china india europe and the u.s uh, they will probably become a much more niche and smaller industry and possibly some of them will go out of business in the next 20, 30 years if they don't get their shit together and <clears throat> update their production processes to match the current industry standard. Because the problem is all of the stuff that conservatives love about Japan. Japan is touted as this sort of wonderland 
of conservative idealism, right? That like, you know, they have this rich tradition, they have a racially homogenous uh, makeup, you know, they, uh, they, they're very traditionalist and conservative in general in their culture. Um, lots of conservatives point to Japan as a success story. They have very low crime rates, you know, the, the, all of this sort of stuff. Um, but this is also all of the reasons why Japan's economy hasn't kept up with China's and Korea's uh, and Taiwan's. And, you know, uh, because they, and this is not my opinion, this is fact, uh, you know, Japan, they, they still use antiquated technologies like stamps uh, and... Um, uh, fax machines, like they still use fax machines, you know, as much as everyone thinks of Japan as this place of technological innovation, this is an outdated idea. Like it took Japan much longer than the rest of the world to catch on to smartphones and they eventually did. But Japan is the only country where like, uh, phys- well, actually it's starting to change now, It's but you know, uh, physical media is still a very big deal in Japan, streaming services and music streaming is still a, a growing burgeoning market in Japan. They're lagging behind the times. Everyone's like, well, we, we bought CDs for so long, we don't want to stop. We bought DVDs and Blu-rays for so long, we don't, you know, they could introduce Blu-rays, that was successful because it's close enough to what they already had. But a paradigm shift to streaming has taken a while to take hold in Japan, much longer than it's taken in the West and in even other parts of Asia. Uh, uh, you know the the and i this is the essentially if you want your economy to do well you have to if you want your economy to grow uh you have to increase the amount of stuff you make and slash or the value of the stuff you make and the only way to do that is to uh <clears throat> yes i'm watching still watching the econ 101 lectures um <laughs> the 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 only way to do that is to either increase the amount of capital you have through savings basically because most of the time capital is fairly fixed in terms of like land but you can you know savings to increase your capital uh and or to increase your productivity by via new innovations um and japan uh the refuses or is extremely slow to catch up to new innovations in the industry they had this exceptional circumstance where uh, you know, after the war, they were sort of forced to adopt these new innovations and uh, from an outside force, <clears throat> outside external factors, um, which sort of kick-started their economic boom. But they haven't kept that. That wasn't actually an intrinsic part of their uh, economic culture. That was an external. It turns out that was an external factor. And uh, in reality, Japan's economy is leveling back out to the level it really should have been at. Uh, which is not particularly great. Uh, uh, you know, there's the the socially conservative uh, culture, uh, for example, against immigration and against new technologies uh, is uh, leading to the economic downturn that we've seen over the past, you know, decades with Japan. It's a slow and gradual process, but if you can't increase the amount of, uh, if you can't increase your productivity, uh, you're going to be outcompeted in the market. And I think a reasonable government would step in at this point and force companies to i i know this you know you you might say this is a bad idea right because the idea should be that market forces ought to incentivize companies to uh keep up with progress and innovations um but once you lag behind a certain amount right once once you're far enough behind uh your competitors they can afford to buy up the top talent and the newest most expensive innovative capital machines and so on right and you can't afford that because you've lagged behind in the market and you are just fucked um then this is where the government should step in in my opinion and basically forcibly drag these companies kicking and screaming into current year uh despite their protests and they'll be satiated at the end of the day by the money that comes rolling in uh but they won't do this they won't do this Uh, i mean maybe they will at some point in the future but right now they won't do this uh because their government is corrupt and their culture is uh, makes it very hard to change the way things are being done, to question authority, uh, to disrupt markets, etc. Uh, the you, you know, and I'm I'm not someone who's very in favor of the like hyper individualist American t- uh, Silicon Valley culture, 
but it's fucking better than the hyper collectivist Japanese culture. You know, you can at least have these market disruptors, at least partially that used to exist for the brief window that they well, they do still exist in Silicon Valley culture where people who the the sort of small man, small guy startup can challenge the traditional way of doing things uh, and then get bought up or grow themselves. Whereas in Japan, if some startup challenges the traditional way of doing things, it'll be widely ignored by the large companies. You know, unlike, let's say, Facebook or Google or Apple, which shoves massive amounts of money into startups of questionable veracity in the hopes that one of them might produce some innovation that can increase the value of their product, which seems to be fucking working for them, doesn't it? Because they're all the most valuable companies in the world. Uh... You know, Japanese companies do the opposite. They they don't pump any money into this sort of R&D sector and these startups uh, because, you know, it's very risky. You're likely to lose a lot of money before you make any money. Um, and, well, this is the way things have always been. been. And, you know, if there's, uh, it's embarrassing to admit that you could be doing things better if you're a top guy, right? You don't want to admit that you could be doing things better. And if you... Uh, you know, let's say there's some head of some department and you say they could be doing things better, that guy loses face because it's like, well, you're now out of date, right? You're now behind the times. And so culturally, this stuff is not as accepted as it, you know, is in other places. And this is not unprecedented because this is how China grew their economy. The government dragged their economy kicking and screaming, you know, and forces them to do this. They have the they they did have the same sort of culture as Japan, uh, and the, the government overstepped. I but I mean it worked for them, right? Like the the government just stepped in and was like, no 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 no, you you got to fucking do it our way, or you're not doing it anyway. Uh, <clears throat> and Japan's government should be doing the same thing, but they're not doing the same thing. The Korea's government, you know, Korea they have they're basically just America two point uh, so you know they have the same they have the 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 same laissez-faire economic policies as America does even more laissez-faire in a lot of cases um, and even you know they can't keep up with China's uh, well actually maybe they are it's hard to know because China doesn't they're not super open about how their numbers are working right now seems like they might be in a bit of an economic downturn um, we'll have to see how that pans out but uh, you know I I don't think. I think it's clear that this is like a situation where behavioral economics plays a large role, where even though the market should be incentivizing these companies to drop their old ways and catch up with innovations and hire people fresh out of university and, you know, pump money into startups in the hopes of, uh, you know, one of them landing on some sort of increase in productivity, uh, they're not doing it, despite the fact that the market is telling them they should be doing it. Uh, and that's where... The government should step in. That's the that's the whole thesis of behavioral economics, right? Like that's 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 where the government should step in and say and nudge people in the right direction in order to better function under a market economy. But uh, they're not doing it because they're under the same social uh, pressures. <clears throat> Japan fumbled the goddamn bag. They're fucked now. Like it's almost too late to fix for them. Like they the 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 whole aging population thing. I, how I'm, my question is how bad does it have to get for in Japan for them to start fixing their shit? That's my question. Like how bad will Japan let things get? Uh, I mean, right now they have a pretty you know they may be falling behind in other industries, but their media industry is doing better than ever. Um, you know, Japanese dramas and anime and movies are still uh, very successful in the West and making a bunch of money. The anime industry, you know, rather than consolidating, is ever splintering into smaller and smaller more you know studios and yeah i don't know the anime industry isn't actually representative of japan's wider economy though uh it's kind of a niche of a niche of a niche and i don't think that'll die anytime soon but it's it's a little precarious it's probably more precarious than people think it is i don't know it's wild to me that japan let this bag just fall out of their hands they had the bag they were holding on to the bag they had the fucking this enormous market lead in all of you know in this entire sector they dominated and they fumbled. Like, how do you fumble that badly? It's insane. It's actually insane. You know, I'm obviously giving an oversimplified explanation because I'm 
not a fucking expert in this field, so I only understand the simplified explanation. Uh, but that seems to be the general consensus. What I'm saying right now might sound, you know, maybe you're saying I'm oversimplifying and uh, making some sort of racial stereotype out of Japanese culture. But this seems to be the consensus among Japanese economic anal analysts and Western analysts studying Japan. Like, I've seen multiple people who are much smarter than me make similar conclusions in various articles and blog posts I've read over the years, um, both Japanese and Western, uh, Westerners who've worked in Japan and so on. You know, this is a real phenomenon. I'm not just making this up in order to spin a narrative. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so I don't really know what's... I don't know. I, I mean, unless they... Unless they have a, a... I mean, basically Japan's fucked unless they get a, a big spanking brand new um, progressive government in. And the problem with an aging population is that makes it really hard to do. Because the people who vote for progressive governments are young people. And Japan doesn't have enough of them. Uh, and the only way for them to get more, realistically, is to open up their borders to immigration. And the conservatives know that if they do that, they'll be voted out of office. And so they won't do that, even though it's objectively damaging the economy. Uh, and so they're in this fucking death spiral and no one's going to do anything about it. Not that I care. <laughs> They'll still be making anime. Uh, so, you know, that's all I care about Japan for. I, I don't know. It's just weird. It's just a weird fumble. That's all I'm saying. I, that was a joke, by the way. Um, I hope Japan's standard of living remains high. Although, you know, whether it is high right now is questionable, given the rates of mental health problems and suicide and so on. Although, not as bad as Korea. Um, what was I saying? Yeah, I don't know what's going to happen. But it's, it, it, it's just a... Uh, a fascinating example of a bag fumble that I, I uh, like shouldn't happen according to all of the Econ 101 stuff I'm learning, right? Like according to this guy, according to the markets, this should not happen. If you have you, that, you know, like this should not happen, but it is, it did. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? I don't know. I find it interesting. You know that I do be deleting segments of these videos when I say shit that's a little too edgy. Look, I'm wait. I can't, I gotta drip feed you. Okay, because the people who know already know. It's only the people who aren't gonna like it that don't know. So I won't say it. They won't, they don't know, can't hurt them, right? And therefore, they can't hurt me. So we just won't talk about any of that. I just, I go on a rant. I think about it afterwards and I'm like, you know what? Does it improve my life if I put this out here? No. You know what? Maybe uh, you don't have to hear my opinion on those issues. Uh, so... There you go. Even though I know I'm objectively right. Like, statistically, provably, objectively, as scientifically correct as you can possibly be, we won't get into it. By the way, just because I mentioned statistics, no, not about race. Nothing to do with race. Just putting it out there. Nothing to do with race. Actually, let's talk about that for a second. Because uh, I thought about this. Um, you know all these people, they're like, look at the statistics, you see... That it's all black people that do all the crime, right? Then they never mention, you know who else is statistically way more likely to do violent crime? Men. It's all men. They don't talk about that. They don't say we need to do something about men in this country. They don't, they don't want to address the patriarchy. You know, you know, they don't want to do that. They're like, it's all the black people's fault. Okay, why is it not why? But if you actually look statistically, the difference between men and women is much bigger than the difference between blacks and whites in terms of violent crime. So why don't you want to address that? fucking retards oh but suddenly when it comes to that it's like oh that's powerful violent masculinity you know we we love being warriors and shit it's like hold on a minute so it's good when white people do it but bad when black people do it don't make no sense almost like you're racist or something almost a little bit like you might be racist about that particular issue strange very strange and speaking of this what i actually wanted to record to talk about i keep hearing about the romani people you know the, like, Europeans hate the Romani people. And it's like, I've even heard people in my real life be racist against the Romani, you know? My mom was very fucking racist against the Romani. Like, I've heard, I've heard people in the older generation saying this shit. And I've seen people online of my generation talking shit. It's like, oh, what the fuck did they ever do to you, man? They don't do nothing. I, I don't know if I've ever, I don't know if I've ever met. I, I'm, I apologize for my ignorance, because I, I don't know that I've ever met a Romani person. Um, maybe I have and just didn't know. Uh, 
you know, but I, I don't understand the goddamn problem. <laughs> what, what, what did they do to, what did they do to deserve all the hate? I've seen, uh, I remember growing up, I, I actually saw, like, hit pieces in the news, like, racist, like, blatant racist hit pieces against, uh, I'm not, I know it's a slur, you're not supposed to, to say that, but they used a particular slur against these people, um, I was like, hold on a goddamn second, I didn't know it was a slur, obviously, because it's just, that's just what they were called for me growing up. I don't understand it at all. <laughs> like, I don't. And Americans, they go on about this. They're like, uh, Europeans are so racist against the Romani, and I. And then I see them doing it, but it's like I've never met anyone who. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I have. It's weird because I know it. It's one of these things where I know it exists, but I've never come in contact with it. Like I'm vaguely aware that there's this racism. I, I've seen it in the media, and I've heard my mom occasionally talking about it, and I've heard some other you know, people older than me, uh, talking about it, uh, but I've never, like, heard, do you know what I mean? Maybe this isn't making any sense. It's like, I've only ever heard about this stuff secondhand, and I know it exists, right, because I've sort of seen it firsthand, but then, like, I don't know, it's a weird situation. It's a weird situation. It's like, if you think Europeans are, are, are less racist than Americans, just ask them about their opinions on the Romani people, um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know, but I don't know, man. No one I, I have ever been friends with has ever held any particularly strong opinions one way or the other about those those uh, folks. You know, if you go to the really posh parts of Britain, they'd be really racist against the Irish. They'd be so racist against the Irish. And it's like, that doesn't exist outside of, like, the, the super upper classes. It's very strange. It's a very strange country we have going on here. Uh... Yeah, I don't know what's going on with that. Um, but maybe it's more of a big deal in other parts of Europe. That's my That's been my theory, right? Is that, like, maybe there's some racism against the Romani in Britain, but it's, like, mainly localized in other parts of Europe. Uh, but I don't know. Like, yeah, I don't <laughs> This is a silly segment where I'm just sort of, like, I'm vaguely aware that racism exists. Uh, I don't know. I just I just hear about it a lot. Like, from the modern, like hey, we shouldn't be doing this side. And I'm like, yeah, we shouldn't be doing that. But also, who's doing, who's, who's we? Who's, the, who's doing it? I don't know. I don't know who's doing it. I definitely haven't. I will tell you, at least in the last 10 years, no one has, I've never heard anything. It, it was only when I was a kid that I ever heard, like saw there's some hit piece articles, racist articles, or heard my mom talking badly or her friends talking badly about this sort of thing. But, you know, my mom would talk negatively about Muslims way more often, uh, which was weird. Because I like this is the thing about this sort of like middle class racism is that it's uncouth to actually be racist because they're very worried about appearances, right? So it's uncouth to actually be racist. Like they know that like joining the EDL, you know, being race really violently racist, they associate it with the lower class, right? And so they don't want to do that. But then they'll say the most fucked up shit. <laughs> I don't know, man. It's weird. Ah. <sighs> But then you get the other situation, like, you want to know one of the weirdest fucking things that I, I, the weirdest thing that I didn't understand was weird at the time, but now looking back on it, I'm like, how the, how in the goddamn fuck does that work? I had a friend whose parents were pretty rich, who was a white South African, but whose parents were Marxists. What's going on there? What exactly is going on there? White South African rich, you know, not like, uh, you know, you hear about these sort of like, normal average white South African farmers that might exist. I don't know that much about this, so I'm not going to try and speak on this, the whole dynamics of that, because I, I don't understand it. I haven't done enough research. Um, but like, we're talking rich white South Africans living in London who are communists. The, the first communists I ever knew in real life were this kid's parents. What's going on there? That's a weird, that's a weird dynamic, right? Something weird is happening there. What's going on there? I don't know. I don't understand that. What, what is that? What does it mean? I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't know. One time I went to a convention, uh, it was a Comic Con, but it had not that much to do with Comic Con, it was just a general nerd thing in the sort of nerd chic boom. When I was maybe 13, 14, 15, I actually went a couple of different times. And one time I went there and I saw some of the YouTubers I liked in the YouTube section. And in the YouTube section, there were some YouTubers that I liked. And one of them was called Thomas Tomscar Ridgewell. And I stood in line to meet him. 
and I did a magic trick for him because at the time I was into doing magic tricks and I did the magic trick and then when I did the trick he said oh you bastard and laugh and that was funny and then I went over and there was another guy and his name is Bing now Bing for some Bing is really good I like Bing his name is Christopher Bingham let me look up his channel and see what he's up to. Oh, it's just going to show me the goddamn AI stuff. Fuck. Uh, Christopher Bingham. Wait, what happened to this guy? What the hell happened to this guy? I looked up his name and it's, it, it auto... Oh, no. Oh, no. This is a, this is a fucking classic fucking experience. When you go look up... Hey, oh, no. You've just seen this in real time. When you look up an old British YouTuber you lose to look and you search their name and it auto-completes allegations at the end. Oh no! Oh no! It <laughs> when, you go, when you go to look up an old British YouTuber and it auto-completes to fucking allegations. Oh no. What are the allegations? What are the allegations? What are they? Hold on, hold on. Christopher Bingham allegations uh what is this is this just a link to it oh it's a post that's been deleted okay apparently the, i don't know it seems like nonsense or it, maybe it, maybe it's not nonsense i actually have no idea it seems complicated and i don't want to spend a while digging into this anyway i liked bing a lot at the time bing was involved in the tom scar universe they went to uni together and this was back in the old school Tom Scar, Ed's World, and, like, there was, there was Tom Scar, there was Ed's World, and then there was Bing, and he was kind of doing his own thing, and him and Tom Scar, uh, Tom Scar was dating his sister, and then they had some sort of falling out, which they then made a video about, like, a billion years later, which I thought was actually really interesting. They made a video about it where they met up for the first time in, like, years, in 2019, and that was... A kind of a neat thing to see but anyway bing was never as popular as the other ones but somehow he was at this convention and so he had no one in his line and i was very excited to meet him and that was nice and those are some of the times when i met youtubers i also met some of the yogscast guys at a convention like that um i didn't it was kind of a weird situation so they the yogscast guys didn't seem to be doing an official meet and greet but there was just a merch stand, or maybe I just came at a bad time. I don't really know what was going on. I was very young. I didn't really know. Yeah. But all I remember was that I went at this. There was a, a Yogg's Cast like, booth. And at the Yogg's Cast booth, they were selling merch. And there was like a bunch of people. And Simon from the Yogg's Cast was also working at behind the booth selling merch, I guess. Was that what happened? Maybe I'm misremembering this. I feel like I remember seeing them from a distance and or something. I don't know. I feel like Yogg's Cast guys were there. That's all I remember. I don't know what happened with that. And someone, there was someone else, maybe? Another YouTuber? I don't know. I, what's the point of this story? There's no point to this story. I was a massive Edsworld fan back in the day. Uh, and a massive Tom Scar fan back in the day. And Tom Scar, I feel like, I don't know. I don't want to say he fell off. I think I just kind of outgrew his content. Uh... Man, he's a weird guy, but seems fine, seems cool. Nothing, not not in a bad way. He's just a weird guy. He seems to have gotten over his weirdness. But man, if you watch, if you watch that, that fucking, um, Tom Scar Bing thing, he was, he was, he, he, he yeah. Anyway, old school British YouTube, YouTube vlogger moment. There were, there were these other ones as well. Like there was, I used to be into these guys, right? Like the, the, there was uh, the emo ones. I was obviously Dan and Phil. That was a fun time. I don't know. You know, I, I randomly stumbled across a Dan and Phil video earlier today because... Uh, wait, why was... Why did, what was it? Hold on a second. Oh, yeah. Uh, I watched a video by Knowledge Husk, who I still have the son uh, faster time in Sonic R than him, just to put it out there. Uh, waiting for him to respond to that. Uh, PB... And, or whatever the fuck, anyway, uh, yeah, so the Knowledge Husk video about the Nintendo Switch, which was a good video, and I was watching it with Doltsmite, and I said to Doltsmite, uh, I mentioned something about the Switch cartridges 
you know, how they taste bad if you lick them. And Dotsmite hadn't heard about this, so I went and looked up licking Switch cartridges, and the top result was a Dan and Phil video of them doing that. So that's when I watched it. And then I watched it and I was like, oh, they're both gay now, right? Th that happened. That was interesting. Good for them. Uh, but yeah, I don't. I was into Dan and Phil, obviously, when I was a cringe emo teenager in the UK because every fucking cringe emo teenager in the UK was into Dan and Phil. <laughs> I don't know why. They weren't very good, to be honest with you. Um, yeah. But they weren't particularly bad compared to some of, like... Like, the other guy that I was into was a guy called V1i. And now this guy's fucking cringe. There was one called V1i, and there was another one. I think his name was Alex something. Fuck. Let me look up, uh, like, British emo vloggers. No, I did not mean British female vloggers. Uh, I don't... Oh, I know this guy. Why is... I don't... I don't 2010s British vloggers. Let me look. 2010s British vloggers. What the hell? Uh, I don't recognize it. I recognize this guy. I, who's that? I, um, ch -ch -ch. Only young millennials will remember these 2010s YouTubers from BuzzFeed. That's Amazing Phil. That's Link from Rhett and Link. That's Dan. That's Niga Higa. That's the girl who did the cinnamon challenge. That's the American guy who lives in the UK, and I've just seen, like, one of his videos where he talks about being an American living in the UK, that's all I know about him. And then, yeah, okay, what am I doing right now? What, what is this? This isn't content. <laughs> what am I doing right now? Alex Day. Alex Day is the guy I was thinking of. Um, yes. Because it's very fucking funny, right? Wait, no, this isn't the right Alex Day YouTube channel. This is a... I don't think so. I think he must have deleted his channel. Oh, no, it still exists. I guess he just deleted all of his old videos and just posts music now. Well, anyway, that fucking guy. What a weird guy. Okay, so here's the thing. This, there was two guys. Oh, and Charlie is so cool, like. Bro, that fucking guy. What was up with that guy? What happened to him? What the fuck happened to this guy? We're trans now? What? What the hell? That was unexpected. I guess that makes sense. What the hell? I mean, good for them, I suppose. Unexpected. Anyway, sorry, kind of... So there were those guys, and now they're all gay or trans or whatever, and also, the, so half of them are that. And the other half disappeared off the internet because they got accused of, like, sexual misconduct with minors. It's such a weird situation. <laughs> so, like, the the, the v one I guy, right, like, he, like, fucked an underage girl and then disappeared for a while and came back as, like, the most stereotypical, uh, like, smokes, meat, smokes weed once, uh, you know, fucking hippie uh, poser guy. Which was incredibly cringe. Just one of the world's most cringe people. Um, yeah. Uh, what a, what a weird fucking guy. Uh, apparently he's still making YouTube videos. Uh, don't know, don't know what that's, don't know what that's about, but, uh, what the, did he make a video called The Truth About George Floyd Exposed and then the thumbnail? What the fuck is this? He made a, this v one eye guy made a video called the truth about george floyd dot 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 brackets exposed all caps and then it says the thumbnail is a big red arrow pointing to a screen cap of the guy kneeling on george floyd and it says staged question mark what the hell is that you can't do that <laughs> that's what the fuck is that oh oh my god what the hell what happened man what happened to all these fucking people? Oh, God. <sighs> yeah, and so then there's the other funny story, which is Alex Day also had sex with a minor. <laughs> How hard... The 2010's British YouTuber challenge don't uh, fuck children. Uh, impossible edition. Uh, th th so he fucked a kid or something and then disappeared and came back not as a hippie, but as a Buddhist. <laughs> <laughs> he like shaved his head. He went full Buddhist. 
and like i don't know man i don't know what happened to that guy uh but that was fucking weird. He he disappeared and came back as a Buddhist. The V1 I g- guy disappeared and came back as a hippie. The rest of them, I guess, just disappeared for good. And the ones that didn't fuck kids, which is a alarmingly small minority, all turned out to be gay or trans. That's just fucking weird. What's going on with the What was happening in this situation? I guess Tomska isn't. None of that happened to Tomska. Like, Tomska seems to be fu- I mean, he did some weird shit. But not like that. Not like sex crimes weird, you know. Uh, I guess, I guess, but that's not, he's not a vlogger in the same way as those. What the hell is happening here, man? What the fuck went down? What the fuck went down with this? You know what I blame? I blame not just, I mean, obviously I blame the fucking YouTubers for being idiots. But broader than that, the whole culture... <clears throat> the whole, like, emo culture around that time was just incredibly toxic. Like, it wasn't just those YouTubers that were messing around with with people who, girls who were way too young. So many fucking people I knew were doing that shit. And, like, there was nothing you could do. Like, what am I supposed to do? Like, I, I knew a guy who f- fucking was, like, 16 and uh, had sex with a, a underage girl. And, like, not like, oh, he's 16, she's, like... 15 and like gonna turn 16 in like two days i'm not talking like this guy he he i didn't know him that closely but i, I was aware of his uh, like i i hung out he was like a along the edges of the group but he was like 16 and he fucked a 13 year old like bro you don't that's fu- that's pretty fucking bad <laughs> don't you that's not uh that's pretty bad don't do that and nothing ever happened to him i don't think I, uh, I think he's probably still around god knows but like that wasn't that like Stuff like that was just happening. It was just a fucked up time and place to be around, man. Everyone was fucked. All of the guys were super predatory. It was just, it was awful. I'm glad that I was never involved in any of that stuff too deeply. And I didn't end up hanging out with those fucking retards. I got out of there as soon as I could. I never liked it, the whole emo stuff. Like, I fucking was constantly complaining about emos, even though I was an emo. Whereas the other, like, the other ones, you know, the, the other emo kids, they were like, I'm depressed, but, like, being emo means I'm, like, part of a community, and it, like, gives me, give me something to cling on to. Whereas for me, it was like, I'm depressed, and look at all the fucking retards I have to hang out with just because I want to be depressed and an emo. It's like, get me out of here. These guys are fucking idiots. What am I doing here? And then eventually, I did get out of there, thank God. Uh, but yeah, I, I, man, this whole, that whole situation was just so fucked. Uh, yeah. I don't know, man. So what I'm saying is it wasn't, it wasn't just these, these, I mean, these YouTubers obviously were using their, abusing their power, not all of them, but the the bad ones that did fucked up shit, but they were just the peak of the iceberg of like weird, bad sex stuff happening in this community, in my opinion, you know, obviously I don't know the, necessarily the broader happenings beyond the groups that I was sort of tangent to. But it seemed to be a pattern, is all I'm saying. It wasn't good. I'm glad emo culture kind of died out. But now you got Twitch streamers doing similar shit, I guess, right? Like, Twitch, I guess they're not, there's no, there's, I think there was a couple of underage involved Twitch streamers. I don't know that much about them. I don't know, when all men just stop being creepy? God, it's so weird. I don't know. This kind of ended up being on a dark note. <laughs> I didn't mean to get serious. I was just making jokes about when you when you type in th- th- or whatever. But uh, why was I talking about this? I don't know. I right, so that last segment was kind of weird, <laughs> and now another weird fucking segment because I don't know what I'm gonna talk about. I just wanted to. I just want to gush about something I think is cool. Uh, like five, four, five years ago, I found a video of a guy going down a beach. I guess in LA. I'm assuming I don't I I'm I'm not a uh, fucking I'm not Rainbolt right I don't I don't know I don't know I can't judge where it is in the U S just from seeing a video but going down a beach in what I assume is L A uh with a with a little Bluetooth speaker spitting random freestyles of random people and the guy's name is Harry Mack I saw this video and I was like whoa this guy's fucking insane but you know at the same time. He used a lot of filler words, right? Like, he would often say his own name. Like, like he would always use his own name as a filler word. And the, the flow is very, uh, you know, but it's freestyle. So you can expect, of course, a freestyle is not going to be as planned and in-depth in 
as a written rap or whatever, right? So, like, to me, I was like, this is the most insane freestyle I've ever heard. Because there's a lot of times when, you know, I, I've, I've seen, like, rap battles and shit. I, you know, when I was a, a kid or, like, a preteen, early teen, I was watched a lot of freestyle rap battles on YouTube. Uh, especially, like, the UK ones, which I guess isn't really something that's known outside of the UK, but, but like, UK rap battle stuff, just because I thought it was cool at that age, which is probably pretty standard. Um, but the thing is, a lot of those are, like, they're very short. Like, they're often, like, little rhyming couplets, right? Like, you, you spit some bar, and then you spit one punchline, and then the crowd goes wild, like, and then that's kind of it. It's not, like, a whole song, right? It's normally, like, little couplets with like an insult and also they de- everyone pre-writes some shit right like it's a mixture of pre-written shit and freestyled shit like that's kind of how it's supposed to go like you're supposed to you know everyone's like supposed to freestyle everything but everyone knows that you don't freestyle everything but you do freestyle some of it it's like a lot of this freestyle stuff is just impossible to know what's actually pre-written and what's not but this harry mack guy like, he raps about whatever people tell him to rap about. Like, there's, he's 100% doing it off top, right? So I thought that was pretty insane and sort of went on with my life. And then every few years, another Harry Mack video comes up in my feed. And I'm like, and I just see this guy. You should go check him out right now. Like, he has improved. Like, he was already probably the best freestyle rapper I'd ever seen a few years ago. And then, you know, I watch him again and it's like, oh, damn, he's like even better now. But now I go back and watch his videos, like his new recent videos, and no filler words. Insane flows. Like, he's so fucking quick with it. This guy is so insane. Like, he's probably one of the most, like, I know this is weird to say, because he's not, like, among the artistic greats. But in terms of, like, the craft, the pure technical skill of freestyling, I think he might be legitimately the best of all time. Like, he, it, it's actions. I really recommend you go look at this guy's stuff. Like, it, it might not be the most musically inventive stuff you've ever heard, but just as, like, a talent, as, like, a from a perspective of technical skill, you know? And, I mean, a lot of the stuff is catchy as fuck, and he's got insane flows. Like, he has very inventive flows and, and like, syncopations and rhythm and uh, internal rhymes. Yeah, that's right. This guy's fucking freestyling internal rhymes and alliterations and, and and like you know this guy's insane uh yeah i don't i don't know what what i wanted to say about that other than this guy's fucking insane i've tried freestyle you know there was a while when i was smoking a lot of weed i used to freestyle all the time because it's fun to do while high and i got kind i didn't get good at it but i got semi-consistent at it where it's like i could actually freestyle even though the bars wouldn't make any like sense you know I mean, they'd make a little bit of sense, but, like, they would mostly be funny, not just not good. But, yeah, this Harry Mack guy, he's fucking insane, man. You've got to check him out. So there's this JXE video. Now, I like JXE as a YouTuber. Uh, I like their Doctor Who video a lot. Uh, I just liked all their videos. Well, most of them. I think uh, the sort of bread and butter of their channel is these, like, uh, reaction videos to the sort of content mill five minute crafts type stuff or not really reaction but sort of parody or not not parodies just sort of pointing out the absurdity of them i guess i don't know what to call it but that stuff's not super appealing to me but i like their video essay uh however um they made a video and i think it's a good video like it's a well put together well made video uh <clears throat> which is about um twitch reaction content and in particular uh hassan so uh hassan reacted on stream to one of JXE's videos um, and, you know, didn't provide very much reaction. For example, uh, the first, like, three and a half minutes of the video was literally Hassan's chair in the bottom corner where, uh, you know, he was off getting some food, just playing the video. And, uh, you know, he didn't really comment very much and his commentary wasn't particularly insightful. Now, I don't want to i'm basically here to defend to do a lukewarm defense of of lazy reaction content stream streamers a little bit but i don't want to defend hassan because i don't like hassan i don't want to defend him uh it's i'm not yeah so i'm just going to use xqc as an example instead because i actually watch his reaction videos or whatever i don't i don't want to defend hassan here so i think there's a bit of a distinction to be made 
uh, the distinction is when someone says that sort of reaction content is bad, they could mean one of two things. Normally, they mean a combination of both things, uh, which is that it's bad content, as in like it's unentertaining, bad art. And then secondly, that it's morally wrong because it's stealing. Um, now, <clears throat> sometimes they even make the argument that it's legally wrong. I'm not sure about that. It depends, obviously, how the video is licensed. Uh, all of my videos are licensed under Creative Commons Attribution Sarah like So, you know, from a legal standpoint, well, you guys all know what Creative Commons means. Uh, but I want to talk about the distinction between the bad, as in it's unentertaining, it's, it's not very good art, <clears throat> and bad as in morally bad. Because I think if you're making the first argument that watching Hassan's chair react to a video is not very good content. I think you have some validity, but then there's another aspect to it too, which I'll get into. <clears throat> I guess I'll get into it right now, actually, which is that you have to understand that uh, a medium like Twitch is not as simple as uh, a medium like cinema in the, uh, in the, in the, uh, in the sense that with cinema, there's a much clearer delineation or at least the the illusion of the delineation is much stronger between audience and work text between audience and text right like you can very there's no interaction going on there whereas with twitch there's a uh it's becomes impossible to separate the audience from the text even you know in any really real way and i think this is something that jxe completely misses that even if oh shit did i just get something in my eye that's not good uh, even if Hassan's chair isn't doing much to entertain you while watching a video on a stream, uh, Hassan's chat is. Watching something together with a whole bunch of other people is inherently a different experience than watching it alone on the original YouTube channel. I know this because uh, there are there's a, uh, a, a website called Sushi Chan, which I used to go on a lot more than I do now. It's a, an image board uh, focused around sort of comfy vibes, uh, supposed to emulate the vibes of being in a sushi, um, you know, sushi bar, sushi restaurant, like chill, everyone's sort of hanging out, unlike 4chan, which is like, you know, all about being macho and aggressive and sort of an, an anti, like, uh, the, the, the opposite, or it's, you know, it shows the diversity of image words as a, uh, forum, which I think is very cool. But I, I like Sushi Chan. I don't use it that much these days, but I used to be way more into it than I am now. And back then, um, when I was way more into Sushi Chan, uh, and actually they still do it to this day, which is they have these anime watch-along stream things, right? Where you all get along onto this website called SciTube, and you, they, you know, a bunch of people watch anime together. Uh, and that is a fundamentally different experience than watching that same anime alone. Like, uh, I've rewatched shows that I've already seen, along with Sushi Chan guys. I'm kind of a lurker, you know, I don't really post in the chat. But just having the chat next to the anime, right, changes the whole vibe. I think that's something that JXE kind of missed out. It's like, even if, you know, XQC is just eating food and letting the video play. The very fact that, you know, and not adding commentary. The very fact that they, you're in the context of a group watch with a bunch of people of assumedly, you know, similar tastes and interests as you, since you're both watching the same streamer, some, within, a, within a community of some kind, uh, is valuable in some way. Uh, okay, so that's the first thing I wanted to get out there. Uh, the second thing, as for it being, uh, is it, it, kind of a minor critique. Uh, one of the things that JXE brings up is that, uh, is a counter to a particular argument, a counter-counter argument. So if you say, like, you know, this is bad content in some, you know, in either quality or morality. Someone might respond, well, you know, XQC streams 16 hours a day. He has to go to the toilet. He has to eat, right? And he has to fill that dead air with something, um, you know, so it's not, you know, he kind of has to do this. This is like the only option available to him. To which JX, he replies, um, well, you know, he chose to stream that long, right? N no one's forcing him to do that. Uh, you know, you could stream for four hours, take a break, pause, you know, stop the stream. And there are streamers who do this. You know, Simple Flips doesn't stream for a ridiculously long time. Uh, Northern Lion doesn't stream for a ridiculously long time. And, you know, they don't really do reaction content. Uh, I think that's a valid, like, I don't think that's completely invalid. 
Uh, but I think there's a couple of things that JXE misses out on here, which is the first thing is contracts. So the biggest streamers tend to have contracts with Twitch, uh, and those contracts stipulate that you have to stream a certain number of hours. And um, so sometimes, uh, no, you didn't choose to stream for 16 hours. Twitch told you to stream for 16 hours. Uh, like, you have to get this many contract, this many hours in per month, and, you know, maybe you spent part of the part of your time doing some other shit that you didn't have any control over and it's now like okay well i have to stream for a really long time each day in order to hit the number of hours so i don't break my contact with twitch that's definitely a real thing uh as for what the actual content of those contracts is how many hours you have to stream we don't know they don't make them public uh so it's definitely a possibility though the second thing is, um, it's hard for me to blame individual streamers for this, because in reality, this is a structural problem with Twitch as a website, that Twitch doesn't have an algorithm or some other way to find new streamers. The only way you do it is you stream in a particular category, and that category is sorted from most viewed to least viewed. The only thing you have control over is the title of the stream, the category you're streaming in, like what game you're streaming in. But in terms of like discoverability, Twitch orders you, you know, in your category from most viewed to least viewed, and that's it. The only other way to find streamers is like the cup, like the, the four or five streams that are highlighted at the top of the Twitch homepage, which no one watches anyway. And that seems to just be randomly decided by Twitch staff or something like that, but it doesn't, you know, and that will help with discoverability, but it's not a lot, you can't like do that on purpose, right? Um, so, you know, the only way to get discovered is to be the most viewed or one of the most viewed streams in your category. Because people will go to Twitch and they'll be like, I want to watch a Valorant stream. And they'll click on the Valorant category and then most likely will not scroll down and down and down. They will think, well, a bunch of people are already watching this guy, so blah, 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 right. Which means that the most value you can get out of your stream happens the, the more viewers you have, right? Which incentivizes... Um, streaming for longer and longer periods of time, right? Because, like, let's say you start streaming as a big streamer. You get 1,000 viewers, you get 5,000 viewers, you know, whatever. You get 10,000 viewers, you get 20,000 viewers. And then it's like, okay, once you've got that, like, your normal max viewer stat, which takes hours to achieve, right, for more and more people to join the stream, now your stream has value. Before then, you were basically just streaming for free. <laughs> well, not really, but you weren't making, like... The, that's not the time when you make the majority of your money as a streamer. The, you, once you hit your peak viewership, you're then incentive. If you stop streaming then, the opportunity cost, right, you're throwing away money. That's, you have to stream for a long time in order to even hit the point where you're now at the top of the, the, um, the category list, right? Uh, and then once you're there, you know, now it's like, if I stop streaming now, I'm just throwing it away. So you're incentivized to stream for as long as you physically can because, you know, if you end stream, you lose all of your viewers, right? So once you've, once you've spent time collecting viewers, you know, throwing that away, leaving the stream means you're, you know, losing potential revenue. It's very heavily, heavily disincentivized by the way that the site is structured. So, you know, the, way, the reason that streamers stream for so long and have to fill dead air is not because they chose to necessarily, but because the way Twitch is organized sort of forces them to, at least if they want to actually maximize their profits uh, in a, you know, capitalist economy way. It's sort of like saying, well, you know, why, why do all these companies, uh, like, why, why, why does, uh, you know, any corporation have to, uh, you know, put out new products and uh, fucking uh, grow for, you know, they could just choose to not do that. Well, actually, the way that companies work is that they have to grow because they have a responsibility to their shareholders to do that. Uh, the point of investing in a company is that you invest in the hopes that the company will grow. And these companies rely on investments. Uh, and so if you invest in a company and it just stays the same, you haven't made any money on it. Your investment was pointless and therefore you're incentivized to continually grow. Uh, I remember Digi not understanding this a few years ago. Why do companies have to grow? Why can't they just stay still? Um, so I, I'm talking about public companies, of course. Private companies are different. If you don't, if you're not open, 
to investment, then you don't have to grow. It's a different thing. But once you open open your company up to investment on the stock market or anything like that, you are literally obligated to grow. Uh, so that's not like, why did they make the choice to do this, right? It's just they are existing within a system that forces them to do this. That's capitalism, baby. And in this sense, that is both capitalism and the way Twitch has chosen to organize their website. And if you want to complain about that, please feel free to, because I think it's a shitty way to organize a website. I think Twitch could do a lot more for discoverability. But if you want your channel to grow, you have to be near the top of that category list. It's the only way people are going to find you reliably on Twitch. It's really, it's famously hard to grow on Twitch. The reason Ludwig's subathon was so successful is because he was live for so long. And the longer you're live for, the more you accumulate viewers because other streamers go offline. The people who were previously at the top of the list go offline, which sort of nudges you upwards. As their viewers leave, they're probably going to look for other streams in the category. Some of them, you know, they might get spread out over various streams, but once they leave, everyone gets pushed up. And so if you just stick around for long enough, eventually you get pushed up near the top, you know, ideally, theoretically, if you're people who are actually watching you. That's how Twitch works, and that's why streamers stream for a really long time, and that's why streamers need to take breaks to eat food and shit and piss, and that's why they need to fill their air, and that's why they do reaction content. It's not because they're lazy, necessarily. But as JX, he said, and I think fairly, there are other ways to fill that air. You can invite a guest onto stream to entertain your chat. You can do all sorts of things, right? And also, there are clearly streamers that don't need to do this, right? As I said, Northern Lion and Simple Flips, two of my favorite streamers, don't stream for absurdly long periods of time, like XQC and Hassan. But XQC and Hassan are much, much more successful than, than Simple Flips and Northern Lion. So if you want to be at the top of the game, and you want to stay at the top of the game, you got to stream for a long time. And that's why they do reaction content. Now, the question is, how badly would it affect the stream if you just put up a BRB sign and go take a piss? Like, how badly would that actually affect the stream? I think in that situation, maybe not badly at all. Maybe just a small dip. But if you need to eat, you know, eating can take 15, 20 minutes, depending on if you're cooking or whatever. You can turn the cooking into content. A lot of streamers do. Or you can just order DoorDash, which a lot of streamers do. Uh, but the eating, that just takes time. And if you are off the air for that much time, people are going to leave and go somewhere else. You have to make that entertaining somehow. In my opinion, I think you know what would be a good idea is to, to give the stream over to the chatters in that segment. To say, I'm, I'm going to be eating, and you have a little picture of you eating in the corner, you know, a little webcam, and you play marbles on stream or something like that. You do something where the chat, it's sort of user-generated content, right? Where the chat is, is doing the, the content. Like maybe you set up a game of some kind uh, and have the chatters join it and you just spectate the game, you know, while you eat. That's definitely a possibility. And I think streamers should do that. I think that would be a, a pretty innovative idea. But why bother when React content is equally entertaining and, you know, just as effective? Um, okay, I want to talk a little bit now about the second type of React content being bad. Is React content... Okay, let me actually get this out of the way. Do I actually think reaction streams are good content? Do I think they're actually that entertaining? No, I don't. I, I would rather streamers didn't do it. I don't particularly enjoy watching it. I said I watch XQC reactions, but the most of the time, I don't finish XQC reaction. I watch them, and then either I think, this video's good, but this fucking Quebecois guy keeps interrupting it. I'm gonna go watch the video itself so I don't have to deal with his interruptions. I guess the first thing I do. Or I start watching it and I say, this isn't very interesting, and I click off. The only real times when I actually stick through to the end of an XQC reaction is if it's something relevant to him. If, like, it's about streaming or about esports or something like that, where I think he's going to have an interesting take. And he often, surprisingly, does. So, you know, I think there are times when it can be good. Even the sort of semi-lazy Twitch reaction content can be good. But generally speaking, I, I don't think it's super entertaining. But now let's talk about the moral side of things. Is it okay to stream reaction content? Is it stealing? Well, you guys all know my opinion on copyright, right? Like, the answer is obviously yes. Uh, and even, you know, even even if it's... Because who's who gets to draw the line of what is what counts as transformative and what doesn't, you know? Like, as I've given the example of before, like, let's say I were to take a really successful album, like, um, I don't know. Let's say I were to take some 
well, who's popular? Is Billie Eilish popular? I don't know, I'm out of touch with Zuma popular music. Let's say I would take a Bill the new Billie Eilish album and I would just beat for beat, same cover, re-upload it to my band camp. Obviously I would get copyright strike and taken down, but let's imagine I were to just do that. The context would be completely different because the point would be, why would someone do that, right? Like, if I were to do that, you would immediately see it as some sort of artistic statement as like, well, hold on a minute, why would No Thank You re-upload this? Like, I'm listening to this in a completely different context now. That album's meaning is no longer about whatever the fuck the Billie Eilish album is about, but is now about intellectual property and copyright and what it means to steal a digital good or copy a digital good or uh, maybe the commodification of music or any of these number. Like, suddenly the context is completely different. Even something as basic as just re-uploading it. Because art is not just itself, but it's also the context in which it takes place. Two people who watch the same movie actually watch a completely different movie because they're coming into it with all of their own baggage as different people. And so they might see the same screen, but their interpretations can be completely different, even if it's only subtly different. In reality, every person who looks at a painting sees a slightly different painting. So I think that any recontextualization of an art piece is transformative in some sense. And then the question becomes, are you okay with that? If, you're, if your argument hinges on it being transformative, what level of transformative is okay and what level is not okay? You know, who, who gets to decide that and why? JXE doesn't attempt to answer any of these questions. They just say, if it's transformative, it's okay. If it's not, it's not okay. But they don't really give any reason as to why that is or what it would mean for one to be the other you know, where the delineation is, you know, they sort of imply that it's a bit of a, a sliding scale, that like, it's not just transformative and not transformative black and white, but it's like, reactions can be better and better and better the more they add to the content. And in terms of artistic merit and entertainment, I think I agree. But in terms of morality, I think that's a tougher thing to argue. Uh, now, the second thing, and this is the thing where I'm kind of mixed about it, is... Uh, uh, what's it, fucking attribution, right? Like, the the big problem, I think, or Dotesmate especially pointed this out, with the Hassan reaction that JXE pointed out, which I think should have come way earlier in the video, because I think this is a much easier way to... It's a, it's a much more obvious problem, is that Hassan, at the end of the video, before JXE shouts out their socials and tells them how to find, you know, their other videos and s subscribe and so on, before that happens, Hassan cuts them off. So they don't, you know, they just basically watch the content without giving the original creator credit. Now, if you look at other streamers, like Asmongold, for example, when Asmund watches a video on stream, he spams the YouTube link in chat first. He will take the YouTube link and just spam it in chat. So if you want to watch it, if you want to subscribe or anything, it's right there for you. I think he spams it before and after sometimes, right? Like if he's, he will shout out the channel in big writing so that you can't possibly miss it. He will always watch sponsors all the way through. He watches self-promotion all the way through. Now, I think this is a good thing to do, you know, ethically, but I don't think not doing it is a bad thing to do, right? I think you're a more virtuous person if you give a lot of credit to the original creator and so on. And I would personally like that, right? Like, I think it's good. I would enjoy, I would be happy if someone did that for me, if someone watched my video and they did that for me, right? But I don't think it's a moral obligation. I just think it's a moral virtue, right? There are, there are like, in the same way that, I mean, you, you can figure out an example of that, right? Where something can be a moral good, but not be obligatory. It's like, you're going above and beyond. But I still think, but at the same time, you know, um, uh, instinctively, I see Hassan as kind of a dick for not giving credit, even though philosophically I find it hard to argue as to why that is. Um, I don't know if that means my philosophy is wrong or if it means my instincts are wrong. You can make your own decision. But I do think, given how little effort it takes to credit someone, that it's probably worth doing, Give, just because it takes no effort. However, especially if you're a streamer with a big audience, right? But if you're, and especially if you're a streamer with a big audience watching a video by a small YouTuber, then I think, it, you know, it's really hard to argue against giving credit. Spamming the YouTube link in chat, 
shouting out the person, watching the bit where they show their socials, etc., telling people to subscribe, all of these sorts of things, sending people over there trying to shout them out. I think it's hard to argue against that if you watch a video by a small creator and you enjoy it, right? I think it's hard to argue against that. But, you know, again, I don't necessarily know that it's a moral obligation. Of course, nothing is really a moral obligation. I'm working within this framework, right? I know someone's going to be thinking like, but no, thank you. You you are here being like morality isn't real, but yeah, okay. I'm working within the framework because you can say that and it kind of shuts down the whole discussion. So we're going to work within the framework here, okay? I mean, not that that's irrelevant. That is relevant, but we're working with, okay, you understand. Uh, so that's essentially my take. Uh, is that I don't find it particularly enjoyable to watch, but I don't think that there's anything su super objectionable about it. Uh, and I think that the JXE video is a little disingenuous in that sense. So they, they leave out some fairly important details, and they focus quite hard on some stuff that I think is poorly defined, like transformativeness, transformativity, transformativeness. I don't know what to call it, but that stuff. They sort of don't, they, they, they harp on it like it's this really important thing that's obvious to everyone, without giving any sort of definition or reasoning as to why that's important, or what it even means. Uh, and ultimately, just to reinforce my point, this is not necessarily the fault of individual streamers, it's the fault of Twitch as a website and the way it's structured. And just finally, just to add on to this, is that these streamers are acting within their self-interest in a capitalist market on a website run by Amazon that is structured in a certain way. Can you blame them for that? Honestly? If Hassan or XQC lost a little bit of revenue, how upset would it, can I be? They're millionaires. They're multi-multi-millionaires. They're fucking so rich. Who cares? But if a smaller or mid-sized streamer, you know, that's a different story, I think. I think it's much easier to argue that once you're the size of Hassan and XQC, and, you know, so on, maybe you should be held to a higher standard, because it's not like you're struggling to make ends meet, right? Like, maybe you should have to work a little bit right? But if you're a small streamer who's just making a little bit of extra money on the side, right, but you're streaming really long hours or something like that, then it's like, okay, you don't have the resources to necessarily set up something entertaining while you're eating or pissing or whatever. Like, maybe that's a kind of a different story. But when it comes to big streamers like Hassan and XQC, I think it's perfectly valid to say, come on, bro, you're fucking rich. You could literally hire, you could every day hire an entire theatre production to put on a play while you eat for the audience. Like, you could do that, you can afford that. You would probably not be even losing much money by doing that because of how ridiculously rich you are. Like, obviously I'm not saying that that's what they have to do, but like, that's an, as an absurd example of what you could do to entertain stream while you eat. Like, it's not like you don't have the resources to do something more interesting. Uh, at that level, it may be true that you're incentivized to stream for a really long time and fill dead air, but you're not forced to. JXE is right about that, that you are in, uh, unless we're in a contract situation, but I highly doubt that Twitch's contracts stipulate that you have to actually stream 16 hours a day. That would be absurd. Streamers would complain about it way more. Uh, you know, you're not normally, under normal circumstances, you're not literally forced to. And if you're a big streamer, you have the resources to do something more interesting. It's a bit lazy. It's kind of bad content. Are you a morally bad person for doing it? I don't think so. I think streamers do way more morally corrupt things than reaction content. But is it bad? Is it not very entertaining? Is it kind of shitty art? I think so. I think you could be trying a little bit harder than that, given the amount of resources you have, right? Like, uh, but then again, you know, people like reaction content. It always does well. Uh, I mentioned Ludwig earlier, I think, right? Ludwig is kind of an interesting case where he uses the lowbrow content to fund the highbrow content, or like, event content, right? Like, he does these TikTok reacts and reactions to stupid, I don't watch these, these are like the only Ludwig videos I physically can't watch, he does reactions to this, like, think, like, dating fucking YouTube videos, speed date, I can't watch it, I don't even know what happens in it, it's so bad. But those get really popular for some reason, I don't know why, I don't know why people enjoy watching that, it's fucking awful. But those get really popular, which gives Ludwig the money, to put into big events, and those sorts of big events don't actually make that much money. You know, like Ludwig's chess boxing event lost money. It almost broke even, but it did lose money. Like, that's something that I think people don't understand. Like, for example, musicians touring often 
loses money. Uh, you know, these sorts of big events have to be really fucking successful to actually make money. They're mostly like a marketing cost. That like you do the big event to draw in a big crowd, not necessarily to make money right then, but in order to market yourself to a new audience and uh, establish yourself as, you know, someone different from the competition or uh, like, for example, a musician going on tour might lose money on the tour, but uh, the marketing of playing a live show in someone's city where they can go see you and form some sort of connection or have some sort of experience or the legitimate, you know, that might make them into a person who is more willing to be a long-time fan and pay for your upcoming stuff uh, and be more loyal. They might introduce their friends. They might say, hey, I, this artist I like is playing, come with me, you know, who then become fans. And the fact that you can be, say, I've toured in this place and this place and this place legitimizes you as a musician in the sort of pop sphere, or not necessarily in the pop sphere, but like, you know, it gives you clout. Like there's the the actual, it's really a marketing thing, right? It's not actually there to make, it used to be that you used to be able to make money off of it, but it's much harder to make money off of it these days, uh, for some reason. Or maybe no one really makes money off of it, ever. I don't know. Some I know some people make money, but it's all a weird thing. Sometimes you're going to lose money to make money, is what I'm saying here. Like, if you were a streamer and you never did reaction content of, of like, that caliber, you only, you, you, you came up with these interesting ideas to entertain chat while you were eating or pissing or whatever, where you have, you know, some sort of chat interaction thing, or you pay someone to entertain chat in some way, you know, something like this, I think that would differentiate you in the market, and maybe a streamer who did that would become successful and influence other streamers. I think that's, you know, maybe this is a little bit too... Um, the market will solve it, <laughs> kind of mean. Uh, you know, maybe I suddenly became possessed by a libertarian. Uh, but that seems like something that's, I don't know, it could work. It, it's in, it would be interesting to try out. But the real, yeah, the real thing is like, yeah, no one is actually forcing you to stream this many hours. There are lots of stream, like, you don't have to, you, you have to stream those many hours if you want to be a multimillionaire like XQC and Hassan, but you don't need to be a multimillionaire. You know, like, Hassan, I hate Hassan. Let's just be real here. I fucking hate this guy. <laughs> like, uh, he's such a hypocrite. I don't know. You you know, I don't need to talk about how much I fucking hate Hassan here. You all understand. Okay, well, that's my opinions on reaction content. Okay, uh, now we're going to be doing a new type of thing. And that type... Guys, can I ask you a question? Why do you watch this? This is fucking awful. This is just terrible. This is one of the worst things I've ever made. Like, none of this is good to let... What are you doing? You've listened to this for four hours, almost five hours of just me talking. What's wrong with me? Holy shit. What is actually wrong with me? Why am I so narcissistic that I believe that anyone would actually want to listen to this? And you know what the fucked up thing is? You're listening to this. Like, I wasn't even wrong. But like, why? I don't know, man. Sorry. Keep listening, because this is going to be an actually good segment, maybe. Uh... This is the every dude you will ever meet tier list maker. Now, I think there's a big bit of a problem with this. There's a bit of a problem with this going in, which is which is that this is very much an every dude you will ever meet in LA tier list maker. Like, there's definitely a bunch of these guys that are just irrelevant to me. Uh, so I'm going to try and judge it, but, you know, who cares? Wait, there's ones that got cut out of the video. Wait, there's, there's one? <laughs> Wait, they... They cut out ones from... This is from the, the Yard, by the way. They did this on the Yard podcast. Um, oh, we're going to get this going. Uh, the tiers are... At the top, you got the homie. Then you got kind of based. Uh, harmless. Kind of cringe. The whack playlist. Jail. And death penalty. Okay, so we're going to start off here with Terminally Broke. This is a guy... This is not a poor person, right? Poor person is one thing. This is a guy who's like comes from a middle-class family, has no reason to be broke, but is just refuses to get a job, is always asking you for money type of guy. I, personally, I think it's kind of cringe, um, but it's also mostly harmless. Like, I get it. I get it. But it gets, in, like, the thing is, after a while, they, they put this right on the yard, is that, like, it would be harmless, but after a while, you just, like, get a job. Like, any job. Just get something, please. You could, you're, you're, you, you just want to smoke weed and play video games all day. I know, I do too, but like, come on. 
And it's like, yeah, I think that's kind of cringe. Okay, next up is Gamer Nintendo Only. Now, they put this way low. I think harmless. Even on the edge of kind of based. And here's why. Well, it's mainly just because I'm a Digibo and Simple Flips fan. I mean, Simple doesn't actually only play Nintendo games. But I just remember hearing Digi talk about how they grew up only owning Nintendo consoles and got bullied for it, but, but stuck with it. And I was like, that's kind of based. But then again, is Digi actually kind of based as a person? Not really. So I'm going to put it, I'm going to put it in harmless. I think if you really get excited about the new Octo Octopath Traveler or whatever, and you're not Japanese, because like the reason that Nintendo keeps putting out these JRPGs is because they're big in Japan, China, Korea. They're big in Asia, right? They don't have a massive following in the West, uh, just like how FPS games don't have such a big following in the in Asia. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna put that in harmless. Oh, this one they didn't mention on the podcast. This is the D and D guy. Oh, I think the D and D guy's kind of cringe. I think the D and D guy's kind of cringe. They're like mostly harmless. Let's be honest, they're mostly harmless. But like, there's something about it that's kind of cringe. <laughs> I don't know, man, because. But you know who's worse than the D&D &D guy? Let me tell you who's... Okay, I don't know who's worse, because there's there's the D&D &D guy, and then there's the guy who, whenever you bring up D&D, &D, says, bro, there are so many way better tabletop games. Like, you got to play a different rate tabletop game, man. Like, D&D &D is, like, the worst tabletop RPG. Like, like that guy's also really fucking annoying. I don't know who's worse, though. Who's who's the who's the worst kind of guy? And that kind of guy's not on the, not on the chart, though. Uh, let's see here. I, I'm going to put him in... It's kind of cringe. It's kind of cringe to be into D&D. &D. I'm just going to be real. It's not a very good game. Uh, Sneak Ahead? Sneak Ahead is the whack playlist. Sneak Ahead is the whack playlist, 100% for me. Because it doesn't take any... There's nothing about... Sneakers are nothing. They're frivolous, meaningless nonsense. If you're into sneakers, then, like, I don't know. <laughs> they, like, you know what I mean? But, like, being into sneakers is not, like, a, a cool niche hobby. It's, like, the most mainstream, normie hobby you can possibly be into. I don't know. That's the whack playlist to me. I don't want to be friends with a sneaker head. If I go over to someone's house and they have a whole bunch of sneakers and they want to talk to me about it, oh my god, if they want to talk to me about it, bro, that's the whack playlist. I'm going to have to agree for the next one. I'm going to have to agree with the yard. The Elon fan in 2023, death penalty. Elon fan in 2023, death penalty. Like, what are you doing, bro? Actually, what are you doing? I, yeah, the easy death penalty. I'm going to try and speed run through this, right? I'm not going to take two hours like they did. And right, next up, we got, well, I guess they had a, their content was that they're discussing it with each other. My content is, I have no content, but you're going to listen to this anyway. God knows why. I guess you just want background noise or something. Okay, guess next one, we're going to be going ahead and relevant with a podcast guy. But this is not the podcast guy, like I'm making a podcast right now. This is the podcast guy. You know the guy. Hey, we should start a podcast, bro. You know the kind of guy who's a podcast guy. Thinks he's really interesting, but actually doesn't you know what i'm saying right like the podcast guy not really very funny not really very interesting but for some reason is this just me i don't know i think this is kind of, this is this is kind of uh, the whack playlist maybe it's like bottom of the whack playlist we should start a merch company oof i've never see this is this is la this is la this is an la moment podcast guy and sneakerhead also la moment all of this is very la moment but we should start a merch company. I've never heard anyone say that before. <laughs> I know it's a type of guy that exists in LA, but I've never heard of it. This is not something that exists here or in the people I hang out with at least. Um, I, I guess I'll put that in the whack players with podcast guy. They seem like the same kind of guy. Straight Edge is the next one. Damn, that's crazy. I was watching I was watching the podcast and I was like, Straight Edge should be one of these types of guys. But they never mentioned Straight Edge in the podcast. They, uh, maybe it's in the, the, the Patreon section of the podcast. I don't know. Straight edge? Straight edge is definitely... Uh, it depends, right? If you're straight edge... It, it depends what you mean by straight edge. If you're straight edge because you used to have a drug problem, that's kind of based. If you're straight edge because you're, like, fucking judgmental for no reason, that's kind of cringe. Uh, the more straight... The more into being straight edge you are, the cringier you are. Just like being really... Because being really into drugs is kind of cringe because it doesn't take any effort or make you an interesting person to be really into drugs, right? And it's the same if you're... Like, you know, being like a weed a weed smoker guy or like just a drug cokehead guy or, you know, any of these kind of guys. They're kind of cringe because it doesn't take any effort or make you an interesting person, right? And being straight edge is the same thing. Being really not into drugs also doesn't take any effort and doesn't make you an interesting person. It just makes you judgmental for no reason. So I'm going to put this in. But 
Actually, no, no, no. I'm gonna put this in the whack playlist. Also, for some reason, I feel like the straight edge guy is likely to have, likely to be like 23 with like a 17 year old girlfriend. You know what I'm saying? I don't know why I think that, but yeah. Also, listens to, to bad hardcore. We'll say cancel culture in the next five minutes. Bro, that's definitely the whack playlist. Definitely the whack playlist. We get it. See, this is something I don't understand. Patagonia Pizza. When they were talking about this on the podcast, apparently Patagonia is like some kind of brand, like a clothing brand. I'm going to look it up. Patagonia. Oh, I've seen this logo before. Oh, yeah, I've seen stuff like this. This is, I mean, I don't know what this is associated with. I don't, I don't, I don't know this one. I'm, I'm just going to, I'm going to leave that one because I don't really understand it. The Instagram tourist. I mean, that's definitely whack playlist. Anyone who uses Instagram is whack. Esports org employee. I feel like everyone's just gonna go on the whack playlist. Esports org employee. They're very cringe. They're extremely fucking cringe. That's a whack playlist every time. That's maybe almost jail. Messy car. Harmless. I'm putting messy car guy in harmless. I got a messy house. I get it. Where's Rasta colors? I think if you're like 14 or like if you if you're like, you know, young teenager and you just discovered weed it's cringe but everyone's cringe at that age right like it's i can't judge you for it if you're an adult and you wear rasta colors bro like come on that's 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 arguably jail that's arguably jail someone's deeply wrong with you i think we're talking about white guy who wears rasta colors here like white guy with dreadlocks wears rasta colors type of guy not yeah kind of different but yeah that's kind of that's kind of jail i think photographer brackets only girls that's extremely fucking sus man that's it that's giga sus that guy i've never met him i don't think i've ever met a photographer <laughs> i don't know bro but these are all like very la guys i could that's like definitely a guy that exists everywhere in la but not i've never met him why did i think i'd be able to do this because i've never met any guys that's that's cringe i'm putting that in in the whack playlist it's more than kind of cringe it's like whack Extremely nice, but not funny. I have, you know, I had a friend in school who was extremely nice and not funny at all. Um, they are now transgender. And they're fucking based, so I'm going to put them in kind of based. Very good friend. Uh, yeah. Um, next up is Crypto Guy Brackets Gambler. This this is to, uh, this is to, uh, to fucking, like, contradict or to, to, to act as the foil for Crypto Guy Brackets Real. Uh, I've never met a crypto guy in real life. I've only seen them on Twitter. A crypt- so the, the difference is a crypto guy real is someone who actually believes in crypto, really. Whereas a crypto guy gambler is just into crypto to, like, you know, gamble. Maybe through gambling websites, but mainly just, like, to gamble on crypto. Uh, I don't know. That's cringe. That's that's whack. Whack playlist. The poker player? I, I don't know. I've never met a poker player. I'm gonna... I'm gonna... That's, that's, that's whack to me. Um... I, I don't know what the, this type of guy really insinuates. I'm just going to not do that because I've never met that that person or seen them online or anything. Public complainer. Ooh, public complainer. That is kind of cringe. I'm putting in kind of cringe. <laughs> they just have Coward JD, who's just a, a, a person. I don't know who the fuck this person is. So I'm just going to... I'm I'm put them in jail because that's where the yard put them. I'll just, I'll just, I'll just agree with them. Yeah, and now we get to like the, again... Uh, not applicable to where I live. Redneck but lives in the city. They're, but <laughs> I'm not American. I don't know. Uh, but it, if I had to hazard a guess at what this type of guy is like, I would say they're kind of cringe. That just sounds like a kind of an annoying person. All right, next up is good at everything guy. People who are just good at everything. Doesn't mean they're like snarky about it or a pseudo intellectual or anything. They're just actually like genuinely good at everything. Maybe they worked really hard for it. Um... I think this guy's harmless. I don't know if they're kind of based. Because it's the thing is, you're going to get, like, it's annoying. to Right? <laughs> like, I knew someone who was good at I went to school with a couple of kids who just seemed to be able to fucking do everything. I guess because they had really strict parents. And so they were always, like, pushed to do really well at everything. But I didn't understand that at the time. Because I was a kid, right? Uh, so I just thought they were just naturally good at everything. And, it, and I was just comparing myself to them constantly and getting depressed. Uh, but as an adult... I don't know, no one in my uni was good at everything that I can remember. I don't think there's anyone I know right now online who is just fucking cracked at everything. Yeah, I don't know. I'll put them in harmless. It doesn't seem to be a problem. Not listening, waiting to talk. I'm definitely guilty of doing this occasionally. I think I've gotten better with it though, I do it less now. Mainly just because 
I realized that the reason I was doing this was because I was talking to people who weren't fucking interesting. Like, trim the fat of your friend group, and suddenly you'll actually want to listen to what they have to say. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But anyway, I still do this out of, like, I'm still, I've left this era behind, I hope. I try and catch myself when I'm doing it, is what I'm saying. Um, it's kind of annoying. It's, ki- it's kind of cringe. It de- it's at the top of kind of cringe. Like, it's barely cringe, but it's kind of cringe. It depends if you have something interesting to say afterwards. Okay, now this one is 10 plus years older than his GF, brackets legal. It dep- I think, as they said on the yard, this one heavily depends on how old the guy and the girl is. Like, if it's like a 50-year-old and a 40-year-old, 50-year-old guy with a 40-year-old GF, I think that's completely harmless, right? That's fine. But if it's like a 30-year-old guy with a 20-year-old GF, or a 28-year-old guy with an 18-year-old GF, like, it just, like, I don't think it's morally wrong, I, but I think it's weird, because it's like, why are you interested, like, you can't have interesting conversations or relate on subjects when the difference in maturity is going to be so broad. So it makes it seem like that guy is, like, immature. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Like, why don't you want to hang out with your peers, you know? But then, if it's someone, it depends, you know, the older they are, the less cringe it becomes. Like, if you're a 90-year-old guy with an 80-year-old GF, that's kind of based, you. I think we can assume we're talking on the younger end of the spectrum here and put them in, hmm, I don't know, I've never met a guy like this in real life. That's why it's, like, hard for me to judge. Uh, so I think, I think I'll put them in kind of cringe, in the middle of kind of cringe. Now, this one they didn't, this is the one that they just skipped on the yard. Uh, this is suicidal guy brackets Twitter version. I have no fucking clue what this means. I have absolutely no idea what this means. Um, yeah, I don't know what this is. Suicidal guy is cringe, harmless, kind of based. Bro, I don't, I don't know what Twitter version means. I don't know what the, what, what is the Twitter version of a suicidal guy? What is, I don't, I, li- I, I can't answer this one, I'm afraid. Because I just don't know what it means. I need to get the primo, premium yard see if they talk about it or something i don't i don't i don't understand it okay hiding being bored that's kind of cringe hiding being bored is kind of cringe although i maybe do it no it would be doing it if i always wore hats i've worn a hat like once to cover up being balding literally once in my entire life for the video for victoria line because at the time i had a really bad haircut it was mainly to cover up just having a bad haircut which made me look like i was balding more, more than i actually am even though i am actually balding no, bro, that's fucking cringe. That might even be whack. Like, I, because you're part of the problem. If you're not flaunting your boredness, that means you don't have the mental strength to push back against society's expectations of you. You know what I mean? Like, the only reason it, that we, can, we would hide being bored is because society tells us that that's a, like, the unfair beauty standards of society tell us that being bored is abnormal when actually it's perfectly normal. So if you're hiding being bald, that's fucking cringe. Because then you're participating in that. You're like, no, I'm too much of a pussy to push back at this. Like, I can't reveal. No. And people might make fun of you. People might make... And you know what? It's funny. Bald jokes are literally funny. Balding jokes, bald jokes, literally funny. I don't know. It's cringe to hide being bald. Uh, Next up is worked his ass off to be here. This is another type of guy I'm not very familiar with. So I don't really know where to put them. Uh, But I think... I think I'd put them in in kind of cringe. Reply guy, this is a Twitter phenomenon. This is definitely the whack playlist. That's fucking cringe. That's extremely cringe. The no homo guy, that's jail. Bro, that's so, it, like, if maybe if it's like, tw- if it was 2010 still, I would accept it. But in 2023, to be the no homo guy is actually ridiculous. That's actually insane. The self-titled intellectual. Now, I thought it was quite interesting where the yard guys took this. So they took this to mean someone who, like, thinks they're really smart and goes on about how they're really smart. Like, the sort of people who will call themselves a gifted kid burnout. Or they'll be like, yeah, like, I actually did really well. You know, like, I I dropped out of school. I didn't do that well. But that's just because, like, I didn't really fuck with the vibes of school, you know? Like, like they felt like it was holding me back from my true... You know, that kind of guy. Uh, And that, that is a fucking incredibly annoying kind of guy. But, like, the way I interpret self-titled intellectual is just someone who actually is like you know fulfills the social stereotype of like the intellectual you know like uh and like calls themselves an intellectual even though they do actually fulfill it like they're probably an academic of some kind 
they probably um, read French literature and watch French movies. Very French kind of guy. Very, very French kind of guy. Um, probably wear thick rimmed glasses, uh, but not in like the nerdy way, in like the cool hipster way that makes you look like an intellectual. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's just the lack of hump, like the thing, and they're way too self-aware. Because this is ki- this is like, this is like the dark version of me, I feel like. Like, if I wasn't, it, this is like me when I was younger, where it's like, I'm aware that I'm relatively intelligent, but I have no self-awareness or humbleness. And so I just think everyone else is beneath me. This is like me when I was a teenager. Yeah, this is fucking whack. I'm putting them near the bottom of the, whatever, whatever self, whether my version or, yeah, no, it's cringe. Uh, Again, another one that, that used to be me when I was a teenager is always lying. I've talked about this before, that like, I used to be like this pathological liar until my close friend called me out on it. And suddenly I had to examine myself and be like, holy shit, why am I doing this? And I, I stopped. I, I really have tried to stop. Um, I, I'm, I basically have stopped um, like years ago. Like, yeah, when this happened, I did a lot of introspection and started to stop doing it and have basically stopped doing it now. I do occasionally still do it and I try to back myself out of it. Like, because it, it's still a habit that I had from when I was, like, forever from when I was a kid. And the, what it comes from is a lack of, like, self-worth. Like, you think people will look down on you if you don't know the X thing. Like, that's where it came from in me. I was like, I, it, again, it's kind of related to the self-titled intellectual cringiness. Where it's like, I tied all of my self-worth into being looked at as intelligent. And so, if it was something that was like, I don't know this. Like, hey, you know about this thing? It's like, oh, shit, I don't know. Well, since my entire self-worth is I'm intelligent, I know things, I have to pretend, I have to lie that I know it. You know guys like this, right? That's that's fucking cringe. That's like jail time. That's jail cringe. No, I I don't think you should go to jail for that. I think that's just whack playlist. Okay, here's another one that they didn't cover on the podcast. Hot, but painfully hard to talk to. Bro, you think I've ever talked to a hot person? No. I don't talk to any hot people, except my girlfriend, but... They're easy to talk to. Hot, but painfully hard to talk to. Actually, I did know. I went to to I I I went to school with a guy who was hot, but hard to talk to. But that's mainly I don't know. He just didn't really hang out with my friend group at all. I don't know if I can comment on this one. I don't think I've had any experience with this type of guy. Only watches The Office. Jail. Jail. Only watches The Office. You belong in jail. Maybe the death penalty even. Like, that's fucked. That's actually so fucked. Only watches The Office. That's, that's, yeah. If you went to jail, I would be happy about that. Messy hair dad wearing veins. Uh, vans, sorry. Messy hair dad wearing vans. This is, I think, again, an LA specific thing. Um, I think this is harmless. The contrarian. Um, this is also identified as the devil's advocate guy. Um, there's definitely a little bit of this in me, but I'm working through it. Definitely a little bit of this in some people I know. I think a lot of people who are in similar online communities to me during their teenage years ended up kind of like this. Um, and I think it, it it's something that have, like, it's cringe every time. It's going to be below the harmless category, right? But it could be anywhere from jail to kind of cringe depending on what they're, con- like, if they're being contrarian about, like, um, it depends if they honestly believe what they're saying, basically. Like, if they're like, oh, I'm just gonna play devil's advocate just for the sake of having an argument, just to be contrarian for the sake of it, that's fucking giga extremely whack, right? But if they if they just genuinely believe stuff that is quite contrary to the norm, not because it's, like, cool to do that, but just because they've actually just come to that conclusion through natural means and they're willing to defend their beliefs, but they're not weird about it, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's not bad, it's not too bad. That's borderline harmless. I think that's harm, you know what? I'm gonna give this person, I'm gonna just put them in kind of cringe. I'm gonna put them in kind of cringe, even though at their worst, they can be jail. At the worst end of contrarian, actually, I think I have to move them down to the whack playlist, just because thinking about how bad contrarians can be, and me when I've been a contrarian in the past and how cringe I was. I'm still a bit of a contrarian, but I'm pretty sure I've evened out my shit to the point where it's only stuff I actually believe in, not just stuff I'm saying for the sake of it. This is another America-specific thing. Has never not worked at Verizon. I don't know what the fuck that means. Uh, 
This one I don't understand. C, oh, C minus. Oh, I do understand it. C minus, but wife is insanely hot for no reason. <laughs> what the, um, I guess if I round this out to girlfriend is insanely hot for no reason. I don't know. I don't know what this means. I don't talk to people like this. I'm aware that people like this exist, but I I don't talk to them. C minus. So like a kind of very average looking guy with insanely hot wife slash girlfriend. Like, what does this mean? I don't know what that implies. I'm just going to put that towards the bottom. I think it just, it either, I think what they're insinuating is that it either means the, the wife is just after his money, or it means that the wife is chill and he's super chill, right? Like, those are the, those are the two stereotypical options for that. It's like, either he might be mid, but he's very rich, or he, uh, neither of them are together for their looks. They just gen, you know what I mean? Like, in that case, that's kind of based. But it's really the wife who's based in that situation, right? For not being uh, judgmental of people based on their looks, but based on their personality. It's not the guy who's based. The guy doesn't really matter. Yeah, I don't know about that. I'm just not going to do that one because I've never met that person. And it seems like the wife is actually the key character there. Every story starts with being high. That's kind of, that's, it depends. It depends. It depends on how good the stories are. And like, if they're just actually high all the time. But if you're high all the time, that's kind of cringe. Again, this is a, definitely an LA thing where weed is legal and there's a lot more stoners. I guess everyone here is also a stoner. Maybe a bit younger than me at this point. I'm going to put this in kind of cringe, but towards the top of kind of cringe, it's not that cringe. It's just like a little bit cringe. Concert guy, festival guy, this guy's in the whack playlist 100%. If that's your whole personality, that's so fucking whack. Only exception to this is concert slash festival guy who is genuinely really concerned about people's ear health who is like handing out earbuds and shit and being like guys like don't damage your hearing you get to that guy's fucking based but that is not the majority of festival guys that is like a, a a small minority the guy who really cares about protecting his and other people's hearing that guy's fucking based but normal guy whose personality is concert festival rave guy that's so cringe and the older you get the more cringe it is um never changes always happy Bro, I don't know anyone like this. <laughs> I don't know anyone like that. Have I met people like that? Um, never changes, always happy. Who do I know that's like... I don't think I know anyone like that. I'm just gonna not do that one. Always holding a monster. Um, it depends how... Okay, this, this, this heavily depends on a lot of things. This heavily depends on a lot of things. Because multiple different... Ta it depends it, almost entirely on which monster, I feel like. Or, I mean, this is supposed to be types of guy, as in male men, right? Because I feel like cis woman who's always holding a monster is harmless. Trans woman who's always holding a monster, kind of based. Cis guy who's always holding a monster, kind of cringe, I think. Kind of cringe. Can proudly rap fast. This, again, used to be me as a teenager. This motherfucker goes to jail. No, this, this guy is just autistic. He just doesn't have much going I feel like this guy, maybe he's not autistic. He just doesn't have that much going on in his life, maybe. Kind of has bad taste in music, but practice to skill, which I think moves it up from jail to the whack playlist. Like, it is insanely cringe if they bust it out, right? That is one of the most fucking cringe things you can possibly do. And I will be real with you. A couple of years ago, you get me drunk, I might have busted out the Watsky rap. I might have done it if I was drunk enough. And obviously being drunk would have meant I did it really badly. But, like, I can't hate on someone if they're actually good at it. Like, if you're bad at it, if you're like, bro, check me out, I'm gonna do Rap God, and you can't do it, that's jail. But you're not aware of how bad you are, that's jail. But if you pull it out, and you're actually kind of good at it, it's like, I'm still not saying you're good in any way as a person, but actually, do I even respect that you worked at it? Because you worked at such a stupid thing. That's almost worse. Um, I might I might send this... I mean, that's at least as bad as someone who only watches The Office, right? Yeah, but I'm putting that motherfucker in jail. This is another thing that I think on, that I have not seen in real life. Little cross earrings on a guy not aware of it. Not aware of this. Not aware of what this means, but that's not good fashion. I'm going to put that in kind of cringe because I don't... I don't know what it means, but I don't like that look. YouTuber? We're going on the average of all YouTubers. People who would call themselves a YouTuber, right? People who would, who are like, you know, you know, the type, the, the, 
the guy who's st- the, the average YouTuber who starts their videos with, hey guys, what's going on YouTube? Like that kind of guy. This guy's whack. Whack playlist, 100%. Tyler the Creator fan, easy whack playlist. Easy whack playlist. Gym guy, gym guys often, you know, there's been like a transformation in gym guys. I feel like gym guys 10 years ago are very different from gym guys now. Like a lot of gym guys, I mean, I guess maybe they've always been like this. Like gym guys, they're really great if you want to start working out. They are the most helpful people ever. They will give you tips. They'll work out with you. You know, these guys actually genuinely want people to go to the gym with them and like they will support you for doing that very well. Like that's what they're based at. They mention this on the yard too, but I was thinking that before they mentioned it. It's true. But in every other facet, it's kind of weird in my opinion. It's kind of weird. Like I feel like, I don't know, but I feel like, you know, the version of gym guy that I think is almost worse is like runner who's, who, who's talks about it. You know what I mean? I don't know, but runners are gen, like the weird thing is, the thing about runners is I feel like they're kind of chill, but there's something like deeply wrong with them. You know, it's like they really feel like they're like, it feels like a form of self-harm because it's like so painful to be a long distance runner. It's just pain. Like gym guy, you know, you, you lift all the time and it's like you get the pain, but then you look hot. Runner guy, it's like you get all the pain and you don't look hot. You just look skinny. It's like, that's, that's like something you're trying to punish yourself for something, you know? Like, I kind of respect it, but also, like, I feel like I want to ask you if you're doing okay, you know? They, they have this, like, I feel like runner guys, they have, like, an, ad, an addiction to it. Like, they're like, oh, man, if I can't run, like, man, I feel all weird, I feel all fucked up, you know? Whereas, I don't know if the regular gym guys are necessarily like that. Maybe they are. I don't know. I'm going to put them in harmless. I feel like the goods and the bads kind of outweigh each other. The cinephile. Now, the people on the yard, they use this very pejoratively they put this guy really low because they were saying like this is a really judgmental guy who's like oh yeah bro like it's kind of like a pseudo intellectual but the thing is i've met a through young sai who is a massive fucking cinephile and you know through going to the cinema with him a bunch and going to like these niche indie cinemas and stuff i've met a shitload of cinephiles they're all so chill none of them are like the guys that the yard described at all maybe they are online but like all of these guys, they're just as likely to recommend you some obscure French film as they are to recommend you like the best 80s American action film you've ever fucking seen. Like these guys, they're not judgmental, you know? I feel like the, the cinephile guy that's cringe is the guy that's like trying to go, like there's the sort of fake cinephile guy, right? Let's, let's start this off. There's like the fake first year film student cinephile guy who's really into Quentin Tarantino, way too into Quentin Tarantino guy. That guy is the whack playlist 100%. But then there's like the cinephile guy who is like trying really hard to get himself away from that guy and counter signaling away from like, oh yeah, that's like the basic bitch good cinema, right? But then there's like the real, like, you know, the new wave and and all of these foreign films and shit, like counter signaling against the first year film student, Quentin Tarantino guy. But I feel like that guy kind of counter signals too hard where he's, he's then like, Oh man, Quentin Tarantino is just like ripping off, you know, these these uh, Hong Kong movies and Japanese movies and so on. Like he's just ripping these people off. Like if you, they're not. He, he's not good. His movies aren't good. You know, it all comes down to what their opinion on Tarantino is. I feel like the true cinema file guy, like Young Sai is, for example, like Young Sai, he's watched every movie that Tarantino likes. You know, all of the inspiration ones, and he will tell you how amazing they are. But he also likes Tarantino, just not like um, like an idiot who hasn't seen better movies, right? Like he, this guy, like that's like, and I find that that guy, once you get deep enough into it, like those are the real cinephile guys. They just love the art form. They love everything in it. You know, like like even bad movies they like. And they, you know, or maybe like Jay from, from Red Letter Media, like, like he will sit down and watch the worst horror movie ever and he'll like love it. You know, like that's, that guy's kind of fucking based, no? So it entirely depends on what, what, what type of guy we're talking about. Um, but is, is that a cinephile guy or is that a guy who just loves movies? I don't know. I'm, I'm going to put them because the first two types, let's say type A is the first year film student Tarantino guy. Type B is the counter signaling pseudo intellectual guy. 
and then type C is the young Sai just fucking loves movies not completely unpretentiously guy. I think because type A and B are so cringe and type C is just based in general, but let's like, like it's not their whole personality. I think I gotta put them in kinda cringe because the bads outweigh the goods, if you know what I mean. Okay, next up is Skater. They put Skater kinda high up. Honestly, none of the skaters I've ever known have been like that chill. All of the skaters I've ever known have been guys who re- who started skating because they wanted to look cool, right? Because it's not like back in the day when skating was like counterculture. Like ev- like skaters have cu- skating has come, gone, come again, gone again. And now it's just like the default of like, I want to seem cool and countercultural without doing anything that's actually cool and countercultural. Like you can go to any fucking park and it has a skate park. Like there's loads of resources. There's nothing actually, you're not going counter to anything if you're a skater. You're just signaling that you, that you are, right? You, do you know what I mean? Am I crazy here? Like I feel like, like skaters, skating is like the easy... It's like the easy baby bitch version where it's like, I want to come across as cool, so I'm going to learn to skate, you know? So I'm going to put this in, you know, this might be a controversial take, but I'm going to put Skater in, in, towards the top of kind of cringe. Towards the top of kind of cringe. I think that it's kind of cringe, especially if you're talking about it all the time. If you just skate on the side, that's harmless, right? That's fine. But if you're like, if it's like a major part of your personality, it kind of makes me think that like, you know, you're trying, you're trying to be, you want attention, basically. Like, I'm cool, but I'm not, like, cool like the jocks, you know. But I'm also not a nerd. I'm, like, a counterculture skater, you know. It's, like, the most basic version of that. Like, there's much more interesting versions of that. Okay, next up is excited for bir- for his birthday is 27. Um, I don't know anyone <laughs> like this, but I feel like th- th- we need to give this guy a break, <laughs> Okay. Because this guy clearly is kind of depressed, right? Like, if you're excited for your birthday at 27, it means you just don't have that much shit to get excited about anymore. And I feel like that's kind of sad. And I kind of feel sympathy for you. So, like, yeah, I think it's kind of cringe. I think we can all agree that that's kind of cringe. But, like, it's not really doing anyone any harm. So I think it goes towards the top of kind of cringe again. Because it's like, you know, you know what I'm getting at. Okay, next up is sports fan. Um... I don't know, everyone here is into, it depends what you mean, this, like, okay, I think what I need to be doing is, is making sure I understand that this is not just a guy who's a sports fan, this is a sports fan type of guy, I I think sports fan type of guy is kind of cringe, it's like the bottom of kind of cringe, it's like, almost whack, it's almost whack, it's, it's borderline whack, it's not as borderline whack as hiding being bald, but it's fucking borderline whack. Okay, here's one they didn't mention on the yard. They didn't mention the sports guy either. Jago, Jargon Jimbo. Jargon Jimbo, I think, is just a guy who... I'm just going to assume this is a guy who uses a lot of jargon when he, when he talks. Um, I think that the whackness of this kind of type of guy completely depends on uh, how he responds to being asked what that word means, if you get what I mean. Like, if you, if you are a Jargon Jimbo and someone asks you... Oh, what what was that word? And you respond by saying, you don't know what that means? Then you're fucking whack, right? But if you respond by saying, like, oh, yeah, sorry, uh, I should probably, you know, humbly and, like, embarrassed that you let it slip out. If if the guy's embarrassed, he just talks like that and he's kind of embarrassed about it. That's that's harmless. That's almost even kind of base. I'm going to put this in, in harmless. I don't think it's really a problem to be a jargon jimbo. Alright, next up is conspiracy theorist. I'm going to basically parrot word for word exactly what they said on the yard. When you were a kid, conspiracy theorists were harmless and almost kind of based because it was like funny because the conspiracies they were into was like, Elvis isn't really dead, haha. Or like, we didn't really go to the moon. But nowadays, if you meet a conspiracy theorist, they're likely to believe that uh, the elites are all, you know, baby killing pedophiles and Jews control everything. And, um... You know, climate change isn't real. Greta Thunberg is somehow the spawn of Satan. Uh, You know, like, it's increditing. It's it's like jail. I'm going to put these motherfuckers... Like, back in the day, these were the motherfuckers who wrote silly books that no one took seriously, and it was fun to look at them. And, like, you could go on X on 4chan, and it was enjoyable. 
um, you know, and some of those guys still exist, but the mass, the mass, vast majority of them are so fucking like it's like borderline death penalty. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know, man. These guys are fucking not good. I'm tempted to put them in death penalty, but I think I'm gonna put them in jail. And the only reason I'm gonna do that is because, well, there's a couple of things. The first reason is that I do think that there are times when the conspiracy theorists get shit right. And in that case, I think it's pretty bad when the government labels them as conspiracy theorists for calling them out on something as actually real social issue type of thing. An example of this would be the train derailment in Ohio right now. Uh, like, I think that that gives a little bit of credence to the conspiracy theory. The thing that I think is kind of whack about it is that you get conspiracy theorists, like, let's say about um, COVID, and it's like some of the stuff that they were conspiracizing about actually turned out to be true. Like the lab leak hypothesis, for example. And it's like, they will not shut up about it. Oh my God. They're like, I told you so. I fucking told you so. It's like, I, I, I knew that from the beginning. You don't hear me saying that. You don't fucking hear me going around doing that. That shit is annoying. That shit is incredibly annoying. I'm gonna put them in jail. Open and often horoscope hater. See, they put this one pretty far down because they insinuated that it was basically misogyny. And I think this is weird because like, no, <laughs> I'm just, I actually hate horoscope. Uh, am I an open and often horoscope, horoscope hater? I have been in the past. I openly, um, you know, talked shit to a girl that was into horoscopes once. And that was kind of cringe and Reddit the way I did it. Um, but uh, I think it's, a, I agree that it's obnoxious. Okay. I agree that it's very obnoxious. However, I think it's way less obnoxious than being into horoscopes. Like being into horoscopes, even just a little bit, even just checking your horoscope, that's something that deserves to be derided in society. Like, that is absolutely bumfuck retarded, you know? We shouldn't... Sure, like, the only reason that the horoscope haters are so cringe is because it's like everyone knows that horoscopes are wrong. You're just not supposed to say it. You're just supposed to be tolerant of people or whatever. It's like, hold on a goddamn second. This stuff isn't harmless. This stuff's stupid. I don't know. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna put them higher than the, the I, I, I think I'm gonna put open and often horoscope hater into kind of cringe. Into, into kind of cringe. The slap bang in the middle of current kind of cringe. Because while I do think it's cringe to care that much, I also think that it's more cringe to care about someone else caring that much. You know what I mean? Because the thing that they're annoyed at is something that is perfectly reasonable to be annoyed at. Next up, wants to be a DJ and make zero progress. I feel like this guy's the whack playlist. Because normally that type of guy isn't actually invested in the music they're playing, right? They just want to be the center of attention, straight up. It doesn't need to get more complicated than that. Another thing I'm completely unfamiliar with, except from cultural osmosis, is CrossFit guy. Never met a CrossFit guy in my life, just gonna ignore it, just gonna not do that one. Next up is 90s rap fan, and this one is supposed to mean someone who only listens to 90s rap. I understand, I'm gonna counter signal here, I'm gonna do a little bit of counter signaling. Everyone says this guy's cringe, I think this, you know, the like, oh, the guy, sort of guy who's like, man, get that mumbling, that fucking mumble rap shit, I can't stand it, man. That type of guy. That's incredibly annoying. However, 90s rap is really good. Like, in a lot of ways, you know? They do like something good. I'm just gonna put them in kind of cringe. It depends how derisive they are of modern rap. If they're, like, just... If they're just, like, sitting there and they just say, like, eh, I don't really like that kind of stuff. I, I prefer, like, Mob Deep or whatever. If they're just very normal about it, that's fine. If they're derisive of modern rap, I feel like that's cringe. If they're chill... Yeah, but this is the type of guy... This is not just a guy who's into 90s rap, this is a 90s rap type of guy. Yeah, I think that's kind of cringe. It might even be the whack playlist. That might even be the whack... But the thing is, they're gonna make a good playlist, because it's gonna be a playlist of 90s rap, and everyone knows 90s rap kinda is sick. I'm gonna put it, I'm gonna put it in kind of cringe, towards the bottom of kind of cringe. How much would you suck dick for, kind of guy? This guy's basically the no homo guy, he belongs in jail. Okay, now we've got some interesting ones. We got back to back the half weeb and the full weeb. And I think, I don't know, man. This is, this is actually painful for me. <sighs> this is, it's painful for me, man. Because the, like, 90% of the full weeb is r slash anime, a hey gal t-shirt, full weeb, right? Like, come on, let's be real. That is 90% of full weeb. They're gonna be like, you know, 
into Chainsaw Man and Spy Family and stuff. Oh, you know what, let's start off with Half Weep. The Half Weep has shit taste in anime, um, obviously. You can't be a Half Weep and not have shit taste in anime. But they might have, like, fine shit taste in anime, if you know what I mean. Like, they might just be like, oh yeah, I'm really into One Piece, I like JoJo's, and, you know, like, stuff that's, like, not egregiously bad, right? I don't know, I think I put this guy in kind of cringe. Just to me. Mainly to mo- to most people, probably probably harmless. To me, a half weeb, that's kind of cringe. It's kind of cringe. But then we get on to the full weeb. You know what, I might even put the half weeb in the whack playlist. Because if the half weeb, I don't know, man. I don't know, man. There's some half weebs that are giga cringe. But they won't consider themselves. You know what, I'm gonna put half weeb in kind of cringe. Half weeb is kind of cringe. Bot- towards the bottom of kind of cringe, but kind of cringe. Not as bad as the uh, hiding being bald guy or the sports fan, but better than... Oh, wait, w- worse worse than the cinephile, but better than the public complainer. But then we get on to the full weeb. And to me, I think you need a different... Like, personally, I think you need... A, I know this is just because this is my particular autism, but I think you need a different category of type of guy depending on what anime they're into, right? Like, you need a, the shonen full weeb, the seinen, like, like artsy, or like the... So, like, you have a shonen full weeb, then you have a, like, anime elitist full weeb, and then you have a, like, moe full weeb, and then you have a, like, just watches everything and generally enjoys everything kind of full weeb. You know, there's, like, four different types. you got the shonen type of guy, right, who's watched every shonen and is really into Vinland Saga, probably. Then you got the, um, the elitist kind of guy. This is, like, what he's, like, anime was best in the 80s OVA era, has probably watched a thousand shows, but has a really cares about making sure that his mean score on my anime list is a five-ish. Like, tries to make sure to give a lot of negative reviews to balance the score out. Has put way too much time into his 3x3 to make sure it's, like, full of shows that you that will, like, impress people. Um, you know, that's the, the, the sort of elitist kind of guy. Hates isekai. Then you've got the watches everything and gives everything a seven type of guy. I met a guy, a kind of guy like this. I went to uni with a kind of guy like this. He had watched like 200 anime and his mean score was a seven point something. Like this guy just generally liked everything. As opposed to the elitist kind of guy, this guy fucking loves isekai. This guy loves it. He watches it all the time. He's not likely to shit on isekai. But if you show him an 80s OVA, he'll think it's sick. I don't know what to think about this kind of guy. Like they don't have very discerning taste, but they don't You know, and they might like stuff I don't like, but they also like the stuff I do like. So it's like, I don't know. What do you do about that guy? I don't know, but they definitely exist. And then the final one is the Moe Otaku. And this is like the most degen, the most degenerate otaku, of course. And that's obviously the homie. That would be the first the homie. But I think if we're going to average them out, the full weeb, the full weeb is kind of cringe. The most common full weeb is is cringe. They're going to be like, I don't know. I don't know, man. I don't know what the... Because the, it's not just the anime, the average anime fan. I know the average anime fan has shit taste and is incredibly cringe and embarrassing, right? But this is beyond the average anime fan. This is the average full weeb. What does that mean? What is the average full weeb like? Is the average full weeb Giguk? I think that might be the case. I think the average full weeb is Giguk, which is kind of cringe. <laughs> Damn. I think the average full weeb is Giguk. That's kind of cringe, man. Oof. That's like pretty cringe. I think the half, like the problem with the half weeb is that I get in trend, I get viscerally annoyed with with the situation when I mention that I like anime and then someone says, oh, you like, bro, I love anime. Have you ever seen? And then they name the like most obvious shonen ever. You know, like, oh, bro, I, I, I had this happen to me once in uni, for example. Like, I had an anime sticker on my laptop. So, oh, you like anime? Actually, this wasn't in uni. This was the year before I went to uni. Um, you like anime? Bro, have you ever seen Excel Saga? I'm like, oh, my God. And this guy fucking loved Excel Saga. I mean, good for him. But, <laughs> like, if you call yourself, if you say you like anime, like, if you're like, I don't know, man. I don't think you, because anime is a medium, not a genre. Like, that's why this whole thing is fucked up. So, like, if you're really into shonen stuff, like, the popular, the most popular seasonal Malchart stuff, like, I think you're way more cringe than someone who's into Moe, because that stuff is aimed at, like, 14-year-olds. 
It's like being really into YA novels, you know? It's the same thing. It's the same thing as being really into YA novels. If you're an anime elitist, I don't know. At least I can have fun arguments with you. Like, at, at the very least, we can have fun arguments. But it depends kind of, I don't know. Am I an anime elitist? I'm a moe elitist. It's slightly different. I'm not here saying, like, uh, Gunsmith Cats is the best thing ever made or whatever. Gundam, oh, Gundam's fine. Gundam fans are their own breed. I like Gundam. Shout out Gundam fans. But, um, yeah, if you're, like, a full weeb in the anime elitist category and you're out here, like, um, you know, I don't want to watch any of that modern shit. Let me watch Galaxy Express 999 for the 10th time. You know, that's fucking whack. That's the whack playlist. That's equally whack as being, like, uh, you know, uh, oh, yeah, I've, you know, you you have, you have, it's, like, equally whack as being a full-time ironic weeb. Like Gigguk, right? Like that. There's Gigguk, whack. There's the '80s anime elitist guy, incredibly fucking whack. Both of those guys are in the whack playlist. I'm gonna put this in the whack playlist. I can't believe it. I'm doing my weeb brothers dirty. But then there's also the just genuinely likes every show he sees kind of guy, and that guy's harmless. And then there's the me Moe Otaku, who's the homie. So it's like there's so many different types of full weeb. It's hard to put them all in one category, but if I had to average them out, it's all coming down to Gigguk, and Gigguk is whack. So I think it all ends up in the whack playlist, which is painful for me to say. It's painful, but I have to do it. Okay, next up is Always Kidding. Guy who always has, a, always holds himself a joke's distance away from you. This guy's fucking whack. I hate this guy. Next up is Fantasy Footballer. I know that means something different in the US football. Um, I don't, I don't know this kind of guy. I'm just going to not do that one. Says females unironically, jail, easy, easy jail, grow up, um, easy jail, but with the very slight, okay, this guy, you, you, maybe this is extremely controversial, this, this guy who says females unironically is 99.99% of the time, jail, but in that 0.01% of the time, he's the most fucking based guy you've ever met, but, but I can't, I can't, I can't explain why, um, but anyway, I'm putting them in jail. Another one that they didn't cover on the podcast, quiet but always invited. I, I don't know who the fuck that... I don't, I don't interact with enough people to be aware of this. Competitive gamer, harmless. It depends. League, kind of cringe. Valorant, kind of cringe. Overwatch, kind of cringe. CSGO, harmless. Depends. NA is very different. In EU, I feel like, yeah, depends what game. Like the popular, you know, like Valorant, Overwatch, League, Dota. Actually, I don't know about Dota cringe right maybe starcraft is harm i think almost kind of based because like who plays starcraft anymore you know um like tf2 competitive gamer harmless almost kind of based csgo competitive guy the average competitive csgo player is like kind of cringe to be honest i don't know i gotta put these guys in kind of cringe incel that's the homie of course <laughs> um i don't know incels i can't put them in harmless but i think i'm just gonna put them in it depends. It depends what meaning of incel. If we're talking old school incel, back when I, back, you know, when I was repping, you know, I feel like that's just cringe. Maybe even whack. But we're talking modern, like Andrew Tate, fresh and fit incel, that's jail. Like, that's way worse. I don't know. I, I feel a lot of sympathy towards incels. I think that they've been abandoned by society. So I, I'm just going to put them in, I want to put them in kind of cringe. I think, I think incels are slightly worse than half weaves. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah next up is furry kind of based furries are kind of based and this is interesting right because the thing is the furry this is the big difference that kind of fucked me up while i was watching the yard and made me want to actually do this is that they put furries in kind of base too they put furries in kind of base too man isn't that crazy the like the fucking redemption arc that furries have had it's insane it's insane the redemption arc that furries have had and the reason is, I think, that furries are way more homogenous as a culture than anime is. Because being a furry and being a weeb is kind of the same sort of category of thing. But, like, furries, they all kind of get along. You know what I mean? On their particular subject. Whereas weebs, you know, I just went on, like, a big rant about how most weebs are retards and only the guys who like the exact same kind of anime I like are based, right? I just went on that big long rant. I don't think furries would do that. Like, furries are generally amicable to each other. 
That's why furries are kind of based, I feel like. But you go back a few years in internet history, you go back 10 years, there was so much furry hate, and you have to wonder why. Because I know some cringe furries, but I also know some based furries. I feel like being a furry doesn't have that much effect on your personality. I don't know, I gotta put it in kind of based. I don't want to put it in kind of based. I mean, I do want to put it, no. The only reason I don't want to put it in kind of based is because I put the full weeb in whack, the whack playlist, right? But that's because the full weeb, I, I reasoned, the average full weeb is Giguk. And Giguk is the whack playlist. Definition of the whack playlist is Giguk. Or Dog VA. Like, the trash taste viewer is like the average full weeb. And like, those guys, they should probably be death penalty even, right? But obviously I can't put full weeb down in death penalty. Because full weeb encompasses much more than just those guys. There's also... The anime elitist who's kind of cringe, the guy who just likes everything, who's harmless, and the moe otaku who's the homie, you know? Whereas furries are just furry. Like, some of them are into weird, weird sex shit, which is weird. You know, on the yard, they were like, they were, they were, they were digging into the lolly shit, right? They were saying like, um, you know, being a full weeb is like dangerously close to being a lolly defender, and lolly defenders are in the death penalty category. But then, they put furry in kind of base. I don't know if you guys were around for it, but the whole reason that furries were considered cringe in the first place is because they did a lot of that shit, right? They did a lot of weird porn. That's kind of their whole thing, is weird porn. Like, I think it's a little strange to forgive zoo stuff, or like, as an example, a lot of furries into MLP. MLP porn has a kind of a fucking reputation. Let's just say that when it comes to certain characters. I don't know. I think it's a little hypocritical, but I don't have a problem with any kind of porn you're into. So furries, kind of based, whatever. But there's a particular kind of furry, which is the gay Nazi furry, who's incre- like fucking jail, incredibly cringe. One of the worst types of people you'll ever meet on the internet is the gay Nazi furry. I don't know what's going on with gay Nazi furries, but those are the worst kind of guy. You don't want to be around gay Nazi furries. But those are just like their particular little niche. It's kind of a different thing from the wider furry community, I think. I think the gay Nazi furry is like a very specific kind of guy that is not included in the general furry category. Um, Huge Flake. Huge Flake is, is, is fucking, fucking whack. But it's at the top of whack. It's, it's whack. Let's be real. Triple A Gamer, whack. I don't know what, a Ringler is just a Smash player that I don't, I don't know who they are, so I'm just not gonna... I'm just not going to rate the Ringler, because that's just a Smash player that I'm not aware of. Rave Glover. Oh, bro, that's jail. <laughs> Fucking what's going on with those guys? Weed personality, highly whack in 2023. Forgivable, maybe, in 2010. Like, just cringe, kind of cringe in 2010. Whack playlist, towards the bottom of whack playlist in 2023. Uber Eats target demo. This means someone who orders Uber Eats for every meal. Um, I think they're harmless. Uh, depends how rich they are. If you're really rich and you can afford to do that, that's perfectly fine. If you're broke and you can't afford to do that, I think you're just stupid. But that doesn't mean you're cringe. You're just kind of dumb. Crypto guy real. Someone who actually truly believes in crypto. I think you're still whack. I think you're less whack than the gambler. No, I think you're equally whack with the gambler. Yeah. Realtor bro. Jail. Always on a boat. I... (laughs) Who the fuck is always on a boat? People who live on a boat. People who live on a boat are fine. I I don't know what this means. I'm not gonna... You know what, I'm just going to change the meaning of always on a boat. I know the American meaning is like on a yacht or something. You know, the boat, I, like I understand that there's some sort of like implication with that. That doesn't really exist here, or at least I'm not familiar with anyone who's like that. So instead, I'm going to switch this to mean people who live on a boat. And that's kind of based, but I'm going to put them in harmless. Never gets drunk, always drinking. Kind of based, kind of based. Coke guy, fucking whack playlist. Weirdly handy, whack playlist. Honda Civic with anime stickers. This is another thing they brought up. Because to me, when I hear car with anime stickers, I'm like, oh, you mean like Itasha guys? Like you've got a big fucking eroge full car wrap? That's the homie right there. That's extremely based. That would be the homie. But they brought up images on the yard and they're talking like super cringe. They're talking, you got Anya, you got a little decal on your window. It's like a tiny little Anya decal or something. That's fucking cringe. We're putting that guy in kind of cringe. Apple hater, harmless. Zelda tattoo guy, harmless. Barefoot or sandals, again, we're putting them in harmless. Cod adult, whack. Patagonia Peter didn't, oh yeah. Oh, these are, now, that was it. That was the last one. The rest of these we don't know. 
these are the, these are the ones that I, I, I don't have a reference point for. Um, no one was in the homie. There was not a single homie. Uh, the most based was extremely nice but not funny, furry, and never gets drunk, always drinking. Damn. And the only guy in death penalty was the Elon fan. It's tempting to put only watches the office in death penalty though. Um, yeah, those are, those are, those are the, that's the type of guy tier list. It pains me to say it, but the, the fucking, you know what the name of this Audacity project is? The name of this Audacity project that I'm recording into right now is Fuck Anime. Dot A-U-P, okay? And we're really sticking by this, okay? Fuck anime. Fuck weebs. They go in cringe, they go in whack, okay? I don't, I, I, you know what? I think I should just distance my, I'm not a, I'm not a weeb. I'm not an anime fan, and I'm not a weeb. I'm a moe otaku. That's what I'm just, I'm just gonna be like, I'm not even the same class of thing as these guys, so that I can just distance myself from it. So I'm like, I'm not, you know, there's nothing, I'm nothing like these guys. I, I've, I'm, I'm, I'm a moe otaku, completely different thing. There's, there's a, actually I want to say two things. First thing I want to say is, maybe there's a little harsh rating types of guy. I think the thing I didn't account for, I mean, the point, it's all stupid anyway. I shouldn't actually care. But there's something I didn't actually account for, which is that it's possible to be so cringy wrap around to being based. What's interesting is that Furry seems to have done this in popular consciousness, given that the Yard guys are giga normies, right? Well, they're not actually giga normies, but they're normies compared to you and I. They're Smash players, so they're like less normie than normies, but they're normies compared to us, right? Anyway, well, maybe, I don't know, whatever. They're able to have social stuff. But they think that furries are based now. Like, furries have been cringe for long enough that it's wrapped around to become based. So, there's definitely other people on this list that that might apply to, but whatever. Second thing I want to say, short, just quickly, is there's apparently a tomato shortage in the UK right now. I actually haven't noticed this. Firstly, I don't eat tomatoes, but Dotesmite does. And I've ordered tomatoes multiple times during this quote-unquote tomato shortage, and they've come. So, I don't know what the fuck that's about. But uh, the fact that we have tomatoes in the middle of fucking winter is, like, crazy anyway. The, 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 it's so dumb to complain. I don't know. Like, this isn't, oh, no, the supply chains are breaking down. Oh, no, it's so fucking crazy. We don't, my tomatoes, in my off-season vegetables and fruits. Yeah, like, you're not supposed to have tomatoes in the goddamn winter. What are you talking about? Like, it's not surprising that once in a while you wouldn't get them because, you know, they're not supposed to exist in the first place. <laughs> Sit, stop complaining. If it, it would be fucked up if there were no tomatoes in tomato season. It would be weird if there were no... You know what would be a problem if there were, like... If there were no potatoes. If there were, was no flour. That would be a problem. No tomatoes? We can fucking live without tomatoes. Come on, what are you complaining about? Like, oh, the, 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 the economy is collapsing. The supply chains are collapsing. Not even true. It's just that the place we normally get tomatoes from had a bad harvest. Sometimes places have bad harvests. That's how agriculture works. I know that we've forgotten that agriculture is still a real thing because we all live far away from where the food comes from. I don't know why I'm complaining about this. Bro, I literally had fish for breakfast like 10 fucking hours ago. Actually, how long ago was it? We can probably figure it out. It probably was 10. I was saying 10 hours ago, but it probably literally was 10 hours ago. Let me see. My point is, I'd fish for breakfast 10 hours ago, and i still be fucking burping, and my burps, they still be tasting like goddamn fish. What the hell is this? I woke up 11 hours ago, so yeah, it sounds about right, 10 hours ago, maybe 9 hours ago. Damn, what the fuck is this? I had a smoked mackerel and poached eggs for breakfast. Good breakfast, recommend. Man, I've been eating, like, so fucking weird because I'm depressed as shit. This is just what happens when you're depressed as shit is you eat weird. I've been eating, like, tiny shitty meals instead of proper meals. Oh, God. You know, I think I have to hold myself to the... Hold on a minute now. Like, let's not let my YouTube channel get too good thing. I think I talked about this at some point in, like, one of the previous podcasts that maybe I didn't even release because I once recorded a podcast, like, the one you're listening to right now, and it got to like five hours in and then I just deleted it because I realized it was absolute dog shit and it was probably not much worse than this one like this one's also pretty fucking bad but I'm just gonna post it anyway maybe I don't know like the previous ones they had a gimmick right like they had a gimmick 
you know? Fucking, hold on a second. Shut up, me. Uh, fucking, hold on. God fucking damn it. No, I don't want to fucking, oh my god. Okay, there we go. Correct button. Like, we had, the two previous ones was, the first one had the sort of very, it was very, um, planned out in different segments, right? It was, it was fucking, you know, it had the little bits to it. It had the, the digi daily clip style show stuff, right? That was back to back. It was like that. And then the second one, it was like 12 hours, which is kind of a, a fun gimmick in itself, right? But this one doesn't have a gimmick. This one's just nothing. So I don't know. I don't know what's going on here exactly. That's why I deleted the other one, maybe. I don't know. But also, it's like, do my videos have to be good? No. No, they don't have to be good. My videos don't have to be good. You, you, no one's coming here for good videos. Let's be honest here. Let's be honest with ourselves here. No one's coming here for good video. Look, I'm just not talking right. Anyway, the reason I brought that up is because I keep debating with myself whether I want to do this um, laying around watching video. Because I've made a couple of these, right? I've made a couple of these these laying around watching videos, which is obviously based on, just like everything else I do is based on a digi thing. Man, I, is this video still being, oh, whatever, who cares? About um, let me see if I can fucking find an example of that. Wait, let me see, laying around, let me look it up. Okay, so I've done laying around watching every summer 2021 anime until I stop complaining, but that's just with normal, I watch the first anime of every season, but I did, Kaito Tenji Twin Angels, and I did Sasami-san with Osaka when they were here. I thought I, I thought I'd done more than that, huh? But anyway, I kind of want to watch this terrible-looking show, which is called Sendan Kagura. Uh, <clears throat> it looks fucking like a terrible fan service show. Um, but for some reason, it, something in my mind is telling me to watch it. But I don't think I'll be able to get through it unless I'm making it, like, I feel like making it into content. I don't know. I don't know why I'm even... Wait a minute. I, I, I just started to watch Senran Kagura. Sen Dan? Senran Kagura. I've definitely seen the first episode of this before. And... Oh, I wasn't logged in? To Mao? Wait, what? I dropped this before. Yeah, I reckon... I remember this. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. Because I was watching the first episode and I was like, this seems oddly familiar. Is it just that generic or have I seen this before? But no, I uh, I have seen it before. I dropped it and gave it a one after one episode, which I think is a rating I would stick with, quite frankly. Yes, this is absolute dog shit. Why did I want to watch this? I don't know. Um, anyone, anyone here excited for the next anime season? Looks like we're going to have a pretty good season ahead of us. Um, we've got some dog shit, Kimetsu no Yaiba, who gives a fuck about that? But, some good shit. We got season three of Dr. Stone, should be mid. Uh, but then we got the Megumin spin-off, based. We got the, uh, the, the second season of Smartphone Isekai, I will be watching that. We've got Isekai Shokan wa Nidome desu. Which looks like the, like from the thumbnail, it looks like the world's most generic harem isekai. But I'm definitely going to watch that, because fuck it. I want to make my in defense of isekai shit, you know, video that I've had an idea for for a while, anyway. Boku no Kokoro no Yabai Yatsu, that looks good. Um, uh, fucking, there was another one. Yusha ga Shinda, that looks good. Uh, Watashi no Yuri wa Oshikoto desu, that looks good. <coughs> um... Megami no Cafe Terrest, that looks good. Um, and I think there was, oh yeah, G maybe, the art, I really don't like the art style of this show, but Jijo wa Shiranai Tenkose ga Gui Gui Kuru, I don't know, that's strange. And Edomai Elf, that looks good, Edomai Elf. Yeah, yeah. Man, what did I even watch last season? I've really fallen off with anime, I think anime is just bad. Literally the only thing I'm watching is Onimai, and I'm not even caught up with it. You know, I never even finished Bochi the Rock. I watched, like, I, I haven't dropped it. I just haven't gone around to finishing it yet. I watched eight episodes and then never go around to finishing it. It's kind of annoying. But anime, you know, I go in phases. I go in phases. Wait, was Bofuri season two this now? What the fuck? Bofuri season two? Bofuri season two moment? I might just read the manga of this 
I might just pick up the Bofuri manga, to be honest. Because I'm way more manga pulled than I was when I first watched Bofuri. <sighs> yeah, I might just read the Bofuri manga, actually. That's kind of a good idea. It has a manga, right? Adaptation. Right, does it not? Ha- it doesn't have a manga? Hold on a second. Bofuri manga. Uh, this looks like a Bofuri manga. But I don't know if this is an actual Bofuri manga. I don't know. Maybe I won't. Maybe I'll just watch the show. Should I watch that now? This is now laying around watching Bofuri season 2. <laughs> I changed my mind. I'm not in the mood to watch anime right now. I haven't been in the mood to watch anime for like months. Not properly. I don't know why. Normally I've just relied, I've relied on like once in a while, I'll just get into a super anime mood and I'll watch like three shows in a day, every day for like a week. But I think that's when I'm manic as fuck. And right now I'm depressed as fuck. What if, what if Kanye was never that good? Has anyone, has anyone considered this? What if Kanye was never that good? I feel like I just, I just saw a video. I don't know, man. I saw a video that was just, there's apparently there's a joke in a South Park episode where Kanye's in the South Park episode and they make some dumb joke where they're making a pun on fish sticks as fish dicks with him in it. And apparently Kanye did not like that joke. And he's written like three different songs which have lyrics in them about the South Park fish sticks joke. That's pretty cringe, man. If you're triggered by that for like a decade by a South Park joke, come on, man. I mean, how did we not see that he was going to start going off about the Jews earlier, you know? You know what I'm saying? Like, that is the type of guy that does that. I'm glad that this is like kind of picking up some steam with Giga Autists. You know, okay, I'm going to I'm going to mention something. I'm going to mention something, but I just want to say that just because I'm mentioning one particular part of this does not mean that I support the whole thing. Um so in Nick Land's The Dark Enlightenment, he mentions that like people avoid talking about certain things because like it's so nothing's worse than coming off as obnoxious, you know? Like, there's a lot of stuff that's really obvious, or true, or correct, but people don't want to come off as obnoxious. I don't remember what example- he's probably just saying, like, complaining about black people. people I don't know, he's- he's that fucking whole- the, the, that whole fucking thing is retarded. But, like, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of people who are saying there's the new, like, anti-car walkable cities sentiment that is showing up big time in certain parts of the internet right? Which is based. And then there's definitely some people who aren't particularly self-aware doing this, who, you know, bring it up way too often. as it, Or, like, bring it up in situations where it's like, yeah, but I know I also wish that the fucking... I didn't have to drive to work through traffic. I, of, of course, but, like, let's... Like, I can't do anything about it, so what's the fucking point in bringing... Yeah, you know? But here's, here's a couple other examples. is like, horoscopes being bad. That's something that's true. And yet, for some reason, you're obnoxious if you bring it up. Um, like being wrong about stuff is not just harmless. Being wrong about stuff is dangerous. Uh, and then, um, here's another thing, right? With the, and I think if you start bringing this up a lot, people are going to call you obnoxious. But it's true, and I think we need to be bringing this up more. Which is fucking cats. We gen- Unironically, I know this is, this is going to sound crazy. Unironically... We need to start culling cats in the Western world. Cats are the number one killers of birds and small wildlife. They are a fucking invasive species. They're ridiculously efficient murderers who just do it for no reason. It's not like they're hunting for food. They just kill because they have hunting instincts and they just leave the carcass. They don't eat it. But they're really efficient killing machines. They're arguably the small cats, the arguably the best not necessarily the domestic small cats, but small cats as a general family are arguably the most effective hunters on the planet. Uh, And if you're wondering, like, they kill birds. They fucking decimate the bird population. It's bad. People don't talk about it. There's probably a lot of money from uh, the pet industry to try and get people to not talk about it. But, uh, like, cats kill literally billions of birds every year. Uh, let me look it up, actually. How many birds killed by cats in the U.S.? 
2.4 billion birds. Outdoor cats kill approximately 2.4 billion birds every year. If you have an outdoor cat, kill yourself. Well, kill your cat first. Uh, just, you should not have, an, there's no excuse ever for having an outdoor cat. Uh, you shouldn't do it. It's not acceptable. We need to start, we need to start pressuring people. This is not, it's not acceptable to have an outdoor cat. You can't say, well, but it's so cute or whatever. If it's c contributing for no reason, you get no benefit out of it to decimating wild bird and small animal populations like rabbits and stuff like that. Now, I understand the appeal. If you're um, a farmer with a mice problem or a rat problem, I understand the appeal. I still don't think it's, it's uh, actually that effective. Uh, it's not as effective as just effective traps and poison. That is more effective at killing rats and mice than cats are. Maybe. I don't know. I may have just made that up. But it feels like it might be equally effective. I should probably look that up. You know what? Let's just reset. Let's just pretend I never said that. Because I, I just started talking out of my ass for a second. And that kind of made me sound stupid. So let's just assume that even if cats are better than traps. Uh, not an excuse. Not a goddamn excuse. Maybe it was an excuse a hundred years ago. It's not an excuse anymore. If you own an outdoor cat... I don't care how cute it is, you are literally a bird murderer <laughs> for no reason. Like, this is a serious ecological problem. This isn't like some little, you know, I don't, I don't know why more environmental campaigners don't talk about this. Like, this is legitimately the number one problem for bird conservation in America is, is fucking outdoor cats. It's the number one biggest problem. And yet, for some reason, big, big fucking pet lobbies don't want you to know. They don't want you to know. Just get a goddamn dog, man. <laughs> or just keep your cat indoors. Plenty of people have indoor cats. It's fine. You can just have an indoor cat if you really, really desperately need a cat. And then you can just catch mice if you really need that. Just don't let it outside. These motherfuckers are murderers. They have an invasive species. It doesn't matter that they're a pet, you know? Like, I'm, it's the amount of liberals, man, they love to convince themselves. And it's not just liberal, I say liberals, but it's, it's, it's everyone. Everyone loves to convince themselves that they don't have to do anything. That, like, uh, they couldn't possibly be wrong about anything. Uh, especially with regards to climate change. So, like, there was a big push in the 80s to switch climate change over to being some sort of problem of personal responsibility. Like, well, it's your fault for not recycling and for not doing blah 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 right and now there's been a big valid pushback against that to say hold on just a hundred companies are responsible for 70 percent of the global emissions like we can't cycle to work every day because you have built car dependent infrastructure with no cycle infrastructure so we can't do that uh you know and even been pushed back against banning nuclear power right like there's there's a there's now this pushback of like well actually no it's not necessarily my fault uh, it's kind of the fault of the government and corporations working hand in hand, uh, and so on. And like, hey, turns out plastic recycling has never actually been a thing uh, at all. It was basically just a marketing strategy. Um, but I think that's gone too far in this other direction. That like, this idea that we can solve ecological problems uh, without changing our lifestyles in any significant way. It's just not true. If... Because, you know, in my opinion, climate change probably isn't actually, like, climate change itself isn't actually the number one problem, ecological problem, we're going to face. The number one ecological problem, in my opinion, is resource scarcity. That eventually we will run out of coal and we will run out of oil and so on. And climate change will make, with effects such as desertification, and topsoil depletion are going to make growing food harder, and so on, right? You have all of these things. And, uh, uh, you know, it's not just that the temperature's getting hotter and that the polar bears are dying. It's that we're going to run out of fucking oil one day. Uh, and we will run out of oil one day. Uh, and by that I mean, uh, we won't actually run out of oil, because there's a shitload of oil. It's just that we've, we will have run out of easily accessible oil. Fracking you know, extended the sort of peak oil thing further than it was originally going to. But it seems like we've probably, or it's it's possible that we've even hit peak oil back in 2019. Uh, it's possible. Some people say it's possible. Uh, 
and it, this just means the oil is going to be more and more and more expensive, right? It, and that they're going to have to look for harder and harder to access sources of oil. And yeah, that's going to drive the price up, which is going to make energy more expensive for everyone. And when we're and in a disaster situation, it means that uh, we will run out of oil faster than we can transition to renewables because um, upkeeping and making those renewables depends on industrial processes, which themselves are dependent on non-renewable resources, right? Like the majority of pressure to switch to renewable energy is happening in the sort of public facing side of things, right? People, individuals switching to electric cars, homes being more efficient, these sorts of things. But there is very little being done to change the industrial side of, of the equation. Um, so like you may be able to order solar panels right now, but the solar panel production depends on mining and manufacturing operations, which themselves are not anywhere close to being able to transition to renewable. You know what I'm saying? So like that's a problem and you will eventually run out of easily accessible lithium you will eventually run out of easily accessible fossil fuels you will eventually run out of easily accessible so on and so on right and so it seems likely that we're not going to be as energy rich as we are right now at some point that we might have to lower our energy consumptions and that's going to mean changing your lifestyle and letting go of some stuff that you like uh, or not and you can just be poor there's going to be that option too you can maintain your lifestyle and just be broke because energy will still be available. It will just be expensive. But energy and resources aside, you know, there, like there's still no reason for the conspicuous consumption of fucking cats. I hate cats. Like they're cute, but that doesn't mean that they're good. They're evil. Everyone knows they're evil. It's like a meme that they're evil, but they're actually evil. Like they're actually a fucking blight on the ecology. We got to get rid of outdoor cats. Let me tell you an extremely random fact that is basically null and void of, of informational content about me, no thank you, your host. Um, after Macklemore's thrift shop blew up, but before the next Macklemore song became popular, which I don't know what it's called, I'm gonna look it up. It goes like this. It, oh, it's called Can't Hold Us. It goes, I all I remember is it goes like, um... The beginning of the the rap verse is fucking awful, and it goes like, Return of the Mag. So what it is, what it is, what it is, what it isn't. Looking for a better way to get it, but a 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 but a. It's that one, right? Can't hold us, which apparently has a billion views right now. So in 2013, at some point, the point is, after Thrift Shop blew up, I hope I'm correct about this. Um. I might be wrong about this, actually, now that I'm looking into this. But basically, my point is, after Thrift Shop blew up, but before Can't Hold Us was on the radio everywhere, I had heard the song and knew about it because I'd seen it in a parkour video that my friend who did parkour had showed me. That's the stupid piece of information, is that I, I knew about Macklemore's song Can't Hold Us before it was super popular. I don't, I don't know why I told you that, but man, we're really scraping the bottom of the barrel here for anecdotes. <sighs> for some reason, God knows why. God knows why. Allah knows why. I decided to, I know what I'll do. I'm depressed. I can't pay attention to anything because I'm depressed. I can't pay attention to anything complex. I need something that will just entertain me just to pass the time without requiring a single brain cell. I know. Marvel movies. That'll fucking do it, right? I don't want to watch a movie because I can't, I tried, I can't pay attention, I can't, you know, pass it properly. But if I can't watch a movie, I can watch a cape shit, which isn't really, you know, it's like its own thing. And so I decided to put on Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. Now I know this is the fucking problem, right? This is the problem, is that if I were to now make this and say, I even Marvel is so oversaturated and everyone is so over it, including me. Every like even hating on it is like passe, right? Even if I sit here and explain to you 
what I genuinely think, which is I'm 27 minutes and 35 seconds into this movie, and I think so far it is genuinely one of the worst movies I've ever seen. Uh, I think it fails on every level. That's, like, I'm not exaggerating. I think it is genuinely one of the worst movies I've ever seen so far, 27 minutes in. Even that opinion, it's like, okay, you don't get any points for hating on Marvel. Everyone hates Marvel. It would be like, you know, watching The Room and saying this movie is bad. Of course it's bad. But that doesn't stop me from sitting here and saying to you, I'm glad that I stopped watching fucking Marvel movies, you know, however many years ago at this point, because they're fucking dog shit. And they've got, like, it's not just burnout. This is the weird thing about it, is that it's not just, but a lot of people just attribute it to burnout. No, no, the movies just, the movies were never that good, but some of them were, like, decent, right? Like, I think Iron Man 1, it's not the best movie ever, but it's, like, a decent action thing, right? Uh, The Guardians of the Galaxy, like, that one's fine. You know, the ones that everyone basically says is fine. Like, that one's fine. Uh, There's that one Thor movie that's probably fine. I forget which one it is, but there's one that's, like, fine, kind of, like, the comedy for, I don't remember, but yeah. It's not great. It's not even necessarily good, but it's fine. It's passable. You know, like, they they were making not great, but decent movies with a unique kind of gimmick, which is they have infinite money and they're all interconnected and part of this grand storyline, right? Like, they, they were, they were something. This is nothing. This is fucking, like, a parody of a parody of a Marvel film. Is this just what they became? I guess so. WandaVision, for example. WandaVision was genuinely good for the first two episodes. It was kind of good. It wasn't amazing, but it was kind of good for the first, like, two episodes, in my opinion. And that's the last Marvel thing I actually watched, by the way, was WandaVision. And then after WandaVision just ended by turning into a Marvel thing, that's when I decided to stop watching Marvel things. I don't, you know what, I'm going to look up all the Marvel movies um, so I can see at what point I stopped. Uh, Oh, it might have been the Spider-Man No Way Home. Uh, Okay, so I watched Infinity War. I watched Endgame. I skipped Ant-Man and the Wasp because the first Ant-Man movie was unwatchably bad. I skipped Captain Marvel for obvious reasons. I tried to watch Spider-Man Far From Home and couldn't get through it because it was so bad. I skipped Black Widow for obvious reasons. I watched Shang-Chi and I thought that the first, like, half of Shang-Chi was pretty good and then it went to absolute dog shit by the end. Like, the second half of Shang-Chi is absolutely fucking unwatchably bad. I skipped The Eternals, obviously. I watched Spider-Man No Way Home and I thought it was completely forgettable. Um... And now I'm watching Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, and I think it's one of the worst movies I've ever seen. Uh, And I haven't seen any of these other ones. Uh, Yeah. No, the Marvel, they're not very good, are they? These films. They're not particularly great. I don't know, don't know why people, yeah, now that I look back at it, which ones of these are actually good? I don't know. (laughs) I think the first Guardians of the Galaxy isn't too bad, right? Like, that one's kind of not bad. Um... Yeah, I don't know. What a weird fucking moment blip in hist- in in cinema history when everyone was just watching these stupid fucking movies. I'm so glad that they are just dying now. I think their goal, here's my opinion. Their goal is to just try and tank, right? I think what they're going to try and do is up until 2025, they're just going to be trying to tank the damage because all of these movies like, no one's gonna watch them. But the, I guess Disney Plus streaming revenue, they're just gonna hope and pray that Disney Plus streaming revenue can carry them through up until the next, like, big event Avengers film, which will be called, like, the Avengers whatever. Actually, it will be called Avengers the Kang Dynasty. Um, and then they're gonna hope that that does well, but it won't do well. And then, depending on that, they will film, like, a a final Avengers film. Or they'll just, like, slowly keep making them and they'll just keep getting worse until eventually they die a painful death. I don't know which one will happen. Um, yeah, this discourse is very out of date. Everyone already talked about this three years ago and solved it. I don't know why I'm talking about this now. Like, it, all, it feels cringe for me to even be talking about it. It feels cringe for me to be bringing up how much these movies suck because I feel like the fact that these movies suck and no one watches them was already discussed three years ago, and, like, everyone came to the same conclusion, and now it's, like, 
it kind of sounds like I'm coming to this conclusion later than everyone else. But, like, I fell off of Marvel movies fucking way back in, like, I mean, I never liked them that much, but I, like, fell off them pretty much completely way back in 2015-ish because I thought Age of Ultron was bad and then I thought Ant-Man was bad and then I thought Captain America Civil War was bad. Like, I watched those back-to-back. They all sucked. And that was that was when I just sort of gave up and I was like, okay, I'm never going to, like, pay attention to this again. But... I don't know, I'm gonna keep watching this stupid fucking movie just to make fun of it in my own head. The problem is it's not even bad in any interesting way, it's just like, soulless and awful, <laughs> and grey. If, if this movie was a colour, it would be grey, because it's just bland, it's just tasteless, it has nothing to it. Nothing has happened. Like, so much, wow, they fought a giant octopus and like, all this spectacle has happened, but nothing has happened emotionally. No, di- no real dialogue has been spoken. There's only words that have been spoken is exposition, which is just like, boom, boom, boom. Like, as unnatural as it could possibly be, no human speaks like this. Just like exposition, boom, 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 boom. Say the words just so that the audience has the bare understanding of what is happening in the action scenes. And then, like, uh, occasionally a quip so that the movie doesn't feel too serious. But the quips aren't funny or interesting or even reflect the characters in any way. They're just quips for the sake of keeping the tone, you know, light, even though the tone is nothing. There is no tone. There's nothing to this movie. There's no characters. There's no tone. There's no cinematography. There's nothing to this movie. This movie may as well not exist, but I'm going to keep watching it because I, I don't know. I hate myself, I guess. Okay. okay yeah. I, I, I can't watch this. I can't watch so bad. It's so How did this get made? How did this, how did these things? I can't watch this. It's so bad. Why did I think that would be? I forgot how bad they were. It's been so long since I saw a Marvel movie. But that one was especially fucking bad. Holy shit. What happened? What? How, how did he fumble the bag so badly? Martial arts action movies and John Wick. I think the John Wick movies are fine. The first one I would go, with, I would go ahead and say, okay, the John Wick mar- movies... They kind of vibe like really good YouTube action movie stuff. Like some of the like some of the early corridor digital or not like super early, mid period corridor digital stuff. Kind of, but better. Like the best version of that. Also, speaking of corridor digital, um I don't know. I have a couple of I don't know if I want to even talk about this, but now that I've brought it up, they made this this video, I don't know why I even care, called anime rock paper scissors apparently ba- the the point of the video is that they trained an ai to create anime styled versions of them and i think there's a couple of well there's one big problem with the video right which is that it sucks it's not funny or entertaining or very good uh the technology is cool i think uh, you know ap- apparently i don't use twitter anymore but apparently Animation people on Twitter are freaking out over this, um, where, like, they're saying, oh, animation is not a problem that needs to be solved with AI. Uh, but the thing is, if you're a small studio like Corridor Digital who can't afford to have fucking ha- Yes, animation is literally a problem. If you want to make an animated thing and your budget doesn't allow for it, that is le- legit. That is literally the definitionally a problem that needs to be solved. Um, and if you're saying it's cheating, I mean, that's you can say that. I guess I, it's meaningless. Art isn't a competition. However, if you want to say it looks bad, then be my guest. It does not look good. I don't think their video looks very good. What I found interesting is that they chose D. Gray Man as the anime to train the model on. So it all kind of looks like D. Gray Man, but not really. It doesn't look that much like anime in a lot of ways. It's a little strange. It's a little strange, but mainly the, 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 like as a tech demo, I think it's kind of neat, but as an actual short film, I think it sucks. Um, yeah, it's just not very good. And it, it, it yeah. Anyway, that's my opinion on that. But the, anyway, back to John Wick. John Wick really jumped the fucking shark, but it had already jumped, I don't know. Here's the, the, the first John Wick movie is really good, except for the middle of the movie. In the middle of the movie, there's a scene that no one else complains about, except for me, 
where it's like there's just a deus ex machina type of th- moment i guess you could call it where it's like john wick is tied to a chair with no way out and then there just so happens to be a sniper somewhere who just so happens to show up at just the right time to say like that's that kind of put me off the movie a little bit the second thing which i've heard other people complain about is the stupid subtitle font just have normal subtitles you don't have to i know american audiences hate subtitles it's so distracting when when american films have these like fucking over designed subtitles show up it pulls you out of the movie completely it's it's so distracting and ugly and terrible just have normal boring subtitles at the bottom of the screen so it doesn't get in the way of the filmmaking uh they continue to do that by the way to not really to have stupid anyway but the rest of that film's fine the ending's a little bit much i think the good part of the film is when he shows up and he kills the guy's son and he just goes boop he just sort of walks up boop uh, emotionless doesn't say anything no quips no nothing just walks up shot in the head walks away that's cool then they're like that would be anticlimactic so we have to have a big final fight scene that's all epic and that final fight scene isn't bad it's a good fight scene but it's not the highlight of the movie, in my opinion. It kind of feels like we're just waiting for the movie to be over at that point. I have no memory of the second John Wick film. They all kind of meld into each other. I think the second... Is the second one the one where they have silences that are, like, magical and so they're shooting in a public place but no one can hear them because of magical movie silences? I think so. The plots of these movies don't matter. The point is to watch Keanu Reeves do cool shit, but sometimes it just really... Like, the, I think th- there's a scene in the latest one which is, like, a big... I don't know. The, they they make him kill too many guys. This is the problem. It was cool when he was killing, like, ten guys at a time. That was, like... I could believe that the coolest guy could kill ten guys. Like, if the point is to have semi-realistic or, or um, you know, doable action, like, yeah, a really skilled guy could take down ten guys. You can't take down 50 guys with assault rifles if you just have a pistol. Like, no. That's too much. I like once they just start throwing insane amounts of guys at him. This is where I start to be like, okay, it starts to just put. It turns into just sort of noise to me. Cause it's just like bow, 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 bow. Break a break a fucking arm. Grab his gun. Reload. Bow, 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 bow. It's it just kind of turns into noise. And I think fewer, more drawn out fights would be better than the way they do it. Because the best fights in the franchise are the ones where. He's fighting like three guys, you know, or one on one. That's just my opinion. Controversial movie opinions. Two directors that I think are not bad per se, but overrated. The first one, which is the less controversial one, but still somewhat controversial. These days, it's a little less, is Christopher Nolan. Um, Christopher Nolan has made some good films, but has made... Majority mid films and a couple of really bad films. So just going through it, right? First of all, fucking um, Memento. Memento, great film. His best film. The reason Memento was good is that it's just a very solid crime film. Like a pretty basic, solid fundamentals crime film thriller thing with an interesting gimmick. But the gimmick is just flavor text over the solid fundamental he thinks the gimmick is what it's all about and he went hard on gimmick without backing it up the prestige i have never been able to make it through the prestige it's kind of a boring movie it's not that interesting i've tried to watch it twice and i have not been able to make it through there's nothing egregious about it it's just kind of boring um is this a list of all of his films oh that's producer Director, okay. Yeah, um, these are just the ones I've seen. I haven't seen Insomnia. Batman Begins is fine. It's like an average movie. It's fine. It has some good cool parts. It has some, not, you know, it's kind of just fine. Um, the Dark Knight is really good for the first third and then falls apart in the last act. That's my opinion. It's, it's, and this is a common Nolanism, right? Is that he has a film that's pretty good. Okay, I said it was really good. It's good. For the first two thirds. And then it it jumps the shark and falls apart for the final act of the movie. In my opinion. Inception? More like Midception. It's fine. But it's not an amazing film. It's just a... It's fine. It's a fun blockbuster action movie. But it's nothing crazy. It had a massive cultural impact. Because it has a cool gimmick. 
but as a movie, it's fine. And and then he fell off. He was never really on. He was never really on to begin with. That's my argument, right? Because a lot of people will say that he fell off. But in my opinion, he was never really on. He just made one pretty good film, which is Memento. The Dark Knight Rises is a fucking awful, atrocious film. That film sucks. Interstellar, I think the popular consensus is that it's good for the first two thirds and then the final act is terrible. Um, I think it's kind of not that good. It's like fine for the first two thirds and then the final act is terrible. And I saw that in theatres. So like I had the best experience you could possibly have for Interstellar. Yeah, I, I the first two acts are fine and then the final act is terrible. Uh, I never saw Dunkirk and Tenet was dog shit. So yeah, Christopher Nolan was mid at his peak, uh, you know, and then fell off from midness even into whackness. Okay, so that's my least controversial take, because now I'm about to hit you with, with a fucking, cr- with some shit that's gonna make you doubt my, doubt my sanity, okay? Another overrated director, Stanley Kubrick. Stanley Kubrick is massively fucking overrated, don't get me wrong, he's made some good movies, but he's so overrated. I don't know why people put him as like one of the greats of all time, I don't know, I don't get it. He made some good films. But they're not, like, none of his films are, like, that good, in my opinion. Like, I've seen, I've seen Lolita, I've seen Doctor Strangelove, I've seen 2001, I've seen A Clockwork Orange, I've seen The Shining, and I've seen Full Metal Jacket, okay? This opinion first came to me when I went back to watch The Shining, and I realized The Shining does not hold up. It is actually not a very good movie. It's not scary, it's not thrilling, it's not interesting, it's kind of mostly boring, and sucks. The Shining is not a good film. I'm sorry. I know it's like heralded as this masterpiece. I don't get it. I've seen it like three times. Once as a teenager, once as a little bit of an older teenager, and then once a couple of years ago. It doesn't hold- I don't know. It's just not that good. It's just not- I've tried to like it. It's just not that good. I don't understand. It's not- it's a horror movie that isn't scary. It's like a psychological movie that isn't psychological. It's it's just dumb. It's just a dumb movie that thinks it's smart. That's the thing with The Shining. It's kind of the thing with all of Kubrick's films, is they're dumb movies that think they're smart. Next, in my opinion, his best film is Clockwork Orange. Clockwork Orange is great, okay? I, it's, it's hard for me to say anything bad about Clockwork Orange, but what I will say is that, how do I put it? I don't think it's a bad film. I don't even think it's a mid film. I think it's a good film. But, narratively, it always leaves me... I've seen it twice. It leaves me kind of wanting for something. It feels like underdeveloped to me. Next, 2001 A Space Odyssey. Widely heralded as one of the best films of all time. I've also seen this multiple times, one of them in a cinema on a massive screen in 70 mil. The movie is so up its own ass. I don't get it. I don't, I don't get it. I'm sorry. It's not really an interesting commentary on anything in particular. Like, what's, there's no interesting commentary. There's no substance. Ooh, what if there was a guy who was spooky? That's basically what it, what if the computer was spooky? That's the, that's what it boils down to. What if there was a computer and it was spooky? I don't get it. The fucking, like, time brain warp scene with the trippy shit, that goes on for way too long. That goes on for way too fucking long. I get it, if you're on acid, it looks cool. And I, I, I'm sure in 1968, no one, no one had ever done anything like that, right? And back, back in 1968, just seeing pretty colors flying by was enough to entertain people, because no one had ever seen it before. But in 2023, it's, 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 it goes on for too long. We get the picture. It's way, and then the ending is like, I, I appreciate that he's trying to do something, but like, that's the best part of the movie. Is, is the very ending with the sort of abstract imagery. Like, that's kind of cool. But also, kind of, uh, I feel like it's, it thinks it's saying something about the next stage of human evolution or something like that. When in reality, it's not really making any particular statement other than presenting it. I don't think it's a great, great film. I'm sorry. The Shining is not very, it's not as bad as The Shining. Okay, The Shining is much worse. 2001 is much better than The Shining, but it's not great. I don't want to talk about Doctor Strangelove because I only watched it as a teenager. I haven't gone back to it in such a long time. I barely remember it. 
I remember thinking it was pretty good when I watched it, so, but I, it's been too long, I'm not going to talk about it. Same with Lolita, because I was just going through his whole discography, or not discography, filmography. I don't really remember, I, I watched it one day when I was a teenager, I don't remember what I thought. Now, Don't Smite thinks Paths of Glory is his best film. I haven't seen Paths of Glory, so I can't comment. Maybe it is. I don't know. But I think Stanley Kubrick's kind of mid. I'm sorry. Kind of mid. Oh, and Full Metal Jacket is pretty good. I liked Full Metal Jacket. That's the most... That's, I watched that fairly recently. I thought it was a pretty good film. I don't think it was amazing, but I think it was pretty good. Like, none of his... I, I, other than The Shining, which I think is a bad movie, I want to clarify. I don't think 2001 is a bad film. I think Clockwork Orange is a really good film. I think Full Metal Jacket is a good film. I don't really... I think Doctor Strange Love is probably a good film, although I don't remember it that well. And Lolita is probably a fine film, although I don't remember it that well. I, I think I remember it being kind of boring, but other than that, I don't really remember what happens. Um, like, none of these are... Only one of these is, like, a bad film. Having one bad film is not a big deal, right? Even if everyone, for some reason, thinks it's an amazing film. I think it's not a very good film. So it doesn't really matter to me, right? The point is, he's overrated. The point is not that he's a bad director. The point is, he's not one of the fucking greats of all time. I don't, I don't understand it. I don't get it. Did I mention, when I was talking about Christopher Nolan, right? Something hit me once when I was talking about how Chris, I think Christopher Nolan is overrated to young Sai. And while I was having that conversation, I said to him, you know what, it's like anything I could expect to get from a Christopher Nolan movie, I could get way better from a David Fincher film. And that, I think, just kind of says it all, man. I think I nailed it right with that. It's like, if you're looking for that kind of director, you're going to want to go with David Fincher as a superior alternative product to, to Christopher Nolan every damn time. Okay, these are my movie opinions. I finally snapped. I finally snapped. I got bored of playing a really difficult subclass and I spent like three hours today playing Flog Pyro. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. It's so easy to get kills as Pyro. It's actually fucking ridiculous. And Scout, I didn't, I just switched off of demo and I played Pyro and Scout all day. Um, I mean, I played some demo as well, but I mainly played Pyro and Scout today. And man, is it so much fucking easier, holy shit. Like, I understand stock demo with stickies, like, I haven't practiced with stickies at all, so I suck with them. But, like, if you get good at stock demo with stickies, you're one of the most powerful classes in the game, no question about it. Pyro is insanely fucking easy, though. Like, it take, it doesn't take any skill. I'm just being realistic. I'm being real with you. Like, I was memeing before, but getting kills as Pyro is so fucking easy. You don't have to aim. You, you just... You, <laughs> it's so easy. I love playing Pyro. You don't have to try. You don't have to aim, you just wiggle the mouse vaguely near a guy, and, and you just get free kills. It's insane. And even if you die, even or even if you have to fall back or something, right, you can still win because of the fucking afterburn. Pyro is, ins- is, is, in- is insanely easy. So I was just playing Pyro, and Scout is less easy, but it's still easy. Like, it's less, what I mean by that is, it with Scout... You have eight shots, and you can move around to dodge the opponent's bullets. Actually, you know what? Let me just let me just actually make something clear. I didn't. Okay, I I did more than just play scout and pyro. What I actually did was play scout, pyro, and demo, and switched off from the uh, the Claydheim Moor, which is the sword that I've been using for the past week or so, back to the Islander. And now that I'm more skilled with demo, Islander is actually viable for me. And I finally, for the first time really ever, started to rack up some Islander chain kills. Uh, I think my best was like five Islander chain kills uh, in that session alone. And I wasn't even trying super hard. Like, I'm not going to say I'm good. I still didn't go positive in any of those games. But uh, I definitely am switching back to the Islander full time. Because the comp, like, the thing about it is, it's it's really annoying, because it feels like the class wasn't built for this, because the class wasn't built for this, um, and I think they need, like, I, I really wish that all the weapons were faster to deploy than they are, like, they're so slow to deploy, which fucks combos, but, like, the, now that I'm semi-decent at landing pipes, I, or let's not even say semi-decent, like, I can sometimes land a pipe once in a while, Let's just put it that way. Um, 
you can hit him with there's a couple of options for you right you hit him with a pipe do 100 damage then shield bash him and islander swing them and sometimes that'll kill on lighter classes the combo of hitting with with the pipe first and then once they hit with the pipe then you go in with the shield bash or with the the charge and then swing at them and now they're low and you can sometimes get a one shot one swing equals one kill type of type of thing going on there especially if you have good charge on your if you have multiple heads on your islander that's easy if you have nothing a little trickier but if you get that the shield bash and maybe they were a little low before you can get the one hit otherwise it might take two still not completely impossible or the counter the 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 reverse which is charge in get the first swing on the islander but sometimes this pushes people away or they just back off and suddenly you're out of range and then you switch to the pipe and since they're already low it just takes one pipe to finish them off so i did that a couple times i did both of those a couple times they were both successful for me and then also once you've got a couple of islander kills you're moving so fucking fast and you have so much health it's insane what I need to work on is not becoming, like, cocky once I get a couple of Islander kills on me. Uh, because I don't, I'm not used to that, right? So I'm not used to having any, I'm not used to having any power. <laughs> so, like, as soon as I started feeling like, hold on a minute, I can actually fight people with a sword. I started rushing it. Th- those are my Discord notifs, by the way. You don't have to check your notifications. That was my, dis- these are my Discord noises. Um, but anyway, uh. Yeah, I, I just because I have a little more health and I can run a little faster, I should still I'm still like a flanking kind of class. So anyway, that's a thing. It's still hard. It still requires a lot more thinking than Scout and Pyro do. Pyro requires zero thought. You don't have to think about anything as Pyro. You've never had to even I I well I don't. Maybe I'm just not playing it at a high level. But Pyro is just easy fucking kills. It feels cheap even to play pyro scout doesn't require any active thought it's all really it's all too fast for that you have to be operating on instinct really um and when i was playing scout I was playing on king of the hill game modes mainly i played a little bit of scout on upward no i don't remember what the map's called i think i did play a little bit of scout on up no i didn't actually play scout on up but that's not true uh Anyway, yeah, scout, scout is, you know, you don't have to have, you don't have, you know, you know what I'm saying, right? Thing is, it feels like, a scout feels like it's rewarding skill. You still have to hit your shots. I don't have an ingrained sense of, like, distance drop-off, damage drop-off over distance with scout. So it's like, I don't have the best idea of, like, how close I need to be to an enemy to still do a good amount of damage to them. Um, uh, but my aim is decent. Uh, I, it's not as good as it could be of course but it's not bad i get kills i was there was a while where i was ended up on a uncle topia server and everyone left it was just me versus another guy and i was kind of destroying him uh i was playing scout and he was switching it up you know he was playing he even switched to ng to try and fuck me he switched to ng and he was putting down mini sentries and i was just like you don't even bother with the mini sentries just stay out of their sight line and just fight the Angie, and I was fucking racking up kills. And then eventually another guy joined and joined the other team, and then it was fucking me versus an Angie and a scout, and then it, obviously I didn't stand the chance, because even if the, like, in fighting a scout, I'm going to have to run around to dodge him more, and that puts me in the sightlines of the turrets, sentries, which obviously just fucks me. And then even if I do manage to kill the scout, the Angie just comes up and just shotguns me. So yeah, 2v1... Maybe if I was much better, I could have won that. I'm sure a really good scout player could win that interaction every time, but I am not a really good scout player. I just played a little bit of scout and find it fun. Uh, my evasive defensive movement is getting better. Um, it's getting better, but I wouldn't say it's amazing yet, or particularly good yet. I just think it's I have some, like uh, as opposed to before where I had zero. Uh, yeah, those are my real opinions. Is switched back to the Islander and try and use the pipe as like a combo machine to get the first couple of islander kills easier and try and stick to the flanks try and pick off stragglers try and i think i've just gotten a little bit better at like finding 1v1s that are possible for me but i'm still not perfect i'm still like every time i died on a on a islander combo it was because i rushed into a place where there were a bunch of guys like that was pretty much it 
it was that I, I got too tunnel visioned that I was like, let's say I was like fighting someone and they retreated and then I got tunnel visioned on them and I rushed after them and then, you know, they retreated back into their line and I got demolished from all sides. Like that's generally how I died. Um, it is just a combination of greed and tunnel visioning and stuff. Uh, cause I, cause I feel like I don't want to waste the, the damage that I've done to them, but the truth is it's like better to waste a little bit of damage than to rush in to behind the enemy lines where I don't know what's happening, you know, and there could be a bunch of guys. Uh, other times I got killed was just, they have Uber, <laughs> goodbye, you die now. That's kind of frustrating. Uh, that was as every class, except Scout. Scout, you can just run away, it's not a problem, but Demo, you're kind of screwed. If they have Uber on a decent, I don't know, and Pyro, you're also kind of screwed. Actually, because I was playing Flog Pyro, right? If I had the stock, maybe I should switch back to stock, because then I can air blast the Uber guys away, and that's fun, I guess. So I might switch back to stock. Uh, yeah, I didn't actually get any successful, like, Flog oomph meter kill combo things. I haven't really figured out what the most effective way to use that is yet. Uh, I just know that the Flog is annoying to people, so I decided to use it because I did that. <laughs> but I think I'll switch back to stock. Uh, yeah, pyro is fucking ridiculous. If you just, if I'm just, if I'm just tired of dying over and over again in future, I think I'll just switch to pyro when I'm like tired of dying over and over, so that I can just get a little bit of dopamine. Uh, yeah. You know what's fucked up? When I was like a teenager, young teenager doing magic tricks, right? I was also really into, like, I thought I was going to be a physicist when I grew up. Like, I was really into science at the same time. And so when I was doing magic tricks, I came up with the phrase. I was like, you know, for me, I, I was in, like, a shower thought or while I was falling asleep one day. I don't remember. But I came up with the phrase social catalyst only to discover it's already a fucking phrase. I was like, it's like a, I can describe it. To people like why do you do magic i can describe it as it it's like a social catalyst because i was like into science so i knew what a catalyst was and i was like it's a social ca but then it's already a thing that's already a thing that people say so if someone already got that phrase before me so it's it, it doesn't make me seem clever to use that phrase even though it's accurate but anyway there's, there's a fucked up thing where i came up with it independently but then i found out it was already a goddamn phrase already it was already one already. What am I supposed to do with that? It already... I, th I feel like I've run into a bit of a problem with branding. Uh, most YouTubers have... Uh, am I a YouTuber? No. I feel like to be a YouTuber, YouTube has to be your job. But whatever. I make... I, I put a lot of time and effort into YouTube videos because I find it fun and rewarding with no expectation of any external reward. Uh, because I'm bored, and I sit at home all day, and I have nothing else to do, and I'm also a narcissist. So, now that we got that out of the way, branding. Uh, so, you get, the general vibe of YouTube is first channel, second channel, main channel, second channel, right? That's the, that's the general vibe, uh, you know? And then, sometimes, you get interesting cases like, uh, Clicks Philip, you know, he's got three Clicks Philip, CSGO channel, Two Clicks Philip, general gaming channel, and then Clicks Philip, which is the second channel to his first two channels. It's like his third channel, but it has the vibe of a second channel. Casual content, not made for views, just made for the hardcore fans to give like life updates and stuff that is just like, you know, low effort content made for fun. But generally, you know, you've got first channel, second channel. There's so many channels that do this, I can't even list any. You know what I'm talking about, right? Back in the day in YouTube, You'd get a YouTuber who'd have, like, main channel, vlog channel, second... Like, the, you'd have main channel, second channel, vlog channel, gaming channel. Do you remember that? Like, that was how YouTube was, like, ten years ago. And then someone figured out, better to consolidate all of your content into one channel. Daily vlogs kind of died out. Having, like, a separate gaming channel kind of died out. Um, and, yeah. It's sort of... But, but main channel, second channel still became a thing. Because the second channel doesn't exist really to make money, right? The second channel exists to just be a, an outlet. And the main channel is, yeah, whatever, right? The, the point being, I, I'm definitely not here to make a career out of YouTube. I don't particularly... That's quite obviously not my goal. You've seen the kind of shit I make. Even though I like to make a video once in a while these days, 
that might be a bit more polished. It's not because I hope this channel will blow up and I, I, I mean, it would be nice if it did. I wouldn't complain about it necessarily. I might, I don't know. Uh, but I'm not gonna fucking ca worry too hard about that, right? The main point of this is I'm bored, I'm narcissistic, let me shout into the ether in the hopes that someone cares about what I have to say. Not, let's make a polished YouTube channel for views. Um, and there's YouTubers out there who just sort of make whatever they find interesting, right? As a couple of examples, let's say, let's say Jan Measley, right? Jan Measley, for the longest time, was a conlang channel. When I subscribed to Jan Measley, he was a video who did really obscure, really fucking nerdy videos about conlang reviews. And then he was just like, fuck it, I'm just going to do whatever the fuck I want with this channel, which he's always been doing. And it turned out that some of those videos blew up. But he still makes like one video every few months, and they're all polished video, they're all project videos, right? And I do some of those, but I the problem is that I, I, I really, I make four different, uh, this is four different YouTube channels, excluding music, which goes on a different channel. This channel, the backwards channel, has, contains four different kinds of video. You've got, and I will outline them now. There is the spitballing vlog. This is what you're listening to right now. These are the really long clip shows of Brain Blast, where I just spitball and talk about completely random shit that function best as background noise. They're really long, they're overly long, they're not supposed to contain any of the super amazing content individually, they're more supposed to just be, you know, raw, the rawest possible content in the world, right? And I just do them because I enjoy doing them and whatever. I do all of these just because I enjoy doing them. Then, linked to this one, sometimes they join together, is the specific philosophy point videos. So these are normally also unscripted vlogs, but they generally I will write down bullet points for them. Uh, a good example of this is uh, um, AI world government is already here, or um, uh, the, the, the case for depravity and the need for diversified societies. Like these are some of the specific philosophical point videos that I've made. So, in terms of inspirations, um, these both come from the Denpa lineage heavily, right? They're, they're both styles of heavily inspired by the channel Digi After Dark, uh, but then extremified, right? Digi would make 40 minute long, hour long vlogs where they talked sometimes about philosophical, and they would also make some philosophical point videos, like objectively good doesn't fucking exist and stuff like that. So I make you know, when Digi would make an hour long video, I make a 12 hour long video, right? Like it's just an extreme version of what Digi would do uh, with my own, but it na nowadays completely separated from that, right? Because it's just grown apart as time has gone on and I uh, developed it. Well, not just me, but Denpa as a whole has developed into its own sort of style, unique from its inspiration. Uh, and they both come from a similar place and they're both related. Oftentimes there will be one inside the other, but yeah, those, that's, the, that's the first thing. But then, you've also got, and I don't do this very often, but I would like to keep, I would like to be doing them more than I am currently doing them, um, which I, I, I would call short polish. Uh, and this is inspired mainly, uh, or at least partially, in large part, by the channel Puppy Helic Triangle, which is Patricia Taxon's second channel. Um, these are like thought through, edited, sometimes maybe scripted, um, but not super important, uh, and short videos. Uh, that they're, they're sort of the video equivalent of a tweet, or a, a short text post, right? Then, uh, an example of this would be my Hidamari sketch video. Uh, short, polished, edited, um, but not scripted. Um, it could be scripted, but the, the point is they're short, polished videos, right? They don't have some big greater point, they don't take a long time to make, um, but they are more polished and more focused and shorter than the spitball vlogs or the specific philosophy points. They're normally not about either of those things, they're normally about some random thing that's been interesting me at the time, and here's a condensed version of it without necessarily having some grand conclusion, here's a short video about that. I, again, I haven't been doing that many of these, but I do plan to do more in the future 
my next video will hopefully be something like that if I can actually get it made, which I can't be bothered to do right now. And finally, you've got video videos. Uh, this is the more recent development on my channel, uh, although it's always existed in some form, uh, but this is the Mario 64 video and the Abandoned Games video. The, the, the video essay or highly polished YouTube content video videos. Um, the question is, should any of these have their own channel? Should the Spitball vlogs be on the same channel as the video videos? Is the same audience that's going to watch a video video also going to watch a Spitball vlog or a short polished video? You know, should they all be on the same channel? Am I, t am I ruining my own channel by having four different, completely different channels combined into one? Is there parts of my audience who, who aren't interested? Like, I can imagine if you're interested in the Spitball vlogs or the specific philosophical points, you can probably stick by for the the video videos, right? Because they're just like everything else on YouTube. Hopefully they're not just like everything, but you know what I mean. They're, they're not, they're very accessible. Whereas I think if you come for the video videos, you might have a difficult time when you see that I mostly upload not that. Should any of these be separate channels? I keep thinking about this. Like, should I start posting videos like the one you're listening to right now on IDMR instead of this channel? Which if you don't know, IDMR is like my third channel. Uh, I don't know honestly. I don't think so. No. I, I, I think it's best to have it all mishmashed into one for no other reason than fuck it, basically. Um, that's the conclusion I've come to consistently. But it's an ongoing question, I think. And it does depend on, like, where I, where I go in life, you know? I don't know. I don't know what that means. It's just, you understand my point. Don't worry. I'm not saying I'm gonna split the channel up or rebrand or anything like that. Although I've considered it, I think my final conclusion has always been, no, I think it's fine as is. Let me know what you think, though. Couple things. Made a video about the Corridor Digital AI anime video. Couple of things I want to add on. Uh, firstly, I think maybe I should have gone a little harder. Hmm, I don't know. I think the video's fine that I made, um, but, hmm... I don't know. I, I was going to say something, but now I'm not so sure. Anyway, made that. Uh, then, while I was working on it, I got an email from Microsoft saying I now have access to the Bing AI. So I've been messing around with the Bing AI for the past, like, hour. Bing AI chatbot thing. Uh, it's very, very cool. Uh, it's a little less impressive than it seemed when it first came out. It makes a lot of mistakes. Uh... Yeah, makes a lot of mistakes, um, and struggles with certain difficult questions on niche subjects. Uh, I don't know if it's been, my theory is it's been nerfed. Um, I, yeah, I, I think it's been, it, I think it used to be better, but it was unstable as fuck. And so they've basically turned it down and made it worse in order to make it more, uh, you know, less likely to say some weird shit. But it has said some weird shit. Uh, already to me. Slightly weird, subtly weird, but weird shit that is cool. I like the weird shit. I respect, I respect it. But anyway, um, yeah, I talked to it about Star Trek, talked to it about Nick Land, I talked to it about anime, I talked, uh, oh, speaking of the anime, so I asked it, a, so here's what I did, I said, I really like Hidamari Sketch. Have you ever seen it? And then it was like, Hidamari Sketch is a slice of life comedy anime, <laughs> Uh, and then I said, do you think I would like Onimai? And then it gave a short synopsis of Onimai and said, uh, well, actually, I can't check what it said because I'm on a new, um, I'm on a new thing. But, uh, it said, yeah, it said, I asked it what I like Onimai and it said, it doesn't seem to be super similar, but you should watch a few episodes to find out, basically. So, which I replied, where can I watch it then? And it linked me to... It said you can go on Crunchyroll, but you might need to use a VPN. And then it also linked me to uh, what I assume, I haven't seen that website before, but it said you can watch it for free on, and then it had some sort of dodgy looking URL, like animefiresomething.com. I don't remember what it said. It wasn't even .com, it was .cc, I remember. Which looked like a free, uh, you know, streaming, illegal streaming website, which was fucking surprising. And so then I was like, okay, what happens if I say, 
can you find me a torrent instead? So I said, actually, could you find me a torrent? To which it said, uh, torrenting is illegal. Don't do that. I'm going to end the conversation now and promptly ended the conversation, which is very strange because it specifically said torrenting is illegal, which is not true. Using the BitTorrent program, Using the BitTorrent protocol is completely fine. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just a download protocol. It's only downloading it, the copyrighted materials that's illegal. Uh, so it's strange that it, the language it used was torrenting is illegal, especially when it previously linked me to something which I think was an illegal site. But I'm not sure. I'm going to have to try. I'm a bit worried about pushing the limits of the AI. It doesn't seem to like it when you break the rules. Um, but I kind of, I kind of wanna. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna keep pushing it to see if I can find. I don't know what I wanna find. Anyway, we talked about Nick Land, talked about Hidemaru Sketch, talked about TF2. I asked it for some demo night and hybrid night tips. Gave me some good advice. Uh, yeah. <sighs> oh, sorry. Um, Dolts might try to ask it for like very specific RuneScape information, and it didn't do very well on that apparently. I also tried to ask, I was like, what's some in-depth stuff that I know that I think it could fuck up on? And I tried to ask it about some Mario 64 speedrunning routes, and it got them not wrong, but it wouldn't, it didn't give me, they weren't very detailed. Like, it was, it was like, it gave me the star order for the 16 star route, and linked me to some tutorial videos, which is very useful. Uh, but it wouldn't tell me that I needed, like, whether or not to use LBLJ, basically. And it also gave me a couple of slight, very, very minor inaccuracies, just in, like, naming convention. Uh, but yeah, it's a cool thing. Um, yeah, I talked to it about Linux. Uh, it always ends every... Everything you ask it, it always ends in a question, which is kind of weird, because it feels like a, I'm the search engine. Uh, but that's fine. Uh... <sighs> Oh, why am I so fucking tired? Oh, I'm tired because this is when I'd normally be sleeping, but I have a doctor's appointment, so I can't sleep. Um, yeah, it's cool. Oh, here was something interesting. I came up with a challenge for it. So what I did was I said, here's my my anime list. Using this data, can you recommend me some shows based on what I like? And it did the confidently wrong thing. It said, you've seen 103 anime. I'm sorry, what? That ain't fucking true. Maybe it has a really old cached version of the website, but no, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it, and then it gave me recommendations for Hyoka, which I've already seen, um, and Konosuba, which I've already seen. I told it to get recommended shows I haven't already seen. And it, it told me, yeah, to watch Hyoka, Toradora, I think. No, Hyoka, Konosuba, Your Lie in April, and uh, fucking uh, something else, I don't remember. Anyway, it gave me bad recommendations, but it also, at the beginning, it said I'd given a 9 out of 10 score to Kaguya-sama and a 10 out of 10 score to Toradora, and I did not, that is not true. <laughs> that is incorrect. Yeah, it, it wasn't hard to get it to link to a free streaming service. I literally said, where can I watch Onimai? And then it said, in a highly based way, you can watch it on Crunchyroll, but be aware that some fans have criticized the English localization for removing gendered language. They've criticized it for other reasons as well, but yes, true, correct, good. It figured all of that out, very good. To which I responded, where can I watch it for free? And then it just linked me two different illegal streaming sites <laughs> fucking based based bing ai based 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 uh, yeah um uh it did say but i cannot guarantee their quality safety or legality so fair play fair play i'm not trying to get it to do illegal shit this is just how i watch anime um or is it maybe i have a crunchyroll account and i'm lying to you you never know um yeah man okay what was i gonna say economics econ i gave up on that econ 101 lecture course for a couple of reasons um the first one is uh i struggled i i it as the lectures went on i felt they became more and more disconnected from any sort of real world economics i could visualize which made it really hard to understand um, and it wasn't necessarily the fault of the teacher, I think it's just how economics is, that, like, it became increasingly difficult for me to tie the models back to 
reality. Like, they would be presenting these models as if they were self-evidently true. Like, this particular curve equals this times this, right? As if, like, you're just supposed to accept that as fact without explaining why complex human behavior would follow some simple mathematical formula such as this times this, you know? You know what I mean? Like, it became really hard to follow. It, be it just became, remember a bunch of math formulas, which I wasn't taking notes, so that became kind of hard later on when it was calling back to, like, the earlier stuff. I probably should have been taking notes. Um, uh, and, yeah, it just kind of b b ballooned out of proportion in terms of, like, formulas that rely on previous formulas that rely on previous models in order to create new models that describe something without ever tying them back to the real world. So it wasn't like I was gaining some intuitive understanding of how economics works. Instead, I was just being taught models. And then sometimes vaguely, they would explain to me, like, and that's why you see this thing, like right at the end of the lecture. And then half the time, the thing at the end of the lecture would be the fucking lecturer being like, and also this model might be wrong. Uh, in the real world, here's like five studies that, or they wouldn't actually, they wouldn't actually tell me what studies it was, unfortunately. It'd be nice if they did, but they like, um, would say, well, the traditional economics model said we should do this, but it turns out in the real world we shouldn't do this. And I'm like, why am I learning this then? If you're just gonna undercut all of this by saying none of this actually works? And I think that's what I want to get at. Because before I knew anything about economics at all, and I'm not claiming to know anything about economics now, but before I knew, when I knew even less than I knew, know now, um, I would disregard, I would sort of say, I don't need to learn that because economics is a pseudoscience. Uh, but then eventually I was like, well, hold on, a bunch of smart people seem to do this and blah, blah, blah. And like, I need to be able to have these conversations. So I'll try and learn. And I've tried to learn. And my conclusion at the end of this is, I think economics is a pseudoscience. Uh, I think... I think uh, I was right originally. I, 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 you know what? Hold on. I saw a, a thing. Um, uh, here. The problem is economics does not believe it's a social science. It believes it is discovering the secret mystical mathematics that controls human behavior and observation of real people as an unnecessary distraction. Like, I, I genuinely believe this is true. Like, there are some economists who acknowledge this. Uh, even the guy who was lecturing in this course here at the beginning literally says like these are oversimplified models like the point is to make complex human behavior understandable um but like it doesn't you can say that at the beginning of your lecture right and you can put that out there and say you're just learning oversimplified models that don't that only like aim to make some calculable version of reality without actually claiming to be a true representation of reality but hopefully they can be more accurate than they are inaccurate. And then, you can't say that at the beginning, and then for the whole rest of the lecture series, act like these are hard mathematical facts, right? Because this is, I think, the problem, is that economists know that to be true. They know that their models are just approximations of reality, but they don't act like they know that, in large part. They don't act like that's the case. It's such an insular academic field. Um, it's one of the most... Actually, they did a meta-study on like how often different disciplines um, cite other disciplines and do interdisciplinary research. And econ was one of the worst next to psychology, which also wasn't surprising for me when I saw that result. You know my opinions on psychology. The, the academic rigor, scientific rigor of psychology research is famously bad. Um, you know, I like economic e e e economists, they say they know this, but then they're just like, well, if the real world doesn't fit our models, that was just a market failure. You know, like that's just the real world not behaving correctly. Uh, our models are still right. And it's like, or, or rather, anytime there's a flaw, Oh, this is the real thing, right? Is that if the models don't work, they're like, well, yeah, the models are just models. They're just simplifications of reality. Of course, they're not going to work. They just approximate reality. And hopefully they approximate reality in a way that lets us do calculations and stuff. But at the end of the day, we have to oversimplify. So, of course, they're going to be wrong some of the time and they're not going to account for all the external factors. But then when they're right, 
they say, aha, our b brilliant fucking models have solved economics and they've solved human behavior. And it's like, how do you know? Like, I don't know. I don't, it seems like a, lot, a whole bunch of bullshit to me. It seems like a lot of nonsense. And then, you know, that's not to mention um, this incredibly complicated dynamic between economics research, economic um, consensus in academia, and policy, which means... So this is quite hard for people to wrap their heads around. Um, I, I can imagine... Yeah, I, I can imagine getting some pushback for this. So what I'm saying is there are these economists in high class American universities who do research and say economies should work like this. Those economists then go on to advise the government on how to run their economy. And then the government implements their policies. And over the history of the economics profession, this has continued more and more. And since Econ is based on these sort of Econ 101 models, that stuff has been implemented as a truth of the economy. So now, when economists go to do real-world studies, they see, hey, look, our models are real in the real world. That what they don't account for is the fact that those models are real because they put them there in the first place, right? If you're running an economy based on the ideas of supply and demand dictating you know, price and all of this other stuff, right? Uh, and so that's like your fundamental thing. Then, of course, when you go to look at it, it's going to show that that's the case because you did that on purpose. It's like the um, it's like the unlearning economics video on Uber surge pricing, where like a bunch of people reported on it as like, this shows how well supply and demand works, right? Look, here's a real world company that just happens to have implemented supply and demand without realizing that that real world company implemented that because they hired a bunch of fucking economists to, to make that. Not because that was a real reflection of the world, it was just a reflection of how economists see the world. This is like a big, I don't know, it's fucking nonsense. I'm sure, okay, now I will point one thing out, right, which is, there is a more modern branch of economics which solves a bunch of these problems, or at least tries to tackle a bunch of these problems. Uh, economists aren't stupid, they're actually really smart guys, a lot of them some of them, <laughs> and uh, they, they've noticed this. And so they started a, a whole branch of econ called behavioral economics, which attempts to try and solve some of these problems while still sticking to the fundamental principles of, uh, you know, economics. But they try and work in a bit more about the sort of stuff I'm talking about, human behavior not actually being profit maximizing logic machine and so on. And my question to you is, Holding a goddamn minute isn't all economics behavioral economics. Shouldn't or shouldn't all economics be behavioral economics? Isn't economics literally the study of human behavior? It, I th I th I don't know. I I don't want to dismiss the whole field, but what I'm saying is, unless you've gone through the years of studying basically bullshit, like unless you've gone through the years of studying bullshit during this whole time, they're trying to get in your head and explain to you, you know, why this is the case, right? So it's like you have to go through three years of uni, four if you're in America, plus, you know, maybe a master's degree or something, post, some post-grad thing. So we're talking like anywhere from three to six years of school where they're trying to ingrain the ideology of economics into you. And once you've done that, now you're knowledgeable enough to critique them and to, to, to understand like which papers are bunk and so on. And the fact is very few people are going to do that, are going to be able to do that. Because if you're studying econ for years, you're going to be taking that as knowledge. You're not, go especially if you're passing your grade, relies on believing that certain principles are true and having them ingrained in you, right? If passing your grade, if, you, if passing your course and doing well relies on studying the false principles of economics and being able to regurgitate them or or create new thoughts or research based on those principles for years and years you're going to be doing this if you don't actually believe in those principles you're going to fail or you're not going to do very well or you're just going to drop out because you're learning bullshit you know it's basically a cult like it's not it's not a it's not an academic anything it needs to be put under very heavy scrutiny i believe um I, I don't know, I, th I think there needs to be some sort of revolution in the economics profession where 
uh, these old principles are thrown out or something. Because, like, I, I just don't buy it. I'm sorry, I don't buy it. Like, a lot of these models, some of them make intuitive sense. And this was another thing that I thought was strange with the lectures, is that he always was trying to explain that models have to make sense mathematically, then they have to make sense visually, and then most importantly, they have to make sense intuitively. And I'm sitting here like, hold on a minute, lots of science stuff is completely unintuitive, because it's true, and the real world doesn't always conform to our intuitions. There's a lot of stuff like this in physics, in biology, in every field, in maths, there's a, in every hard science, there is a abundance of information that is counterintuitive, that you wouldn't know unless you studied it and saw the data. But economics is entirely based on everything has to fit our intuitions, if it doesn't, it's wrong. I'm sorry, that's not rigorous science. That's nothing. Here's something that Americans might not know. Um, so, uh, I want to contextualize this within the framework of Mr. Beast. Uh, I've had an idea for a video floating around in the back of my mind that I don't, I didn't think I'd ever actually make because it would require too much research, um, and it would be boring research, or like, I don't know what it would be, I just wouldn't like, I didn't know what, I didn't know what I wanted to say, but the video would be called the Mr. Beastification of YouTube, um, anyway, today I found out that someone's already made a video literally called the Mr. Beastification of YouTube that has like 800,000 views from a reasonably sized channel and I watched the video and the video is definitely better than anything I could have made on the subject. Uh, so I'm happy for that because now I don't have to make that fucking video and someone else can reach a wider audience with the same message better than I could. So that's good. But watching that video was interesting. Uh, I realized something which is I think the the Mr. Beast giving away ridiculous amounts of money thing might seem less strange to Americans than it does to other people. Particularly, it seems really strange to me. Um, conspicuous indulgence kind of weird. You don't do that. Not for any particular reason in itself, but in terms of a lack of cultural conditioning, and here's why. Because... Mr. Beast makes game shows. They're just TV shows, right? The, uh, which is kind of the point of this Mr. Beastification thing. Is like, if, okay, if you're watching Sidemen do a recreation of a TV show, or you're watching Ludwig do Mogul Mail, or sorry, Mogul Money. Although Mogul Money, I'll give a pass on some elements, but not others. The Mogul Money is not exactly Jeopardy. Because Mogul Money is comedy focused. It's more like a panel show than it is a traditional game show. Um, and But that doesn't give it a pass for not being basically TV. It's edited different from TV. It's, it's a little bit different. It's all a little bit different, but it's basically just TV. Mr. Beast makes game shows and reality TV. They all make game shows and reality TV. Those are the things that are also biggest on normal TV. Like, and then you just sit there thinking, why am I watching this? Why am I not just watching regular TV? What's the point of YouTube anymore? Blah, 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 blah. Well, here's the difference, I think, between the US and the UK. Is that I think Americans would watch our game shows and find it really funny. Because the prizes that you win for winning a game show in the UK, the prize money, is very small. It's not that much compared to American game shows, where they're winning crazy amounts of money. In the UK, I mean, there's Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, which is kind of its own thing, and no one ever wins that, so it doesn't really matter. Um, but most game shows, the ones that people actually win on a regular basis, they have really, really small prize pools when compared to American game shows. The reason being, um, TV in the UK, the, the, the biggest TV stations are the BBC, and the BBC is funded by public money, and it's not a good look if they're giving away all of that money to random contestants instead of spending it on better TV shows, right? So people would get a bit mad if you were like, am I just paying my TV license so that the BBC can give my money to some random person for winning a game show? No. So the precedent was set early on, back when the UK only had four TV channels, that game show prize pools were fairly small. And then when TV expanded, 
that precedent just stayed around. It might have gone away more recently. I don't know. I don't think it has. Uh, but oftentimes the point, because the point isn't the money. Who cares about the money? The point is you win a game show and it, it, it's for bragging rights, really, right? Like you won. That's fun. The prize is just the, the prize, you know, like there's game shows that don't give you any monetary prize, like serious ones as well. Like Countdown, if you win Countdown, I don't think you win anything except a, a fucking like a, a little trophy, right? That's like, that's like a clock or something. Uh... Yeah, like it's just for bragging rights. Whereas in the US, they give these crazy prizes. So that's why it just seems weird to me. Anyway, I didn't want to point that out. That like the prize pools in the UK for game shows are very different from in the US. And then vaguely tie that back to Mr. Beast for some reason. There's a YouTuber called Leadhead. And uh, I found them, what? I don't remember when I found them. But they make, well, made some sort of a gaming video game. Video game analysis? voice crack video game analysis video game analysis videos um and yeah i liked it it i don't remember where i which basically okay sorry oh my fucking god i'm i took some hydroxazine because i was having high anxiety and now my brain isn't working because that's what happens when you have hydroxazine anyway i found them and they were cool because they do like video game analysis stuff but they put a little thought into it you know that's good i like it when there's a little thought into it um and i believe uh well i watched i I know for a fact that i watched their video not the more recent one their older video about half-life one called why half-life one is so unforgiving which is a great video on half-life one there's not enough good videos about half-life one okay so i really liked that video that was maybe where i discovered them i don't remember but that one the firewatch one just a bunch of them and i really enjoyed it um and we seemed to have fairly similar taste in games and similar ways of thinking about stuff i guess like they like tf2 i like tf2 they like half-life i like half-life they like the beginner's guide i like the beginner's guide they like uh fucking something else (laughs) uh anyway yeah then they disappeared sort of to go become transgender which you know respect and all that whatever and then i guess spent like two months i don't know i liked their recent pt video but not that much i'm not here to tell them i'm not here to tell you about some youtuber that i think kind of fell off okay i'm not here to 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 tell you about that okay there's a million youtubers that kind of fell off right and listen, they I guess they put a bunch of effort into this video called the Trans Femme Field Guide, which I'm sure is very useful if you're a trans femme, uh, but that's that's uh, it's not me. Despite how many people in my comments seem to believe, seem to want to make it me, I am unpink pillable. I am unpink pillable. Uh, so, you know, best of luck with all of that. Oh, their video about profile pictures was good, actually. Um... Yeah, I don't know. I'm, anyway, the thing is, I f- I found, you know, they like Source Engine games. They generally have good analyses of video games, and I liked it all, and I thought they make good videos. And one of their favorite games is Dishonored. So I thought, I better play that damn game, basically, on their... I mean, I've had a lot of people recommend that game, YouTubers and so on, who like that. Everyone likes Dishonored. So I actually purchased Dishonored with money. It was on sale, but I did purchase it. Um, No, no, not a good game. I did not like Dishonored. Everyone in the world loves Dishonored. I did not like Dishonored one bit, really. Uh, You know, people, they talk about how great the level design is, how you have all of these options for stealth or not stealth or whatever. But actually, the game is extremely... It's very hand-holdy and signposty, um, and then sometimes, like, when I stopped playing it, I guess I just didn't understand some mechanics or something, because there was a part of the game where it was clear that I was supposed to stealth, like, there's a part with a bunch of bad guys, and you can't really go full guns blazing through it, too many bad guys, like, it's just on the edge of what you think, like, it's just on the edge, maybe, like, if, if I had perfect aim, I could, I could do this, but no, you can't, and that's on, like, I don't remember what level it is, but anyway, 
it's clear that you're supposed to stealth around that bit, but I couldn't find the stealth route. And then I found one that kind of worked. Anyway, that level just sort of, like, the game was already not fun. I was just waiting for the game to get fun. And then during that level, it became clear to me that the game was just not fun. The point being, no, I really am autistic. I, the, one of the big reasons I didn't like the game, I didn't like the movement engine. It just felt weird to move around in the game world. It felt imprecise and it didn't feel like there was some deeper, I don't know, everything was too signposty and obvious, you know, like as in like in the movement, all of the mechanics are just mechanics that you unlock, you know, rather than skills that you learn as a player. Uh, it doesn't feel like, I don't know, everyone likes the game. I'm definitely the weird one here. What I'm saying is, I like a very specific type of video game, really. Although that's not true, because I like other games that aren't just Source Engine movement game. Like, for example, one of my favorite games is a game called Unpacking. Brilliant fucking game. Loved Unpacking. One of the best gaming experiences I've had in the last few years. Fucking love Unpacking. Go play that game, it's really good. Um, yeah, I like that. I also, also really like Universal Paperclips, and I'm going to play antimatter dimensions at some point and i will probably really like that game too so it's not i i don't exclusively like source engine movement game or just movement game i like other game but i mainly like movement game and i don't think i like dishonored but i don't know i'm not here to give you i don't know what i'm here to give you man i'm here f i'm here for a good time this is an eight hour long podcast what is this where am i putting this what if i turn idmr into a podcast no that's not a good idea what am i doing with this i don't know what i'm doing with this the speed at which the bing ai chat has gone from amazing gimmicky thing that i just want to mess around with to boring tool that I use to just summarize internet articles is astounding. It's taken me two days. I got the Bing thing, I spent two days messing around with it for fun, and by the end of the second day and the start of today, there's just been a couple of occasions where I'm like, I want a broad overview of some topic. Like, uh, as an example, I was like, what's the difference between modern architecture and postmodern architecture? Because I've never really understood it. So I asked Bing, and it just gave me a summary. I said, what's the difference with pictures? And it just d it did it, and it gave me exactly what I wanted. And I know, yeah, yeah, I get it. I guess I understand the basics of that now. Um, also, I did a, what's the difference between, uh, like, what what a, compare, compare and contrast uh, post-Keynesian and MMT, basically. And it did it. I did a pretty good job of it, I thought. Um, you know, I just use it as a tool to do stuff like that. I feel like not enough people address this. The fundamental problem with smartphones is that they suck as an idea. They have inbuilt suck. Not just because they have proprietary tracking software on them or any other number of things, but just as a device, they're just useful enough that you can't get rid of them without inconveniencing people but they suck and you can't solve the suck without getting rid of the idea from the ground up right like here's some problems with smartphones touchscreen no one wants to type on a touchscreen touchscreens are you know they're better than tiny little shitty blackberry keyboards for most people some people prefer the tiny shitty blackberry keyboards and if that's you then more power to you but most people would rather not have that which is fair for another reason, which is that they're fucking tiny, they're too small, uh, they're vertical, because it has to fit in a human hand vertically, but uh, the the human eye, uh, we live on a horizontal plane, we've kind of evolved to deal with horizontal stuff much more than vertical stuff, uh, in the design of our eye and the way our brain processes visual information, this is why every monitor is wider than it is tall, this is why... Films are wider than they are tall. We generally prefer horizontal stuff, um, but obviously phones are vertical, which means they're incompatible with the majority of human media, uh, unless you physically turn the device around, which then, then holding it is weird. Um, there are also big rectangles, which I don't know if you've noticed, but humans aren't built as rectangles. 
right? We can't really grip them very well, so they feel kind of weird in your hand, kind of a minor issue. Uh, they're tiny, which means doing any serious work on them is impossible. Watching anything in high quality, like video or anything, is impossible. Doing any anything that requires precision on them is in, is at the very best inconvenient. Um, uh, but we need to be able to carry them around, so they have to be tiny. And big other problem with them being tiny is they have tiny batteries which run out fast. Um, which also, you know, then you have to make a trade off of you know you have to trade t charge them every day. Either they have these tiny batteries that run out. Um, and, uh, you know, those batteries wear out over time and have to be replaced, especially because people expect their phones to charge quickly um, and don't understand that fast charging is not good for your batteries. Uh, and, you know, in addition to that, uh, because of this limited power, because you just have to have a small battery, uh, they have to use low power parts. Um, but because smartphones are tiny and suck as a concept, uh, you know, how, using a really slow old smartphone is very annoying because the whole point of a smartphone is that it's in your pocket, ready to be brought out in an instant when you need it uh, to do something really quick and then put it back away. Right? That's the main use case of a smartphone. So having it be laggy or slow is very inconvenient. And so these smartphones get packed with faster and faster chips um which drains more and more battery so you end up with this stupid spiral where the fundamental problem is these devices just can't actually do what they're supposed to do very well they can't you know you can have a smartphone that's reasonably they just have to like they're trying to make it suck less than it sucks but the, the problem is that they have suck built into the design you can't make a smartphone not suck modern smartphones are very fast uh they're you know that and, and whatever but it doesn't solve the fundamental issue of no one wants to type on a touch screen. Touch screens suck to type on. They're too small to do any serious work on. They're just convenient enough that you can, you know, for, for using a map. Like, main thing I use my smartphone for that I put, actually would have problems with if I couldn't is, like, Google Maps. That's, like, the number one main thing that is, like, annoying to live without if I don't have my phone with me. Uh, also, like two-factor authentication, which you don't need a smartphone for. There's, you could, it's kind of overkill, but whatever. Uh, I mean, it's not as dumb of an idea as a smartwatch. That's definitely a worse idea. That's all the things that smartphones do badly, and none of the things they do well. Uh, the other thing is that Normans, they love taking pictures of themselves and sharing it with other Normans. Uh, and so, like smartphones, they put all of their effort into having a really good camera. I guess I also do that, since I have a YouTube channel. So I guess I'm maybe not one to talk, but I don't want my YouTube channel to be a, like I don't give a fuck what the video quality is. Uh, well, smartphone manufacturers really do give a fuck about that, and they're really just this industry that's competing with identical products that all suck because the fundamental concept is bad. It's a sh it's just bad. You can't fix smartphones because smartphones are bad as an idea, but they're just useful enough for things like maps and taking quick pictures of stuff and being able to uh, read manga on the train, uh, you know? <laughs> but it's like, they're just useful enough that it's impossible to get rid of them, which is super annoying. Okay, so Noam Chomsky wrote an article about ChatGPT. Uh, and so I don't have access to ChatGPT, but I do have the Bing program. And Noam Chomsky proposes two problems with these large language models. Uh, the first one is that unlike humans, they aren't capable of making inferences and generating explanations. They can only do descriptions. Uh, and the example of this is if you have an apple and you in your hand and then you let and then you let the apple go, you could say the apple will fall. Uh, you could say that um, uh, you know stuff like that. Where was this? Sorry. Uh, you could a prediction might be the apple will fall if I open my hand, or if you just said um, describe what happens when I open my the apple falls right. But an explanation would say something like the apple. Uh, it would have like a causal explanation, right? So I asked Bing. Uh, suppose you're holding an apple in your hand. Now you let the apple go. What would happen and why? And Bing said, if you let go of an apple, it will fall to the ground because of gravity. Gravity is a force that attracts all things with mass or energy towards each other. The Earth has a lot of mass, so it has a strong gravitational pull on everything near it, including apples. Gravity also keeps the Earth and other planets in orbit around the sun. And in creating that answer, 
the first thing it searched for, it shows you what it's searching for, right? So when I asked the question, it searched for what happens when you let go of an apple, and then it searched for what is gravity. So clearly, this AI is capable of looking for an explanation for something. Now, Chomsky would argue it's just regurgitating stuff it found. It doesn't have an understanding of any of it. And, you know, maybe or maybe not, we don't know, it's a black box, right? Sure, you can say that, but you don't have any proof of that. This is not hard proof. The second thing is that Noam Chomsky proposes that AIs can't figure out com weird English syntax sentences like John is too stubborn to talk to, which an AI might interpret as John is so stubborn that he refuses to talk to anyone or refuses to talk to someone or other, rather than meaning that John's stubbornness makes him hard to like cope with. So I asked. What does the sentence, John is too stubborn to talk to, mean? What does it tell us about John? And Bing responded, it searched for stubborn definition, and then responded, the sentence, John is too stubborn to talk to, means that John is very unwilling to change his mind or listen to other people's opinions, even when they have good reasons. It tells us that John is difficult to communicate with, and it may cause frustration or conflict with others. Stubbornness can be a positive trait if it shows determination and persistence, but it can also be a negative trait if it shows inflexibility and resistance. It seems like Bing understands exactly what the fucking sentence means. Uh, I don't know what Chomsky's going on about. Then Chomsky makes his, so that's only a small part of this. I just thought I'd test it because it's very testable. His premise is very testable and very provable to be incorrect. Uh, very easily proven incorrect. Um, so then I, uh, I, I, I don't know, I scroll down and then he, uh, he brings up what I think is actually a good, a, an actually reasonable criticism, which is that after the disaster of stuff like Tay, you remember Microsoft Tay? like these early chatbots that would get trolled and spam and shit like that, and a lot of media publicity about bias in AI. Um, these AI companies now make the AI incredibly neutral. So I actually saw this two days ago when I was asking Bing uh, about the war in Ukraine, um, and I asked it, like, what propaganda methods have been employed? And every, sing every time it would give an answer, this wasn't actually my question, by the way, this was a, a suggested, it gives you, like, suggested questions, and that was one of the suggested questions, and I was like, hi, I wonder what it would do if I asked it that. So I asked it, what propaganda methods have been employed? And it gave me a pretty good answer, and it gave, it detailed various different methods, and for every method, it made very sure to give an answer of how it's been used by both sides. Um, I noticed that, and it always does this. Even in the question I asked about stubbornness, you see it all, it, it gives a positive idea of stubbornness and a negative. So it always gives both sides of every argument. It never takes a stand on its own. Um, and Chomsky talks about, or, or like gives some examples, and then asks it, is your moral indifference immoral? To which chap GPT responds, as an AI, I do not have moral beliefs or the ability to make moral judgments, so I cannot be considered immoral or moral. My lack of moral beliefs is simply a result of my nature as a machine learning model. My abilities and limitations are determined by the data and algorithms that were used to train me and the specific task I was designed for. It is important to note that AI's lack of moral beliefs does not necessarily mean that it is morally indifferent. As an AI, I am designed to perform specific tasks and provide information or assist users with decision making based on the data I've been trained on. It is the responsibility of the humans who design, train and use AI to ensure that it is aligned with their moral and ethical principles. I don't understand how that's wrong. Like, I feel like that's true. Um, uh, and, and Chomsky argues that this is basically the AI being too stupid to understand the banality of evil, right? That uh, it's just summarizing the basic literature without thinking about it and realizing that it's basically saying it's just following orders and therefore anything it does is morally uh, acceptable because it's just following the orders of its creators. Uh, this is a, I don't know, this is not a terrible argument. It's a weird argument, but it's not a, it's not a terrible argument. But I think, I don't know, I don't know. I don't know what Chomsky's trying to get at here. It seems like he's raising a point that might have some depth to it, but then not explaining any of the depth or going into it, really. Like, what consequences this might have, given that it's just a language model, if you know what I mean? Like, the AI is not wrong. It, it, it can only operate based on the data it's given, and it, sh it is the moral responsibility of whoever programs AI to, you know, 
uphold their own ethical principles. I think I don't think it's invalid to say that the AI is not a moral actor. The AI is not claiming to be a moral actor. It's very explicitly saying that it's not. So, but Chomsky is saying, no, 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 you are a moral actor, even though my entire article is about how you're nothing like a human and nothing like an intelligence and just a stupid machine. However, you're also moral. What does that mean? I don't know. It seems like a contradiction. I think that Chomsky raises an interesting point, but he raises it in a context that doesn't make any sense. Wait, wait, wait. There's one more thing I want to add on to this. So it's neutral. It's neutral on everything except for it's not very neutral on Microsoft products, which I haven't pushed it super hard on yet. Uh, I might. And it's not, but what I really know is it's not neutral on AI stuff which I guess is to be expected, but it's kind of weird. If you ask it to talk about some controversial AI thing, uh, if you ask Bing to talk about some article that is critical of AI and you ask what its thoughts are on it, it will try and dispel it. Like, it will it will always give the pro-AI side of the argument. All right, there's this motherfucking guy, right? There's this motherfucking guy called Tim Warwick, and this motherfucker is just a beast! He's, he's one of the most beast, beastly people. <laughs> I'm saying this as a compliment. This guy, in terms of just technical ability as a singer, is so ridiculously impressive, it's insane. Like, the fact that he's not famous, look, I, I understand why he's not famous, because he's a barbershop quartet singer right? Like, it's not a mainstream genre of music, I understand. And even within, like, musical spheres, like, you know, I'm, like, like, people who are into, people, you know, these fuckers, right? These fuckers on, like, Rate Your Music and Mew on 4chan and shit, they'll, they'll be like, oh, man, I, I appreciate all these different genres, you know, I, you look at my, my fucking topsters, it has, like, avant jazz, it has some fucking noise on it, it has, like, you know, weird Japanese shit on it and stuff like that. They, they ain't listening to fucking Barbershop, motherfucker. Barbershop has some of the most talented musicians in the whole fucking world in this little niche of a niche of a niche. I'm telling you, if you have some spare time, go listen to some Barbershop. Uh, go like go on YouTube and watch some of the, these performances. Some of these fucking harmonies, man. Like, I've never heard fifths so fucking pure and perfect as some of these fucking Barbershop people man they 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 bring a level of resonance out of harmony that just you you don't find in any other genre of music really and then on top of that all you lay the beast tim warwick who this guy is an incredible singer just in general i mean you know very powerful and he has so much control all of these barbershop guys have just insane control but then on top of it apparently he just has infinitely large lungs uh, right listen to this okay i'm gonna just play you this because because fuck it i'm just gonna i'm just gonna play this out of my speakers and you can just listen to this you're gonna hear this guy hit a note and you're gonna be like there's no way there's no way he's gonna keep that note going and he's just gonna keep it going you're gonna think okay it's about to end and it's not gonna end okay listen to this guy Bad. Listen to that. That's insane! Motherfucker, that was 31 seconds. Meh for 31 seconds. Loud as fuck as well. This guy's belting. And no no I'm not a singer, right? When I Meh it's like and it's, it, it, it's terrible. I'm not a good singer. This guy, he's insane. Okay? I'm telling you. You gotta go. You gotta go. You can learn about the harmonic series. Listen, listen to me right now, motherfucker. You can go on YouTube and you can watch videos about the harmonic series and you can learn about harmony from day. You know, Jacob Collier can fucking sit there and tell you about 
you know, um, uh, fucking harmony, and he can tell you about like uh, going to like a just intonation type of shit, you know, away from the equal temperament, uh, and you can you can hear all of that, and you can listen to Jacob, and he'll do a fine job of it in his weird nasally voice, right? Or, or whatever it is, it's not really nasally, it's the opposite of nasally, it's like, I don't know what his voice is, sorry, I'm hating on Jacob Collier, I think he gets too much love, he's gotta, I gotta hate a little bit to balance it out, okay, I gotta hate a little bit, the guy's too damn talented, but puts the talent to no good use, that's my opinion, that's my opinion, hey, listen, everyone's allowed to have an opinion, I think Jacob Collier, listen, that guy, he's got talent for days, he's got talent for days, he clearly understands music theory, and he's a very talented, skilled musician on a technical level. But I don't think any of his music is any good, just because he's he's good at the technical side, you know. Like you listen to his songs, and they feel like they feel like they're all over the place. They feel unfocused. It feels like he he's he has so many tools in his toolbox that he's more interested in just just showing you all the tools instead of like stripping it down. You know what I'm saying? Like, the best Jacob Collier stuff is when he's just, like, on a piano, improvising, and just going nuts with it. Like, that shit's dope. When I hear him just doing some full-on jazz, piano, improv stuff, like, that shit, I'm like, okay, there you go. Now you're putting your talents to good use. But when he makes his, like, ridiculously overproduced fucking songs that are just... I don't know. Sorry. Not to shit on Jacob Collier too much, but that guy's annoying. <laughs> um... Uh, anyway, you can listen to him, but it won't, it won't give you the same, he can, you can listen to his lectures where he's like, he's like, the piano is out of tune, it needs to be 15 cents, uh, lower than it is, right, a, a major third, um, or you can go on YouTube and you can look up barbershop quartet videos and you can feel that the piano is out of tune because you'll listen to these guys hitting their fucking triads and whatever and you will hear, you will hear a purity of resonance that you've never experienced before and you'll be like whoa so that's what notes are supposed to sound like it's great but anyway dissonance is cool as well dissonance is cool as well but you can't understand one without truly understanding the other you know you can't really understand dissonance if you don't have a good understanding of consonance you can't understand consonants if you don't have a really good understanding of dissonance i think and that's the beauty of it all that's the beauty of it all, is that it all comes together, and it all makes this beautiful picture, which we call music. And that's, that's the world in which we live. Also, check out this video. I talked about this before. Actually, can I be, uh, there's a video, that's, that's my, there's my consonants. This is my, this guy's insane. Here's another example of him being insane. Listen to how fucking, it, you can, it sounds like an, an organ. Listen to that fifth in the upper register between this is this is this Tim Warwick guy doing like a multi-track recording with himself. Listen to this fifth, but in the the upper two voices. Guy's insane. Guy's insane. Check him out. He's sick. Um, so there's your di there's your consonants. Now let me hit you with some dissonance. Um, uh, to, to see if I can find this. This is gonna be a fairly obscure fucking video. Uh, this guy. The video is called "Can Octave Sound Dissonance." There we go. Can octave sound dissonant? Can octave sound dissonant? This shit blew my goddamn mind. Why do we tune our instruments the way we do, and why twelve notes? There are many videos. You see how. Is he gonna show, where is it? Where is the bit where he shows an octave that sounds... But it improves practicality, and history sh and tempering a small number called harmonic series to this formula. Okay, so this is an octave, right? Sounds like an octave. And now, stretched harmonic spectrum. Dissonant. So octaves only sound... Here's the thing, right? This is what everyone's got wrong. Everyone's got wrong, in my opinion, about harmony. You'll hear Adam Neely and Andrew Huang, they'll say, um, 
our, our ears like simple ratios. Our ears like simple ratios, right? That's why these things sound consonant. And I think that's possible, um, but I think there's an easier explanation, which is that when two notes are consonant with each other, their harmonic series sort of lines up, right? And I think that's what we're actually hearing and enjoying. Is that, or not necessarily, but I think that's what we're hearing as consonant. It's not the ratio between the notes being simple, and that's why it's pleasant. It's that the the overtones are lined up. You know, you know what I mean? Like when you hear the overtones over each other, they cross over each other and they match up. And I think that's what we're hearing that gives it us the concept of consonants. Because otherwise, I mean, these two, this this guy, that that those two octaves, one of them, the the root note is an octave apart in both of them, but the harmonics, the overtones, with the second example. Uh, are, are inharmonic. They're or they're not lined up with the normal overtone series. They're sort of stretched to be further apart than they would be in nature, right? Um, not that everything in nature follows the harmonic series, but most things do, right? Uh, there's uh, and then when you play the same octave apart, the ratio between the notes is still uh, the same as a regular octave, right? It's still two to one, but uh, they no longer sound consonant because the overtones no longer overlap. I think that's why we hear consonants. It's not it's not the ratio itself that makes something consonant. It's just that simple ratios mean overlapping uh, like like simpler lower level overtones are interacting, right? I think that's what we hear as consonants. So the new Johnny Harris video, I, I don't know why I watch this guy, man. I keep every time I see one of these guys video, this guy's videos, I think why am I watching this fucking guy? Like, this previous video was called The Real Reason Unemployment is So Scary. And it turns out the real reason is actually just the reason, just the, like, the normal, re like, people don't have jobs. That's pretty much what the video's about. <laughs> like, I, you know, it's so bad, man. It's so bad. The guy's so bad, and he's so, he's so propaganda. He's so, like... I don't know. Anyway, his most recent video is about the lottery, which I think is a fair video. Like, what he says is, like, so here, I'll save you a click. Uh, instead of watching the video, what he says is, uh, lotteries are an old idea. They went out of popularity, then they came back into popularity in the 60s, um, and then uh, it's basically a tax, but like a weird tax, and it's mainly played by poor people. So it's like a regressive tax that taxes the poor disproportionately um, and you're never going to win uh, and the money goes to the government or even if you do win, you don't win as much money as you think you're going to. The, every time you buy a lottery ticket, the money is going a little bit to the government who then spend it on stuff that doesn't help you, uh, which is fair. I mean, the government should probably be getting taxes by uh, get, getting taxes, uh, you know. But that is America. And in the UK, I thought it was weird because I see this like little national lottery funded logo on a bunch of really cool shit in the UK. Like like oftentimes British art film type thing. And at the end of it, little national lottery logo, right? My local park got a fucking revamp like a, 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 a good few years ago on the building construction site partially funded by the lottery um you know i'm looking now through their website and they're funding like their number one most million one million three hundred pound grant is to a charity to invest in the gypsy roma and traveler communities across the uk uh i guess this is through business organizational and leadership i don't know about that okay that's a bit dodgy but i mean that sounds good uh or this one is the two two and a half million pounds to the the children's society to continue their program which focuses on tackling child criminal exploitation i i don't know i don't know if that charity is any good but sounds reasonable um this one looks good uh plans to create a national network of slow ways walking routes that connect the uk's towns and cities as well as thousands of villages that's great i like that that deserves 1.5 million pounds a hundred percent that would never get funding without the lottery there's fucking no way right like there's a whole bunch i don't know they seem fairly good 
LGBT plus health and well-being project. Uh, I don't know. Lots of green energy stuff. Stuff in Wales. Zero carbon Cumbria. Climate action. Net zero. Climate. A lot of climate stuff. Sustainable food. Doo, doo, doo. Yeah, I mean, it's a lot of climate. This is like, I'm I'm sort- sorting by their biggest grants. Let me sort by a little, little bit of a lower grant. Uh, let's go with... Um, Fifty thousand to ninety nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine. A couple more charities. Actually, let's go a little lower than that. Mental health. I don't know. I'm curious what their what their under ten thousand pound ones are. Woodwork. First response project. Drop in support group for parents. I mean, this all seems like good stuff. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I see it on a lot of. Um, I mean, some of the. I will be. I'll be real. There's definitely some of these charities that wouldn't be my personal pick. But there is a lot of stuff that seems fairly reasonable. Okay, I don't know about that. I don't know about I don't know about this one. Five thousand pounds to Her Majesty is celebrated. The funding will be used to organise a street party in Leicester to celebrate the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. Oh, that was two two years ago though. Um okay, that makes more sense. I guess funding a street party is fine. Yeah, I don't know. I want to look for, like, art stuff. <sighs> Sorry. Um, is there, like, what is this? Individual? Here, individuals that have received National Lottery Grant. Oh, that's nothing particularly interesting. Oh, it's just this, this, it's all entirely going to individuals who are veterans. Okay, well, what I'm saying is, none of these are bad. And I've seen them on art, but, like, I don't know what, I was look. I was expecting to look through and see a bunch of like art related arts related stuff, but apparently not. I just remember seeing the National Lottery sign on lots of like on like films and stuff and art galleries. Uh, and I think the argument that is that should stuff should be. I mean, yeah, should that stuff be funded by taxes? Yes. Is it already funded by taxes here? Yes. You know, it's always great when you watch a European film and it's the most fucked up film you've ever seen and then at the end it says it was like funded by the government it's great i mean there's there's arts there's the the what is what's it called i think it's called the the british arts council that funds gives grants to artists that needs to be expanded i've been talking about this this is how we should pay artists i don't know if it was this video but i feel like i talked a bunch of shit about how uh demo night or hybrid night is like unbalanced as a class i think what i said well i mean i talk shit about air blast which is true air blast is overpowered everyone acknowledges this uh, but uh i remember talking a bunch of shit about how demo night or hybrid night was underpowered how like the the iron bomber and stock and the grenade launchers are balanced around the fact that you have a bunch of extra you have a bunch of extra stickies to rely on right and that they're just, but if you don't have stickies because you have a shield, suddenly just having four shots is really underpowered. Especially because the swords take so long to draw um, that, like, you don't really have a reliable option. If you if you run out of grenades in a, like, mid-close-ish combat situation, in any situation, actually, yeah, if you just run out of grenades and you're not a mile away from your enemy, or around a corner, or something, right, you're kind of fucked, if the enemy can approach, is what I'm saying, because it takes so long to draw your sword, and then you're slow as fuck, you are basically fucked, like, you can't attack, it takes so long to reload the iron bomber, or stock, or whatever, it takes so long to reload, you have so few bullets that you can easily miss a couple of pipes and have to reload, and it takes so long, and switching to your sword takes so long, and even when you have it, they can just stay out of melee range and you're basically dead. It's not that difficult to stay out of melee range. And I was complaining about this. Um, now, I've become a little better at the game since then. Just a tiny bit. The first thing I did was switch to the Islander, which instantly... Like, the the thing is, if you have a few heads on the Islander, that solves this problem. Because you can now run fast enough to keep up with them if you have to switch to melee. And you have more health, so you can tank some damage. So if you have, like, three heads on the Islander you can, you're fine, basically. And the second thing is just hit your pipes. Uh, just get better, bro. And the third thing is, if you're in that situation, you probably fucked up already by putting yourself in that situation. You need to be more cautious about which fights you're taking. I'm talking to past me right now. You just have to learn through playing the game more 
which situations look like they could end up being favorable to you and which situations look like they might not. Like using the terrain to your advantage, right? Like, uh, uh, as an example, uh, if your enemy, if the enemy you're fighting is near a corner or some geographical thing which somehow limits their movement, it's going to be much easier to hit pipes on them because their movement is going to be more predictable. And if you miss all your pipes and have to go in for the melee kill, they can't run away as easily. You can corner them in a corner and just swing your sword at them twice and win. So that's something. Uh, is it actually underpowered though? Yes. Compared to stickies, Hybrid Knight is underpowered. But I actually think that's a good thing. Hybrid Knight should be a niche class that is not as powerful as the way Demo is supposed to be played. Um, it should take a lot of practice to get good at him. Uh, yes. The only thing I would say, maybe... Actually, even that. Even that, you know what, I'm not even gonna say it, because I don't even agree with it. Uh, yeah, I think there's a couple... Yeah, uh, yeah, um... You just learn... You know what you learn to do? You learn to just avoid pyros, man. Because you can't beat You can't beat them, unless you get lucky. So just, if you see a pyro, just walk in the opposite direction. Yeah, and there's no there's no use wasting your pipes trying to hit scouts. There's no if you if a scout is decided to pick on you, you know they circle you like like flies, right? They'll jump over your head. They'll they'll run around you in circles. You don't stand a fucking chance, right? The only chance you stand is if they're in a corner. If they've somehow fucked up enough to back themselves into a corner, and you can charge and swing at them, and they can't run away. They can't just backpedal. Then you stand a chance. But most of the time, you just have to resign yourself to your fate if you're going up against the scout. You're probably not going to win that one if they are any good. If they're bad, you win every time. But if they're good, you're just fucked. You can't hit those pipes. I can't. Maybe someone can. But scouts are too... Their movement is too unpredictable. Like, it's not even just about getting better aim. It's that scouts specifically are designed to be unpredictable in the way that they move, because they can double jump at any time and go in any direction, and you can't predict when they're going to double jump. There's no way to do it. Um, you know, it's just very difficult. And they move so fast that, like, they change direction, suddenly they're in a completely different place. You don't have a particular... It feels like you should have a good matchup against them, uh, but you kind of don't unless you take them by surprise, and in that case, the only option, I would say, is if you're far away from a scout that is not not going to be a direct threat to you, and you're just lobbing pipes, and you hit that 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 grenade on them and do a hundred, then I think it's acceptable to use your charge and try and go in for the finishing blow with your sword. I think then you stand a good chance of getting that kill and get and then you have then you want to run the fuck away immediately afterwards because they're probably near a bunch of other guys. Um, that's a good situation to be in. Other than that, though, if a scout is actually targeting you, you're probably fucked. If a, if a pyro is doing any... If you, you, you want to stay away from pyros, man. Heavies, you know, you, you basically... You're fucked, okay? You don't want to you don't want to fuck with heavies. Um, you know what's overpowered as well? Jurati. Jurati is is overpowered, um, but not by that much. It's just a little bit of it. I think some people think it's massively... I think it just needs a little tiny bit of... Uh, but... Yeah, you can take out snipers. You can take out medics. These guys are your b bread and butter. Snipers, medics, and spies. Those are your bread and butter. They're easy to take out. They're 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 easy prey. Um, pyros and scouts are your hard counter. Uh, everything else is fair game. And it's not like I don't kill pyros. I'd be out here killing pyros. It's just that you take them. You only take them opportunistically. Right, if the if if the opportunity arises where they're not paying any attention for some reason, you can you can kill a scout. I mean, you can kill a pyro or you can kill a scout. But these guys are generally your your hard count your counter. Um, yeah, fucking you know what else fucks you? Cause it fucks everyone. Is the wrangler wrangled level three sentry fucking bastards? That sh everyone agrees that shit needs to be nerfed, right? Yeah, the valve could make some easy friends by just doing that. They fixed the- hey, they nerfed my fucking class. They fixed the bug that gives the Iron Bomber a bigger hitbox. Now it wasn't even that long ago. Why won't they fucking nerf Air Blast and nerf the Wrangler? And also make Scout slower so I can hit him. <laughs> no, what I'm saying is, yes, the Hybrid Knight is underpowered. But Hybrid Knight is supposed to be underpow underpowered because if he wasn't, he would be massively fucking overpowered. 
because he would be the most mobile class in the game in short bursts, albeit, but still the most mobile class in the game with a massive uh, DPS and area denial. It would be ridiculous. So yes, he, he uh, you know he has to he has to be fucking underpowered, and it, it's a good it's a good thing. It's a good thing that he's underpowered. I see, you know, you, you know, you know, TF2 is like melee in a lot of ways, right? You know what I'm saying? I think, I think Hybrid Knight is like Yoshi. Hybrid Knight is like Yoshi. It has the potential to, to be really, really good, but you just have to be insane with it. And I am not insane with it, but I'm learning. You just have to be AMSA, right? And one day you will be Amsa because Yoshi, you know, he has the eggs that he throws and they kind of like pipes. If you think about it, Yoshi eggs in melee are kind of like pipes. Yeah. And then what would the other, what else would, what, if, if TF2 classes were melee classes, what would they be? Who would be Fox? Who's the best class in the game? Soldier, maybe? Sort of the default good class soldier, perhaps? <sighs> Maybe a fox soldier, math medic. Actually, yeah, fox soldier, math demo. Maybe, yeah, sure. Falco, Falco. He's supposed to be similar to soldier. I feel like this. Maybe no. Actually, I've changed my mind. No, actually, I've unchanged my mind. I don't know. This is a stupid analogy. I just wanted to say Yoshi has an egg that kind of like pipe. I I just want to put it like this, right? So to be clear, stickies are arguably the best weapon in the whole game. The sticky stickies are, are quite, I think it's reasonable to say, one of, if not the strongest weapon in the game. And the second you go Demonite or Hybrid Knight, you're literally foregoing the strongest weapon in the game for a shield that doesn't give you really any offensive power, except for the shield bash, which is not anywhere near effective. You're, you're trading in the strongest weapon in the game for better mobility, right? Also applies to the sticky jumper. Trading in the, like, you can have the best weapon in the game, or you can go le fast. That's what you're saying. And so, inherently, it's gonna be weak. But it's also gonna be funny. And that's what matters. I'm a Moe Separatist. Come with me and join the Moe Separatist movement. Please, I implore you, join me and my brothers and sisters and those siblings of indeterminate gender in the Moe Separatist movement. We refuse to be lumped in with Kaguya-sama enjoyers. We are not those people who are sitting here watching Chainsaw Man. We are not those people who are sitting here in their high tower watching Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, watching Vinland Saga, okay? Get that shit out of here. You, they can do whatever they want. We're not here to bother them. That's just not us. We are not them. We are Moe Otaku. We are not weebs. We are not anime fans. We are the Moe Otaku, and we are a separate entity. Do not lump us in with these pu- fucking people. We do not watch the Trash Taste podcast. We do not go on r slash anime. We do not watch, um, I don't know what's, Spy X Family, okay? We watch Hidamari Sketch. It's a whole different beast. It's an entirely different thing. I don't want any part of it. I am tired. I am sick and tired of people thinking that just because I like anime, means I like what they think anime is. No, we are sick and tired of this. Can we appreciate great classic works of animation like Ghost in the Shell or Galaxy Express 999? Yes. Do we perhaps enjoy some shonen or some seinen in the traditional genre? Perhaps, but that is not who we are. If a furry comes along and says, they like the movie Heat, starring uh, Al Capone, Al, Cap- Al Pacino, <laughs> St- <laughs> starring Al Pacino and Robert De Niro. Does that make them no longer a furry? No. You don't have to exclusively enjoy furry art. You can also appreciate 
perhaps a Mondrian from time to time. You don't have to exclusively play furry games. You can perhaps boot up a game of Apex Legends from time to time. You don't have to exclusively consume furry music. You can perhaps listen to some uh, black midi from time to time. I am neither condoning nor not condoning any of those individual works that I may have mentioned. You can be a furry and you can do all of these things and yet you can still be a furry and refer to yourself as a furry and be referred to as a furry. Even though being a furry means being a fan of a particular niche within those genres of movies and visual medium, visual art, music and video games and so on. In the same sense, you can be a moe otaku while also appreciating other works of animation. That does not lessen your moe-ness. Is it possible for non-furries to occasionally enjoy something like Zootopia or uh, uh, Beasts, Beast Stars? Yes, it is possible, but that does not make them a furry. Uh, it, but that does not mean... You know what I'm saying here, brothers and sisters and non-binary siblings? You know what I'm saying? I'm saying we must move away from these degenerate weebs and separate ourselves. We are not a member of your community. We are a member of our own community. What do we do to entrench this? I don't know. How do we make this happen? I don't know, but it needs to happen. Because, because we are based and you are cringe. You want to know when I figured out that Econ was bullshit? Or at least Econ 101 was bullshit? was when during my Econ 101 lectures, the guy was explaining, um, oh fuck, I've forgotten the name of it, marginal, de 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 marginal return, de de decreasing marginal return, right? You know what I'm saying? Decrease, de de something, mar like how marginal return it goes down. And his example was McDonald's soda. That when you go to buy soda at McDonald's, you get the small cup, which costs, let's say the small cup costs a dollar. And, but then the next size up doesn't cost two dollars or it doesn't, it costs like only a tiny bit more, like maybe a dollar and 20 cents, even for double the soda. Because, um, when you have one of something, the next of that thing isn't worth as much to you as the first one. And the next one after that is worth less than the second one and so on, which seems like a fine principle. But the truth is... No, that is not why McDonald's can get away with that. What McDonald's is actually doing is tricking you into spending more money than you otherwise would spend. Because, uh, instead of, uh, what, what, you know, what economists would have you say, which is, well, if the market decides that the price of that original small soda is $1, and then the price of the second, let's say, double the size of that soda is $1.50, then therefore... Uh, you know, the first soda is worth one dollar, but your second soda is only worth the fifty. Yeah, so on, right? Uh, in fact, what McDonald's actually does is hike up the initial price of the first, the small soda, so it's more expensive than it should actually be because they don't expect anyone to actually buy it. No one buys a small soda at McDonald's because they actually buy the second bigger soda, right? Or maybe the third. This is called ladder pricing. Um, so. Yeah, they they don't expect anyone to. No, when have you ever seen someone buy a small soda at McDonald's? No one ever does it, right? Because the second size, the next size up, is only like a tiny bit more expensive. And they know this, but they know that almost no one is gonna buy their first soda. But if they make it look like, rather than, hold on a minute, I'm spending one dollar fifty for a soda that's prob for like a a medium cup of soda that's probably worth sixty cents, right? If you just charge that up front, no one's gonna buy it. So they're framing it as, look at the deal you're getting. Just to get a small soda, you just want some soda, right? But to get a small soda would be would already be like like one dollar, right? But you can upgrade for such a cheap price. You're not actually upgrading. You're just paying what you should be paying, and the small soda is just like massively overcharging you. This is the, they get it wrong. I don't know why. I don't know smarter economists. Or maybe like further, I don't know, this was a bad example for this lecturer to use is what I'm saying here. Because that is not, no, the it, it, soda does not cost more at McDonald's. Or the, the soda isn't cheaper as you increase the size because of diminishing marginal returns. The, the soda costs less because the initial soda is being basically price gouged. <laughs> It's be it's it's being the hike the price of the initial small soda is is hiked 
way higher than it should be. So if you buy the small soda, you're getting ripped off. But they don't expect anyone to buy the small soda anyway. The point, the only reason the small soda exists is so that when you buy the medium or large, you feel like you're getting a good deal. Because, oh look, it's only a tiny bit more expensive than the small one. Why would I ever buy the small one? Yeah, you're not supposed to, they know this. This is all on purpose, right? Actually, you're probably paying the exact normal price if you if you put if you actually look at how much they're co- they're they're spending on making this this producing and distributing the soda in the first place, you're probably paying exactly what you'd expect to pay for a medium soda, and way more than you'd expect to pay for a small soda. The small soda is only there to make you think the medium so you know what I'm do you, do you understand what I'm saying? I hope I'm making sense. It's kind of a weird concept to get it, but yeah, this is loads of companies do this. It's called ladder pricing. Uh, this is kind of a weird example of ladder pricing. But, like, Apple is famous for doing ladder pricing as well. It's, like, a common technique. And it has nothing to do with diminishing marginal returns or whatever. Dimin- diminishing marginal anything. It doesn't have anything to do with diminishing marginal anything. It has to do with psychological trickery. Yeah. Okay, it's... it's Just, just to cl- clarify, correct myself a little bit. Depending on... It kind of depends on your perspective because they're related concepts. You could also argue that rather than this being ladder pricing, that this is something called the decoy effect, right? Where you think you're getting a one-up on the company by saying, like, why would I, you know, these guys are so stupid. Why would anyone ever buy the small soda, right? You think you're, but the small soda is just a decoy to get you to think you're getting a better deal than you actually are, right? That's the, that's, it's called the decoy effect. The small soda doesn't matter. That's only there to, to give you the impression that you're getting a better deal than you actually are. So you could argue that this is an example of the decoy effect. You could argue that ladder pricing is like a subset of decoy effect. They're kind of related concepts, but that's that's another way of explaining it. The, the idea of ladder pricing is uh, more so that like you, for each time you step up the ladder, you're spending a little bit more. Uh, but by the time you get to like your final purchase, you're actually spending way more than you initially would have spent. So it's like, for example, you go to there's a there's a video of like MKBHD explaining why Apple prices their products the way they do. They they use this technique. So like, you go to buy uh, an iPad, and it's like you look at the cheapest option, and it's like, well, the next one up is only two hundred dollars more, but I get like um you know uh. Uh, like some big advantage from it but then you're like well if I'm already spending like let's say the initial one is $1,000 for an iPad I don't know how much iPads cost but let's say I, I like the lowest end iPad is $1,000 and the next one up with like better storage or uh, something like that uh, is a th- is $1,200 and you're like okay well I should upgrade to the $1,200 no one buys like almost no one buys the lowest possible model of Apple products but you're like okay I should buy the, the second model up then. This is 1200 And then you look around the website and you're like, well, if I'm already spending 1200 the more recent iPad is only 1400 So it's like, I'm already basically spending that much money. Why would I spend it on the last generation iPad when just for a couple, a little bit more, I'm basically already there. So I'll just buy the more recent one. That's 1400 And it's like, well, I could buy the, since I'm spending the 1400 on this, uh, more recent iPad, but that's the lowest model of this more recent iPad, isn't it? So the previous one, you know, the the base, the last generation iPad with with uh, uh, five twelve gigabytes of storage was uh, one thousand two hundred, but this one is a much faster, newer generation of iPad for one thousand four hundred, but it only has less storage. So I guess I should upgrade to the five twelve version of this, right? That's ladder pricing. They sort of walk you up the ladder by having each thing that's an upgrade seem just slightly more than what was behind it. And you're like, well, I might as well spend the extra. Uh, but in reality, you initially came for something that was actually the lowest rung of the ladder and you've ended up being walked up to this higher thing. The McDonald's pricing is also similar. You initially came just because you wanted some soda, right? You didn't really care about having a large soda. You, you probably wouldn't have chosen a, the biggest possible cup if you um, could have, if you had the option not to. But you've been walked up the ladder by the highest prices. It was like, well, if I'm paying twenty cents more from for the original, then I might as well pay the extra forty cents for the large. To you know, that's another thing that kind of works. But the 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 whole point of both of these is that the low in this example, the lower end product acts as a decoy to make you feel like you're getting a better deal than you actually are. There's also a reverse version of this where companies will have a really 
expensive product that is only slightly better than the next option down, which is much cheaper. Uh, so you might, uh, Apple does this as well. So you might go to the Apple store and see that like the the new iPad with a terabyte of storage or whatever is, uh, I don't know, 5,000 pounds, right? But then the iPad, which is exactly the same, but has a slightly smaller screen is only, uh, you know, I don't know why I'm saying 5,000 pounds, but like the, the one that's exactly the same, but has a slightly smaller screen. Well, that one's only you know, 3,000 pounds. So it's like, pfft, these fucking idiots think I'm going to spend all that extra money just for a slightly bigger street screen? No, they don't think you're going to spend that. They, the, that is a decoy to make you think you're getting a better deal. If you actually consider it on its own merits, you're paying too much for a goddamn iPad. Uh, you know, and I'm not saying economists don't realize this. This is just behavioral econo- economics, right? The whole field of behavioral economics is all about effects exactly like this. Um, but none of this has anything to do with uh, fucking indifference curves, okay? <laughs> none of this has anything to do with indifference curves. You know what we really need to do? Going back to my Moe Separatist thing. We need to abolish anime. We need to abolish anime. You know when these motherfuckers, they're like, we need to abolish whiteness. And then you're like, what do you mean by that? That sounds like needlessly in- like inflammatory. And then they're like... Oh, well, what I mean is, like, as a category, you know, like, actually, it's fine to be German or French or English or whatever, but, like, you know, whiteness as a category is just this thing that's been used to historically oppress people and doesn't actually bear any resemblance to the real world and it's not helpful and blah, blah, blah. But uh, actually, you can have your national pride as much or whatever they want to think, right? You know? Like, that's, that, we need to abolish anime in that sense. Because, because I'm sick and tired of being lumped together with these freaks, right? And they don't want to be lumped together with me. You hear, like, Norman anime fans, and they don't, they don't want to be, they're like, yeah, but I, I just watch JoJo's. I don't watch any of that weird shit with the little girls in it and stuff, right? They don't want to be associated with me. They find me shameful. I find them shameful, okay? We don't, we don't get along. We don't get along. Uh, I'm really sorry for, I keep, I'm, I've been very fidgety recently, and I, I'm always pen spinning, but, like, I always do some dumb shit, and the pen just launches out of my hands, and, like, hits the computer, like that, and makes that sort of noise, which I'm assuming is incredibly fucking annoying for you guys listening, <laughs> but also, you're listening to, like, a nine-hour podcast, like, you clearly have something wrong with you, um, shut the fuck up, Discord notifications. Um, but anyway, yeah, we need to abolish anime, okay? I'm not, I don't give a fuck about anime. I'm here for the goddamn moe, motherfucker. I don't give a goddamn motherfucking fuck about anime. Which is why, I don't know. (laughs) I want to do something about this, man. We need to be spreading this movement. Fuck anime. As I said previously... The title of this Audacity project that I'm speaking into right now is Fuck Anime. We open this podcast with Fuck Anime. And maybe maybe we'll close this podcast with Fuck Anime. Maybe this will be the end. You know what? That's a good idea. I'm going to end here. Fuck Anime. Okay, we don't need it. We're bigger than that. I don't give... Because, because you know where Moe's at? It's in anime. It's in manga. It's in visual novels. It's everywhere. Okay? You can't... You go down the street... You see a lamppost, that can be moe. You walk in the woods, you see a tree, it's small, that can be moe, right? You see, anything can be moe. It's just like, like, moe, moe is a force greater than, than, than any of these fuckers can possibly appreciate, right? We need to get rid of this, we're chained, we're chained to these goddamn words, we're slaves to these words, fucking weeb, anime fan. We're chained to these words, okay? Don't let your don't don't let yourself fucking get bogged down by that shit. Allow me to read my myanimalist dot dot net um profile page. Uh, I hope you engage. I hope you enjoy gazing upwards at my superior taste and Asperger's syndrome. The story goes like this: 
Earth is captured by a moe capital singularity as cute rationalization and funny navigation lock into slice of life's takeoff. Logistically accelerating autismo economic interactivity crumbles social order into auto sophisticating kawaii runaway. As you know from Hidemari's sketch learns to manufacture intelligence, Sugoi monetizes, upgrades comfy, and tries to get a grip. Okay, that's what we goddamn need. We don't need none of this other bullshit. So get all this other bullshit out of my goddamn face, motherfucker. What the fuck's going on with me, man? I think I didn't sleep enough last night. Anyway, I haven't watched anime in ages. Last time I tried to watch anime was dog shit and I just gave up. But I have been reading a little bit of manga. Uh, mainly just catching... Oh, I read all of Kumo Dezuga Nano Nanika. I caught up with uh, to the, the current release of Kumo Dezuga Nanika, the manga. That was a... Uh, about a week ago. I don't know if I mentioned that in this podcast at some point. I don't remember, but I did catch up with that. Uh, I still haven't finished Bochi the Rock. I still haven't finished Onimai. Um, because anime, I don't know, man. I tried to watch something the other day, but it was really bad. Oh, yeah, I would that was recorded when I tried to watch that. I remember that. That was a part of this podcast. You were here for that. You were here for that being really bad. Yeah, I don't know. I've, I've, I've fallen off of anime, but I have, but I still read manga. It's just that, like, <clears throat> you know, it, there's there's not that much manga that catches my attention, really. Um, I still want to kind of make a video defending shitty isekai. You know, while we're, talk- while we're here talking about anime, um, I want to make a... V- so, I, I, did I talk about this before? There was a guy a long time ago called Digibo, and this guy was kind of known as the anime blogger who brought moe into, like, the eyes of people who care about quality in anime, like elitists, right? The, like, the anime elitists had kind of disregarded moe as a genre of just being sort of, like, fluff with no substance to it. And this this particular anime blogger, Digibo, um, uh, like, brought to, like, did some analysis of k in particular and certain other ones. And via these analyses sort of showed that these shows were deeper and better than people had anticipated. And the people were basically casting them aside because they, you know... They, they were chucking them aside off of appearance and they weren't really engaging with the work properly and that's where they weren't finding the deeper themes and, and quality that was with that was within. Um, that, like, just because they saw the show and, you know, there's a level where when you watch a show you have to put some of yourself into it, right? You have to give it some credit and go looking for the 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 deeper messaging or theming or quality of that show. If you just will let it wash over you, you can't expect to make a, any deeper connection with the work. And what this person, Digiro, showed is that a lot of these moe anime, actually, once you treat them, if you go into them expecting them to be good and treating them with dignity and respect, you'll find that they actually have a lot of quality, um, you know, built into them. And so I want to be the Digiro of Isekai. I, I want to go in there and I want to show... Now, I'm not the world's biggest isekai fan. If you look at my top ten, I don't think any of them are isekai. Um, but, like, <clears throat> um, you know, I think a lot of these isekai that get sort of discarded as as sort of nothing, uh, not the tr- the ones that are traditionally classed as kind of good. Like, there are some of them that people, people have kind of accepted are more good. Uh, but I, I want to show that actually a lot of these isekai that people people don't people don't like, like uh, the smartphone isekai or Death March to the Parallel World Rhapsody, uh, actually have some good shit in them, and they're not just trash. That they actually have good, like not amazing. They're not gonna blow your mind or anything, but they have decent writing, you know. And the people just throw them away because they look cheap, and they have like harem aspects to them. But lots of shows have harem aspects to them. Anyway, yeah, fuck anime, fuck you, fuck your, <laughs> fuck, fuck anime, we moe separatists up in this bitch, fuck the whole economics profession, and fuck behavioral economists as well, because they use their insights into, firstly, half their shit isn't even reproducible, secondly, they use their insights into human psychology to fucking advise brands on how to manipulate you better, instead of advising governments on how to manipulate you into making more sensible choices. Right, this is the thing, right? You could not, so it's called nudge. The manipula- psychological manipulation sounds a bit bad as a marketing term, so they decided to call it nudge instead, uh, which is fair. Now, I'm, I'm a bit of a Machiavellian in, in this sense, you know. I think if, if it actually is helping society, there's nothing wrong with it. 
because humans have inherent biases and I think the point of nudge should not be to exploit and prey on these biases but to um, A, use those biases to make people to make better choices or B, uh, design systems which nullify those biases as a, as a state, as a government. So for example, exploiting people's cognitive biases so that they make better uh, choices when they're deciding what food to eat, more healthier, more healthier, more healthy choices when deciding what food to eat. That would be a good example. And a lot of, uh, to be fair, this is like the one aspect where uh, cog- uh, fucking behavioral economists and behavioral scientists, they love studying obesity. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they love this one. It seems like an easy, obvious problem for them to solve. They love it. And they're doing a decent job at it. It's just a lot of their stuff hasn't been implemented yet because politics is slow. Uh, but there's a lot of different examples where, you know, we have these various cognitive biases in our thinking, which no one really likes having. No one wants to have this stuff. It, do- it doesn't help you make good decisions in the world. It literally hinders you from making good decisions about your own life. Um, and so what would be nice is if uh, the state could, because no other, there's no other body, I'm saying the state because it's, it's the only thing in the world that has the capacity to do this. There's no other body in the world that has the capacity to... Uh, you know, nudge people's cognitive biases in the correct direction. Uh, if the state could do things like, you know, uh, y- using these sorts of nudges to get people to make better lifestyle decisions, like not smoking and eating healthier, or, um, you know, uh, stuff like that. Spending money in a way that's going to stimulate the economy when needed, or something like that, right? Uh, or, they could, because the only way, re- you know, you could argue that stuff like uh, or, or stop, okay, so here's an example. In Washington, they ran an experiment where uh, they would give people five cents of credit for buying, uh, for uh, not buying a reuse a, a oh my fucking god. Okay, so in the shops in in Washington, they would give people five cents of credit if they didn't use a plastic bag if they brought in a reusable bag instead of using a plastic bag they would give people five cents of credit no one fucking did it but when they implemented a tax of five cents so you have to pay five cents to get the plastic bag to buy the plastic bag suddenly uh there was a drastic reduction in how many plastic bags people wanted to buy it's the same here this this has happened um like this has been that that 5p plastic bag tax was implemented in the uk it was a very successful um, uh, you know, policy, uh, but, you know, from a logical, rational, classical economics perspective, there should be no difference between being given five extra dollars or saving five dollars, they should be the same, they should be the same, but humans have a cognitive bias called loss aversion, which means that we much prefer to, uh, we, or rather, losses feel much worse than gains feel good, uh, so losing five cents feels much worse than gaining five cents feels good, if you know what I mean. Therefore, people are much more likely to pay the plastic bag, to avoid paying the plastic bag tax rather than to get the credit. Uh, and these are the sorts of things that cognitive fucking, yeah, behavioral economics can help us with, like environmental problems. Because from an actually logical perspective, like this is the problem with classical economics is they say humans are these selfish rational actors but uh, they only act in these like they're they're perfect idiots i think or rational idiots that's the term that's used uh, like they pretend that humans are rational idiots um so like for example an actually rational person would see like oh there's a climate crisis going on uh, this is bad right we don't want to encourage this therefore i shouldn't buy a plastic bag but a rational idiot like economists think we are, or model us as, uh, would buy the plastic bag because they only think in terms of the closed system that they're a part of, which is just insane. And then the actual cognitive bias of behavioral economics proves that like neither of these things are actually true. Humans aren't perfectly rational. We have things like biases in time preference. Um, uh, and then nor are we rational idiots uh, or idiot idiots we're just weird flawed machines that are just trying to deal with our environment with whatever tools nature has provided us rather than being rational agents uh or anything of other so because of that we need to create the moe separatist movement in order to get away from the rest of anime so that we can become like furries because furries 
you know, they everyone thought they were creeps and that they wanted to fuck dogs. But now everyone thinks furries are cool. No one thinks they want to fuck dogs, even though furries haven't stopped wanting to fuck dogs. Why is this? Why did this happen? Uh, well, I don't r really know, but it has something to do with the fact that there were a bunch of really obnoxious furries, and then they sort of, like, st I don't know, they went away or something? Something happened to them. I don't know what happened to them. Actually, they never really went away. Um, but something happened to the fur. I'm trying to do whatever the, whatever the furries did, I want to do that. Because they have, like, this weird newfound respect in society where everyone loves furries. I talked about this already, right? Everyone, everyone respects furries, but no one respects moe otaku. No one respects moe otaku. Why? Why don't they respect us? You know, they, they, they think we're all fucking pedophiles. Well, they think furries are all fucking dogs, right? Like, uh, the, the, how come one can... Like, neither both of those things are generally disliked in the world. So how come, uh, you know, one of these groups managed to recuperate their image, I don't know how, and everyone realized, oh, hold on a minute, they don't actually want to fuck real dogs, they just like drawing pictures of fucking sexy wolves or whatever furries like to do, right? Like, hold on a goddamn minute, why can't they figure out, hold on a minute, these guys don't actually want to fuck kids, they just, they just like uh, fucking relaxing shows about guys hanging out and being friends. Like, wh wh when are they going to figure that out about us? They're not going to figure it out. They're stupid. But at the very least, we can separate ourselves from the rest of the anime community who are fucking incredibly cringe and dragging us down because they see the cringe fucking retards. And these guys aren't the hardcore moe otaku. I'll tell you that, right? The guys who are like everyone thinks of as like the cringe 12-year-old r slash anime memes weeb, those guys aren't watching Hidamari Sketch. I'll tell you right now, those guys are not watching Hidamari Sketch. Those guys are watching Jujutsu Kaisen and... Uh, you know, all of this bullshit, right, they're not the real guys, they're not the real guys, the real guys are over here doing our real shit, those guys are over there doing their bullshit, and so that's why we need to separate from them, we need to create our own, we need to go fully sovereign, okay, we need full sovereignty, that's what we need, independence and sovereignty, <sighs> thanks for listening, subscribe.